Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Issues Academy CA Foundation Principles and Practice of Accounting for one last time. We were discussing a quick revision or marathon revision of the entire syllabus. In yesterday's class, we finished chapter 1, 2, 3, 4 and major part of chapter 5 depreciation. So, we will do that leftover part of depreciation what I told we will do today based on provision and disposal. And once we are done with that, we will be going ahead with chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in the same order. Shall we get started? Yes. So far, we have done with depreciation and we have discussed multiple methods of depreciation. We have understood what do we mean by revaluation, when to do revaluation, how to book profit on loss or profit or loss on sale of the asset and how to change the method of depreciation, how to account for change in useful life, account, how to account for change in the residual value expected. All of this is done. So now what we would start with is provision for depreciation. Now, whenever we depreciate a specific asset, we would be passing the journal entry as depreciation account debit to asset account. Do you agree with me? <coughs> what is the accounting entry that we would pass? Depreciation account debit to whenever you write asset account credit. It's a real account. The rule that applies is same. No debit what comes in credit what by this rule. This is there should be some part of the asset which will go out. Do you really think whenever you depreciate a part of the asset leaves the organization? There is no part of the asset going out. There is no part of the asset coming in. It is just that we expect a part of the asset to go out. It's just that we expect the value of the asset to come down. That is the reason we call no depreciation as an accounting estimate. So it is not right on our part to credit asset whenever we depreciate. It is not right on our part whenever we credit asset because of depreciation. Asset account should be credited only and only when the asset is sold. Depreciation is expected decrease in the value of the asset, not actual decrease. And for expected decrease in the value of the asset, we cannot credit asset. We bought the asset once, we will sell the asset once. But every year if we go on crediting, crediting the asset, it is giving a wrong impression to the person who is looking at the asset. So, for the better understanding of financial statements, when the asset is purchased, we should debit it. And asset account should be credited only and only when it is sold or not any time before this. But to fulfill this rule, if we don't provide depreciation, then the asset will be overvalued. And expense won't be booked because of which profit will be overshot as well. So we want to show the correct profit by providing depreciation. But we don't want to decrease the value of the asset. Because depreciation is expected decrease and not actual decrease. There comes the savior provision for depreciation method. What do we call it? Under this method what we do is because the provision is expected decrease. When we debit our depreciation account instead of crediting asset like we always do. We credit provision for depreciation. When we credit asset that's going to decrease the value of the asset in the balance sheet, instead of decreasing the value of the asset, we create a liability because it is just expected decrease. This is exactly the kind of difference between debtors and provision for debtors. Sorry, debtors, oh, sorry, bad debts and provision for bad debts. Bad debt is actual decrease, should be deducted from debtors. And provision for bad debts is not actual decrease, it is the expected decrease. Bad debt is expense. Provision for bad debts is not expense, it is liability. What is provision for bad debts? Close the door. Provision for bad debts is liability and it would be written where? It would be for the sake of presentation, we will be deducting it from the debtors, but it is actually a liability. Same it is here as well. So instead of deducting depreciation from the cost of the asset, we write provision for depreciation on the liability side. As a matter of presentation at the end of the year, to identify the value of the asset, we deduct the whole of the depreciation in the current year. So usually without provision, journal entry for depreciation is depreciation to asset and later when you transfer it to P&L, P&L to depreciation. Here, instead of crediting asset, you would be crediting provision and rest of the entries are definitely same. Like we transfer this depreciation to P&L by writing P&L to depreciation. Let us say the original cost of the asset is 100 and we have depreciated it to the extent of 10. When we pass depreciation account without provision, we deduct 10 rupees from the cost of the asset making the book value of the asset 90. In our balance sheet, asset side, asset will be at 90. PL account debit side, depreciation will be 10 rupees. This is without provision. If I do with provision, in my balance sheet, asset side, asset will not become 90. Asset will be at 100. Provision for depreciation, liability will be 10 rupees. Instead of decreasing the asset, I write it as a liability. And the same 10 rupees will be written in PL account debit side as expense. As a matter of presentation, that provision what is there on the liability side can be deducted from the original cost to be showing the book value of the asset. Do you get this? Sir, how long are we going to maintain this provision? Till the time the asset is discarded or disposed. 
Discarded means end of the useful life. Let us say the asset is disposed. Disposed by way of discarding. Like meaning end of the useful life. 100 rupees is the value of the asset. First year we depreciated 10. Second year we depreciated 10. Third year we depreciated 10. 10 years over. So at the end of 10th year, you know how does it look? Balance sheet asset side. We have asset at 100. And balance sheet liability side. We have provision 100. Now the asset is over. Useful life of the asset is over. Provision is liability. It has credit balance. Asset on the balance sheet asset side as debit balance. Debit balance, credit balance. Strike it off. Asset will be eliminated from books of books. Are you getting it? It will get closed. Accounting treatment is expense wise the same. Presentation the balance sheet is slightly different. That's the only difference in provision. If in case you sell the asset. If in case you sell the asset. Let's say after 2 years of depreciation. 100 rupees is the value of the asset. 10 rupees per year depreciation. How much is depreciation per year? First year depreciation 10. Second year depreciation 10. After 2 years of depreciation. If you have not maintained provision, what would be the book value of the asset? 80? Yes or no? Let us say we sold the asset at 85. But what value did you sell? 80 rupees cost of the asset book value. We sold it at 85. 15 rupees profit. Sorry, 5 rupees profit. So, you would have returned 10 rupees less from the original cost, bringing it to 90. Again, second year you provide 10 rupees depreciation, bringing it to 80. Now, when you sell it, you will write cash account debit 85. Asset account credit 80. Remaining 5 will be PNL. This is what you do when you do it without provision. If you do it with provision, you know what happens? Asset account debit no in the balance sheet. Asset account will be at 100 only. Liability side there will be provision of 20. So when you receive cash of 85, you write cash account debit 85. Asset account credit will not be 80. Asset account credit will be 100. Because asset is maintained at original cost. Against this asset, whatever provision you had maintained, that is also no longer required. So such provision also will be debited now 20. So, observe here. Instead of writing cash account debit, asset account credit and difference amount being loss of PNL or uh, profit of PNL, this asset will not be written at book value. This asset will be instead written at original cost. Whenever I write this asset at original cost, to bring it down to book value, I will be closing my provision and then writing it here. What we did is, here when we charge a depreciation, we didn't charge it to asset. We charge it to provision. That provision will be now charged to asset. Observe this entry, depreciation to provision, provision to asset. Can I strike off provision and then tell it's depreciation to asset? That is what we are doing here. Under without provision method, we charge the depreciation instantly to asset. Under with provision method, we don't charge it to asset. We keep it all pending. We keep it all. At the time of disposal, we charge it. It's like this. You ate one chocolate. You have a paper to throw. Where will you throw? You will go outside the house, go to the BBMP dump yard, throw it there, come back. I ate it. Now, what do you do? You, you have a small dustbin at home. You put it to dustbin. Morning's dust, you put it in dustbin. Afternoon's dust, dustbin. Evening's dust, dustbin. Tomorrow morning, they'll come. No. Kasaidre Kodima, they'll come. No. They want it separate. Wet waste, dry waste. You go there and then give it to them. So, are you getting it? That's the same thing. So, every time you have dust, you don't go to baby with dump yard. You'll put it in the dustbin. That dustbin is provision for depreciation. Every year when you depreciate, you don't go put it to asset account. You put it to provision for depreciation account. At the end, when the asset is going to be discarded, asset is disposed or discarded, end of useful life or being sold. At that point, we'll close the provision and transfer to asset account. Till then, you don't. If you remember this much logic now, the problems will look much simpler. If you try to mug up the journal entries for provision, this will always look little complex because it is two different sets. Throughout, you do like this. Suddenly, you are asked to do like this. It will become little difficult and more than difficult, it will become very annoying to you people. You people will feel like skipping this. We will skip it. But what if this is the only question that comes from depreciation? Are you getting it? So this is one reason why you shouldn't skip this part. And another reason why people will skip this topic of provision is, let's say by mistake, they stressed little and then they practice questions on provision also. Then comes its friend, disposal account. Then comes its friend. Now, I will tell you one simple logic. Why did we open provision for depreciation? The reason is, we don't want to credit the asset before we sell it. If you don't open provision for depreciation, every year end, entry will be depreciation to asset. So, we will credit asset account every year, though we didn't sell the asset. Are you getting it? So, we don't want to do that. We want to credit the asset account only and only when we sell the asset. So, every year we keep it to provision. When we are selling the asset, we write provision to asset. But, if you maintain provision, just imagine, just look at this. What is the journal entry that you passed for the asset sold at loss? 
cash account debit selling price cash received pnl account debit loss is to be debited provision for depreciation account debit accumulated provision need not be maintained credit will be asset account. you agree with me let's say asset is 1 lakh bought some 4 years ago opening balance 1 lakh closing balance 1 lakh opening balance 1 lakh closing balance 1 lakh we do that for 3 years year 4 the asset is sold i write opening balance 1 lakh got it how many years depreciation over 4 years 40000 credit side i'll write by provision for depreciation asset should be sold for 60 let's say sold for 50 50000 i'll write by cash balance 10000 will be pnl do you agree in my asset account debit side balance brought down 1 lakh credit side i'll write by provision for depreciation 40 by cash 50 by p and l 10 Paka? no doubt now did we sell the asset three times or did we sell the asset one time one time then why did you write three parts did you break the asset into three parts and then sell it no this is not that category of things that you say cut it into three parts and then sell cut it into three parts keep in refrigerator dispose it at ease no this is not that you sell the asset in one whole part one day said the sale matter the why do you write three times in machinery account you should write only once so what do you do but three items are there no Cash is there, provision is there, and then uh, p and is there. So, in these three you should write. But you don't want to write these three in machinery account. Once the asset is sold, only one entry should come in machinery account. So, we open one dummy account. We open one. What is a dummy account? Disposal account. What is it? In our machinery account, credit side will write by disposal 1 lakh. 1 lakh is the cost of the asset sold. In machinery account, sale transfer 1 lakh to disposal. Provision for depreciation, 40,000 provision which is already created, no longer required. From provision, I will transfer 40,000 to disposal. Cash I got, that also I will put to disposal. Profit will be found as balance if we are disposal. You are you getting what I am trying to tell? Machinery account, credit side instead of writing by provision 40, by cash 50, by p and 10. Instead of doing this, what do I write? By disposal 1 lakh. One more separate ledger will open, disposal. In that asset, 1 lakh will come. It's like you pack that asset. One cover, that cover is disposal account. In that you put depreciation also. Depreciation will come credit side. It will decrease the asset from 1 lakh by 40,000 to 60,000. You receive cash. Cash account debit to disposal again. Cash to machinery bariala. Cash account debit to, why? Against the cash, you are giving disposable back. The disposal account is what you are giving. Write 50 there. Balancing figure will come in disposal account 10,000. So this entry is there, no? Cash account debit, p &L account debit, provision account debit to asset. We'll split it. You know, will you split? Cash account debit to disposal. PL account debit to disposal. Provision account debit to disposal. Disposal account debit to asset. So disposal credit, disposal credit, disposal credit, disposal debit. If you eliminate that, the entry is nothing but cash debit, PL debit, provision debit to asset. Are you getting it? Shall I show this? Pakka. Come on. <coughs> See. Why do you open disposal account? It's a temporary account opened to accommodate the entry on sale of the asset. It's temporary. The moment you make the sale, you open it. The moment the sale is complete, asset is uh, that uh, disposal account is closed. And what do we do here? Here we transfer the original cost, accumulated depreciation, sale consideration. All the three will be transferred to disposal account. We find profit or loss as balance in figure in disposal account. I'll say. This is the entry that we discussed. Cash account debit, p &L account debit, provision account debit to asset. Yes or no? If you write with disposal, it will be cash account debit to disposal then p and l account debit p and l account debit to disposal provision for depreciation account debit provision for depreciation account debit to disposal lastly asset account credit disposal account credit to debit to asset first transfer the asset transfer the depreciation on that put cash on that profit or loss will be automatically filled. are you getting it in order to get confidence in disposal account one question you take it you do it without provision. Maybe three years or four years. Don't take it for six, seven, six, seven years question. One basic level question. In HS material, these are question number uh, 16, 17, 18. Ah, uh, 16, 17, 18. So 18th question you can take. What I would recommend is listen, listen, listen. Don't look into the book. I am scared to tell the question number because the moment I tell you go to the book. I will tell. For that question, do without provision, without disposal. Don't take provision for depreciation. Don't take disposal account. Prepare ledger accounts. For the same problem, do with provision. For the same problem, do with provision and disposal. You keep all the three answers in front of you and just stare like this once. That's it. If you stare at like that for five minutes now, then you'll be full confident on disposal. You get this? I will not tell disposal based accounting question will not come in the exam. Why? 
last time it came now so it will not come this time i won't tell that so you never know it can come after coming last time if you have the gut feeling that last time kelidha andre pakka this time they won't tell, they won't ask you take that chance but i will not tell last time also i told provision for depreciation you should read people were like sir skip madabada skip madabada skip madabada. you want to skip you skip is what i do now also i'll tell this is i have taught you you can do not very difficult if you still want to skip left to you but i am not telling you skip i am not telling you do it it will come then later i'll tell do it it will come you tell sir 15 minutes you spent in teaching us provision didn't come in exam only then what do i do i am not making the question paper if i would make the question paper then why would i take two days marathon revision i'll take 3 hours question paper solving session i'll solve only 6 why <laughs> i do so much huh? why will i do so much got it for that question what i referred now uh, referred uh, what i referred now in the class no 18th one i have done the answer with provision without provision with provision and disposal all the three answers have been given you guys glance through this ones and you should be definitely able to understand this are you getting it pakka go by logic don't mug up journal entries go by logic and don't mug up journal entries if you go by logic you will definitely be able to ace it to understood this entry how is it split into this that's more than sufficient for you people to ace disposal based accounting got it in fact it is very very simpler to do it with the disposal than doing without disposal books will look very clean now you will say it's difficult in the practical scenario when you are doing any accounting for an asset you would prefer accounting with disposal it will look more clear and then uh, it will be easier for some, anyone to looks into the books of accounts to understand the same is that fine everyone fantastic so let's now get started with chapter 6 shall we come on let's do chapter 6 bills of exchange and as i had mentioned previously in chapter 6 we have several units 6.1 is bills of exchange 6.2 is goods sent on return or approval 6.3 consignment 6.4 average due date 6.5 account current 6.1 we'll do in class 6.2 3 4 5 the other units of chapter 6 entire lecture is available on ss academy's youtube channel only we will ping that again in the description to this video whoever is watching so that you can watch that or if you go to the video tab and search you will get it full chapter is there and uh, don't take average due date account current goods sent on return or approval lightly because they are simple topics they are simple doesn't mean it will not come in the exam there are times where goods sent on return or approval has come for 10 marks and majority of the times it's usually comes for 5 marks average rate account current 5 5 marks these are the questions where usually you have this proposition in mind no 100 marks 180 minutes 1.8 minutes per question sorry 1.8 minutes per mark this won't work in npo this won't work in partnership this won't work in certain chapters like uh, partnership npo final accounts and sometimes in company accounts so how do you gauge it that's covered up by your first question true or false theory question your average due date account current goods sent on return or approval and all of these places If you're writing five marker average due date account current question, you should not be taking five into one point eight eight minutes. You will be able to finish it in three minutes or four minutes with good practice. So there, whatever time you save, no, that time is what you can use in other places. Like a ten marker question from partnership, you can relaxly not just finish it in eighteen. You can take up to twenty twenty five minutes sometime. Possible. You can spend more time on that, provided you finish these questions in a smaller time. Got it? BRS will take lesser time than required. valuation of inventory will take lesser time than required so there you save time so that you can spend later are you getting it yes or no come on fantastic let's quickly start with the topic of bills of exchange shall we chapter 6 unit 1 chapter 6 unit 1 <coughs> bills of exchange so when you talk about bills of exchange bills of exchange arises because of credit transactions what is credit transaction such transaction which is not settled in cash what transactions are settled in cash cash transactions let's say i sell goods to my customer i sell goods to my and my customer instantly pays me cash my customer instantly pays me yeah he asked pay tm i said tm pay he paid over settled in cash cash transaction what is credit transaction credit transaction is where you sold goods to your customer and the customer is saying i don't have money now i'll pay later what does the customer say let deal pay you can agree okay fine boss pay later but on a later date when you go to your customer and then make a small talk before you initiate conversation about money and then say hi how are you if he responds i'm fine i'll give your money tomorrow it's good what if he replies hi but who are you because he doesn't want to accept the fact that you he owes you money he doesn't want to pay that then if he doesn't even recognize you would he really pay you the money no then you can't even do sus on him why you don't have any proper documentation that you have given him money so what do you do whenever you sell him goods 
and then he says that he will pay you money later. If he says that he will pay you money later, he will say, brother, I will send you one paper, please sign it and give. Later, if you say, who am I? You might not recognize me, but you will recognize your own autograph. Using that autograph, I will go to court of law, I will file a case against you and then recover the money that you should give me. I know how to recover. You get this? If not, I should only write bad debts entry and then cry. Are you getting it? So, whenever the goods are sold to the customer and customer says that he will pay later, along with the goods, you send one document to him. The seller to the buyer will send one document. This document will contain an unconditional order. What will it contain? What do you mean by unconditional order? This is an order made by the seller to the buyer. This is not an option given to the buyer. And the seller, when he gives this document, buyer can only keep the pen at one place to sign. Buyer cannot bargain or change the date. Bargain, uh, he cannot change any terms in the document. He cannot change the amount. He cannot change anything. Only thing that he can do is sign. So it's an order made by the seller and it is unconditional. Now, if I say, please come to class tomorrow also at 2 o'clock, you'll say, I will come provided you do this. If you say that is conditional order, you are letting me order to you, but you are placing your conditions. I will say, I won't do what you ask. I will do this. If you want, you come. You know, you should come. So, I am placing an order, not giving you any options to place conditions. So, unconditional means, I will make an order. You have to follow it. You can't tell, I will do it if, I will do it, but I will do it because of, I will do it in spite of, nothing, no nonsense. So, the seller drafts an order. He will write the date and he will say, I unconditionally order you to pay me or my order rupees 10,000 after 30 days. And this document will be sent along with the goods. The moment the buyer keeps the goods, the buyer should sign in that very document and then send it back to seller. Who prepares the document? Seller. He gives it to buyer. Buyer, what does he do? Accept. Accept means what? Signs. Have a look at this. This is the order sent by the seller. No. I unconditionally order you to pay me or my order a sum of rupees 10,000 after 30 days. What does the buyer do here? He will draw, he will put his signature. He will put this and then give it back. So, only draw E and the draw E is the name of the buyer. Draw E is the name of the drawer is the name of the seller. What is the name of the seller? Okay, come on in. So, drawer is the name of the seller. Draw E is the name of the buyer. Why? The reason is very, very simple. The one who is E schooling will always have E, -E in their name. Kanglish. E school or S really E E will be there. Who is giving? Seller. Who is E schooling? Buyer. So drawer is seller. Draw E is buyer. Who will pay money later? Buyer. Who will receive money? Ha. Who is E schooling money? Seller. Who is E schooling money? So seller's name is payee. Who is payer? Understood? Transferer, transferee. Consigner, consigner is the same. Consigner is the person sending. Consigner is the one who is receiving. E school or SRL, E, E will be there. Are you getting it? Employer, employee. Employer is giving employment. Employee is receiving employment. Payer, payee. Consigner, consignee. Transferer, transferee. Are you getting the logic? The one who is receiving it will always have what in their name? E, E. Two E's. For those of you, East Kododo in Kannada means receiving. Okay. I won't ask how many of you don't know Kannada. Made myself a promise. November month, I will not segregate. Next month, now November Kannada. Yeah? Yes. Doubt? Twice? No, no, no. Speaker Ali? Actually, Jagai the Munde. You can come little forward if you want. Break Akthidya. I will keep the mic a little far and then talk. Let's see. If, it, if the same problem continues, you tell me. Okay. Now, what is bill of exchange? We just discussed. It is an unconditional order. <coughs> what is bill of exchange? Uh, who makes the order? Drawer. Who makes the order? Made by drawer. Who made this? Unconditional order? Drawer. It's made by drawer. Other name is seller. Have a look at this. This seller is called as drawer. Who accepts it? Draw E. Okay. Accepted by draw E. Another name for draw E is buyer. It is an unconditional order made by drawer, accepted by draw E. Why is what is this order all about? To pay. What is it to? Uh, to pay. You cannot say, I unconditionally order you to buy me lunch for next 15 days. No, it's not like that. It is to pay a specific sum of money. To pay. Have a look at that. He signed it. So he has accepted it. What has he accepted for? To pay a specified sum. 
in the bill of exchange. I have to specifically mention the sum. I cannot say to pay whatever I ask, whenever I ask, how much ever I ask. No, that is only a message. See, some people are giggling. You should think what are they giggling for. Got these messages? You should give, okay, whenever I ask, huh? how much ever I ask, wherever. Doesn't matter where we are. It's not like that. Here a specified sum of money. You should mention 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. What he had sent you message? Rachin and gang. Yeah. You get this? So it was to pay a specified sum of money. The amount has to be specified. You can't keep it unspecified. And it should be paid. Shh. This is the important, most important part of the definition. What majority of the people have slight confusion or no idea about. It is to be paid. Either on a specific date or at the end of a specific period. What is it? Either on a specific date or at the end of a specific Very good. I will tell you how is it. Now, assume that I have sold goods to you. When I prepare a bill of exchange and then send it to you, I can unconditionally order you to pay me 10,000 rupees. On, let's say, 17th of December or I can say after 30 days. If I say 30 days, after today, 30 days ke baad you should pay. I am not mentioning the date. I am telling after 30 days. Or I can specifically tell 17th of December only you should pay. Both ways is possible. Both the ways is, if I mention period, it is called as bill with specific period. If I mention a specific date, it is called as bill with specific date. This is very important because based on this, your computation of due date and maturity, maturity date will change. If you don't understand that there are these two kinds of bill, no? You will think always three grace days is to be added. How many of you believe that always three grace days should be added to due date to arrive at maturity date? Answer would be wrong. Always you don't have to add three grace days. Three grace days should be added to due date only and only if, if it is bill with specific period. If it is bill with specific date, there is no concept of three grace days. Due date, maturity date, both will be same date. Can due date and maturity date be same date? The answer is yes. Should it be same? No, it need not be same. But can it be same? Yes, it can be same. When will due date and maturity date be same? If it is bill with specific, I raised a bill on you. In the bill I mentioned, you have to pay me money on 15th of August 2024. When should you pay me money? 15th of August 2024, it is bill with specific date, it is bill with specific date, it is bill with specific date, only for bill with specific period all the entire concept will come, you have, you know, no, when you sign 15th of August is Independence Day, Kotilva. which country are you, from here only, when you sign it, you have to pay me on 15th of August, are you getting it, forgot, everything what we discussed, so, if it is bill with specific date, holiday concept to three grace days concept and all won't come. That is first and final. If it is bill with specific period, only then it will come. I will come back to it. I got just little carried away and then went on to tell that. And you people confidently answered wrong. Now I am little skeptical. Should I slow down to two more days of class and one day only bill of exchange? No. Please study. You will not pass by attending the class. You will pass the exam by studying at home. Very important. Come on. So, you understood the definition of bill of exchange? Say something. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Come on. Let's see this here. So, after 30 days. I mentioned after 30. So, this is bill with specific period. This is bill with specific Fantastic, guys. Come on. Let's go ahead. And the money should be paid to me or my order. Now, you should pay money to me. Or if I am not there in the city. Let us say the day on which the bill will mature. I am not in town. I have gone out. You will say, no. Oh, okay. Cool. This is not that to give to that person specifically. This can be given to the order also. Okay, yeah, if I ask you to pay to somebody else in my absence, you should pay to that other person. Possible or not? Yes or no? Very good. Lovely guys. You guys know it. So what do I mean? It's an unconditional order made by the drawer, accepted by the drawee to pay a specified sum at the end of a specific period or on a specific date to draw her. Or is very good. This or is order is there. No, this makes the document transferable. This makes the document that's the reason we call it a negotiable instrument. It can be transferred. Let's say I am the drawer, I can give the bill to Tarun. Tarun can give it to one more person. One more person can give it to one more person. So, bill can be passed from one hand to another. That's the reason we call it what 
bill of exchange is a negotiable instrument the only difference between this bill of exchange and promissory note is this promissory note is not a negotiable instrument promissory note is not a promissory note is promise made by one person to another person rest of my life that's it Ashta. you can't say i on my absence i pass on the promise to it no 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 not possible promise will be one person made to another person promiser promisee promiser will make the promise promisee will receive the promise and let's say i have sold the goods to you i am ordering you i order you to pay me 10000 sign the document that's like authoritative no bill of exchange before i ask you to or i order you to sign you will be like you keep quiet i will only sign and give so instead of me writing i unconditionally order you will write i promise to pay you rupees 10000 on this date and you sign and give who drafted it you drafted it who signed it you signed it bill of exchange what's happening i will draft you will sign i am seller you are buyer who am i seller who are you i unconditionally order you accept the order i am drawer you are draw you are payer i am payee that is bill of exchange promissory note i don't order you yourself make promise you are promisor i am promisee i am receiving the promise you are the maker you made the promise i am not making make and all is not and then what do you sare illa matte make ante helthini last trust the or bere eno kelisutte small change me they'll tell some other thing fine so what happens next you are to pay money you are payer i am payee are you getting it that is the difference between promissory note and bill of exchange got it pakka very good so you understood what is a bill of exchange now let's quickly discuss the types of bill of exchange shall we so payer pay also you understood so what are the other names for buyer buyer drawee payer other names for seller seller drawer payee pakka say something fantastic guys so what are the various dates involved in bill of exchange first one bill date what is the first one sorry date of drawing what is the first one okay what is date of drawing ha ah, bill data date of drawing is bill data and not bill data date of drawing is the date on which bill is drawn date on which bill is i am seller you are buyer i send you goods when i am sending you goods i need to send one paper that paper one day i sat like this and then i wrote that letter then i wrote one date no correct or not that date is date of drawing the date on which i drew this letter the date on which i drew this this is date of drawing this is date of i will give this to you i will give this to you then you will see this bill that i gave that is date of uh, site or date of acceptance the day you see you sign no see this the date on which bill is drawn by the drawer if you observe this bill here he is written no 1st of december 2023 sorry no 1st of december bande illa no sulpa fast idu so 1st of december 2023 is there no what is this date of fantastic when this bill is given by drawer to drawee drawee will accept this at the end he will sign no kelagare drawee inti nimma preethiya drawee that signature when he does the date on which he does that signature no that is called as date of acceptance see what is date of acceptance date on which bill is accepted or signed by drawee come on we we'll go to the same bill we should not go to the above bill why should we not go to the above bill above bill is signature is not there that is sent by drawer drawee is sending here no here there will be signature shall we see see here 3rd of december so now have a look at this tell me what is date of drawing first of what if date of acceptance third of okay what is date of drawing what is date of acceptance how much is bill period how much is bill period okay now i have a question from when do we start counting 30 days should we start counting from 1st of december or should we start counting from 3rd of december 1st of december 3rd of december 1st of december how many how many we say first of december how many we say third of december i have not given you enough information you can't decide you actually cannot decide it depends upon the type of the bill it depends upon the is it bill after date or is it bill after side if it is bill after date 30 days will be counted from first of december if it is bill after side we start counting from third of december sir if they don't tell anything what do we do ask them sir exam we can't ask ah exam you can't ask in a realistic scenario you would ask the client when you don't know and they don't tell what do we do assume it to be bill after date 
unless they specifically mention always we'll assume it is bill after date and we'll start counting from 1st of december unless they mention it is bill after site are you getting it pakka come on let's understand the next one next one is bill date what is the next one date of drawing over date of acceptance over date of drawing the date on which bill is drawn date of acceptance the date on which bill is accepted what is bill date what is bill date no answer the date from which we start counting bill period the date from which we start counting so bill date can be date of drawing or bill date can be date of acceptance bill date can be date of drawing or it can be date of what do you mean by bill date bill date is the date from which we start counting bill period the 30 days you start counting no you can start counting from first or you can start counting from from whenever you start counting that date is bill date i'll repeat bill date can be date of drawing bill date can be date of acceptance everyone understood this have a look bill date depends upon the type of bill depends upon the if it is bill after date then bill date is date of drawing if it is bill after site bill date is date of acceptance observe here in this case first of december is there no from this first of december we start counting 30 days from first of december we start counting 30 days that is bill date when it is bill after date if it is bill after site sir you didn't understand observe here read this bill in detail what does it say heading heading ah bill after date so from when do you start counting 30 days artha come on let's see the next one if it is bill after site then bill date is date of very good now have a look at this look at this bill what does it say it says bill after ah does it say bill after date so there is a period of 30 days from where do we start counting 30 from 1st of december or 3rd of december why it is bill after very good the 30 days is counted from 3rd of december everyone got this pakka now we know the two types of bill come on let's quickly see the next one next one is due date what is the next one when is the bill due for settlement when is the bill uh, due date is again dependent upon the type of bill. again it depends upon the due date is dependent upon the type of bill it is whether is it bill uh, bill with specific date or is it bill with specific period it is dependent upon the fact whether it is bill with specific date or bill with specific if it is bill with specific date there is one date mentioned no that date is due date that date is if it is bill with specific period then what do we do that period will be mentioned no in the question at the end of that period will be due date at the end of that period will be when from when do we start counting that period that is bill date it can be date of drawing it can be date of acceptance are you getting it observe due date what does due date depend upon type of bill due date depends upon the okay there are two types of bill for the purpose of due date for the purpose of due date how many types of bill two types bill with specific period bill with specific date if it is bill with specific period in the bill we mention some period 30 days 45 days one month two months here what have we mentioned 30 days what have we mentioned here this is bill with specific period now this period of 30 days should be counted from 1st of december or 3rd of december in some specific cases at the end of that period it becomes due date are you getting it let's take let's quickly take this 30 days add it to 1st of december shall we add it to 1st of december so due date is bill date plus bill period due date is bill date plus answer no i am shouting what is due date you are writing exam not me you remember no that you are writing exam oh, hey have you confused i am also writing it no over mine long ago for those of you who don't know my exam is over i have passed the examination already congratulations Silva. related congratulations so bill date is first of december i'll add bill period of 30 days observe 1 12 2023 plus 30 days 1 12 2023 plus how do we add very simple one is dates column 12 is month column 2023 is year column dd mm y y am i right this 30 is d na m ma y d add d to d 
D is how much first in build date? 1. Add 30. 30 plus 1. 31, 12, 2023 is our due date. What is our due date? Have a look. What is our due date? 31, 12, 2023. Did you understand? If they would have given one month, then what would have you done? Don't add it to days column. Add it to month column. Month is 12. Add 1. It will become first of 13th month, 2023. Sir, but 2023 has only 12 months. What is 13th month? Next year. Okay. So, what do you do? 13. Only 12 months are there in 2023. Deduct 12. After 12, it will become next year column. So, add 1 to 2023. In units, 10s, 100s column, what do you do? 9. If it is 9 plus 2, what do you do? 9 plus 2 is 11. 1 you write. 1 you send it to 10s column. Correct. Huh? Here, what do you do? Dates you write. If it dates goes beyond the dates available, you write it to months column. If months goes beyond 12, you transfer it to year column. There you do like this, no. Units to 10s, 10s to 100s. Here you do ulta. Dates to months, months to year. Like Japanese manga. Ulta would be. Don't understand. Sir, then, sir, why It's called... Uh, it's a comic, but they call comic as manga. Fine. Bill with specific date. Bill with specific date means in the bill they will mention the specific date. Observe here. Read this. I unconditionally order you to pay me or my order a sum of rupees 10,000 on 31st of December 2020. I mentioned the date. So, what is due date? Sir, acceptance was made on 4th of December. Do I care? No. Sir, signature was made on 15th of December. Do we care? No. I am not Vishweshwaraya to give a damn. The maturity date, due date, both will be 31st of December only. There is going to be no change in that. Whether it is bill after date, bill after site, we don't care. It is bill with specific date. It is bill with specific. I have told that you should pay me on 31st of December. You have agreed that you will pay me on 31st December. Even if 31st of December is a Sunday, you should pay me on 31st of December. Sir, 31st of December, Happy New Year Eve. Clearly, you pay me and then after that you celebrate your happy year. Are you getting it? Yes, boss. Exam. Palla. Oh, 31st of December. Oh, all the best guys. Do well in your CA foundation examination. Accounts exam on 31st, no? My God, when I made this presentation, I never thought 31st December will be exam day. Exam will be done. Okay, you understood? If it is bill with specific date, due date will be equal to, due date will be equal to specific date. Are you getting this? Come on. Let's quickly see the last one. Maturity date. What is maturity? Shall we see maturity date? Now, you people are slightly confused. Sunday, you should pay that day only is telling. Is telling due date and maturity date will be same in some days. Is this guy mad? No, I am not mad. I will tell you why is maturity date concept coming. Whenever I say that I should pay you money and you say that you should pay me money, any of the cases, we both agree that we should pay on 25th of December, 31st of December, 2nd of October, 15th of January, 26th of January, we don't care. I have told one date, you have heard the date. So, we know now some common date is there in both of our mind. It will be settled on that date. It will be settled on, the problem comes when we say 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, 1 month. Two months. We don't know. No, one month means after one month, what date will be? We don't know. It should be computed. So we will not agree. There is a very good possibility that we might not remember the date. Are you getting it? So whenever we agree upon a period, now when we say 30 days, it is dependent upon a lot of things. 30 days from 16th of November is not 16th of January. In between 31 days is there in December. Are you getting it? 30 days from December to January, you get something. January to February, you get something. February to March, you don't get same. Why? February only 28 days. If it is leap year, 29 days. So, days and months when you bring it in, no, it will not be same. And the person might not remember that due is on that date. So, the moment it is due, if you don't pay, you should pay the money on due date. You should not pay the money on maturity date. When should you pay the money? Due date. However, they say, grace I will give 3 days. What if that day you are not free? What if that day you are busy? What if that day some problem happens and you can't pay? So, I will give you three grace days after that to pay. It doesn't mean that always after due date, three days later only you should pay. No. You should, you should, they say no. I say also when the exam form comes, they will say, should fill your exam form by this date. If you don't fill, with the fine, three days or ten days, five days time they will give, with fine to pay. Should you uh, fill it with the fine within those five days only? No, you can file it that day or before that also. However, if you delay that, they will give 5 days time to fail with the fine. Are you getting it? Here, no interest will be charged for those 3 days. Papa, one day delay, no. 
one day delay you don't want to compute interest so you give grace grace means what first ball you play no it's okay papa just like that so something like that are you getting what i'm trying to tell maturity date is three days away from due date only and only if it is bill with specific period only and only if bill with specific if it is bill with specific date i have told you have heard i have written you have signed that you should pay money to me on 26th of january then when should you pay the money to me Sir, it is Republic Day. Happy Republic Day. Pay my money. You know, no, 26th of January is Republic Day. I have told, no, you have agreed. Sir, can I pay 27th? Yeah. Sir, then should I pay one day interest? Depends upon both of us. One day, no, it's okay. You pay. If I let you, then you don't have to pay interest. But in literal accounting terms, should you pay one day interest? Are you liable? Yes. Can I bound to collect one day? Yes, I can collect one day interest. If we literally sit and then talk. Otherwise, it's just grace. Okay, fine. Take one day. But if it is bill with specific period, in the bill we mentioned 30 days. And that 30th day falls on 23rd. And then 3 grace days ke baad, it comes to 26th. Then I must allow you to that one day, like because it is a holiday, you should pay me the day before. Or if it is an unknown holiday, then the day after. That concept will come. Are you getting it? Pakka. Cool. Come on. Let's go to the next one. So, maturity date. It again depends upon the type of the bill. If it is bill with specific period, then we'll add three grace days to due date to arrive at maturity date. If it is bill with specific date, then that specific date, what is mentioned? No, that date itself is due date. That date itself is maturity date. It will become due and it will become mature on the same date. Understood this? Pakka? Yes or no? Fantastic, guys. So, if maturity date falls on a holiday, then what do we do? People watching it online, hi, Papa, they're, they're, no one talks to them, they're feeling left out, drop hi, yeah, come on, tell me, what if maturity date falls on a holiday, depends upon the type of holiday, depends upon the known holiday, unknown holiday, so, what is this concept of known holiday, unknown holiday? There is nothing called known holiday, festival holiday, national holiday, Indian holiday, international holiday, religious holiday. There is nothing of this. Under Negotiable Instrument Act 1881, under Negotiable Instrument Act 1881, there will be list of holidays that will be released every year. Calendar of events you get no in your school or college, like that, they will release the list of holidays. In that list of holidays, if the holiday is mentioned, it is known holiday. It is a scheduled holiday. In that list of holidays, if the date is not mentioned, it is an unknown holiday. Are you getting it? Bakrid, Christmas, Gandhi Jayanti, Nehru Jayanti, any Jayanti, Valmiki Jayanti, Malaya, Mavasya, every, anything. If it is mentioned in that list, it is a known holiday. If it is not mentioned in that list, but they are still declared holiday. It is an unknown holiday. Are you getting this logic? But do we have to mug up that list of holidays for every time? No, we don't have to mug up the list of holidays for every time. For us, only five holidays are to be remembered. How many holidays? Five. What are they? Two in the name of the nation. 26th of January, Republic Day. 15th of August, Independence Day. I will tell you again. Two in the name of the nation. What are they? 26th of January, Republic Day. 15th of August, Independence Day. 14th or 15th? India, no? Uh, 15th of August, Independence Day. Two days in the name of accounts. Two days in the name of? What are two days? Opening of books of accounts, 1st of April. Opening of books of accounts, 1st of April. Half yearly closing, 30th September. Half yearly, 30th September. And last one, all Sundays. Last one, only this much. Don't take Christmas, don't take Gandhi Jayanti. Totally November 14th, Children's Day, you take. October 2nd, Gandhi Jayanti, you take. January 1st, holiday, you take. February 14th, you take. Sir, no, don't take any of this. Are you getting what I am trying to tell? Only 5 known holidays. How many? What are there? 26th January Republic Day. 15th of August Independence Day. 1st of April opening of books of accounts. 30th of September half yearly close. Last one. Sir, should I mug up all the Sundays and then go? No, you don't have to. In the question, if they mention it is Sunday, it is Sunday. In the question, if they don't mention it is Sunday, it is not a Sunday. Sir, for example, sir, sir, the bill fell on uh, 18th of November. Maturity date came for 18th of November 2023. You know 18th of November is 2023. Why? That is the date 
sorry that is that day you went on sorry that day you went on date no that date is sunday you know it you know it very clearly that day you will never forget that day you will never forget can you take it as sunday holiday and then take the day before no not unless they mention in the question are you getting it 15th of november 2023 is your maturity date 15th of november 2023 is the maturity date and uh, in the question they have mentioned that 15th of november is sunday you know sir 15th of november i remember 50th century virat kohli not sunday vankade it is a thursday i remember sir wednesday it is wednesday you remember very clear can you argue in the exam no if they tell it is sunday you assume it to be sunday you consider it to be sunday so sundays will be mentioned in the question it will be mentioned in the if they have not mentioned is it sunday it is not sunday are you getting it if it falls on any of these known holidays what are the known holidays that we will consider 26 January, 15th August, 1st April, 30th September, all Sundays. Are these the only five known holidays? No, no, no. Everything is Ugadi, Sankranti, Deepavali, Bakrid, Moharam, Good Friday, Guru Nanak Jayanti, Mahavir Jayanti, Valmiki Jayanti, Kanakadasa Jayanti. Anything, if it is mentioned in the list issued under Negotiable Instrument Act, it is known holiday. But we cannot mug up the list. We will remember five. Are you getting it? If it falls on this, then the day before the day however if it is not any of this if it is any other holiday because you take two frequent breaks so you don't sit there with your friends you sit somewhere in the corner you go to washroom you stay there i don't have a problem later don't blame me but don't disturb four people for one person's washroom if he has to go to washroom four people should stand up and then salute him salam rocky boy and then he'll go when he comes back, he has done great achievement. Four people should give standing version. <laughs> and then he will say, what achievement have you done? How ugly input you have output. Yesterday you had one lecture, no? You should have bowel movement may control. Three hours you should be able to sit without going to washroom. That entire lecture happened all thanks to him. Yes. All thanks to him. Because of him only that lecture came yesterday. Fine. So if it is on no holiday, the day before this, the day... If it is an unknown holiday, then the day. Okay, let's say. Shh, let's quickly test how well you have understood. So the due date first falls on first of April. Then what will be the date? What date will you consider? No due date bidre Allah maturity date bidre matra. Enge joko. Yeah. Enge joko. Yeah. Come on. Did you understand? If the maturity date falls on the holiday, then we take the day before. Or the day after, not the due date. Due date falls on an unknown holiday. Okay, apparently. Yes, we do three grace days okay, we pay the money. If it is only maturity date, we do this. Do you get it? Everyone understood? Paka? Should I tell one joke? Yes? One said, Mommy pig, tante, mate, baby pig, tante. Baby pig will ask, Mommy pig, Mommy pig. Better free. Mate, copyright issue agate. It's getting pushed in. Yeah, shall we go ahead? Hey, this is not that inspiration. This is joke. Actually, that inspiration was also like joke only. Omelette, chicken, yeah, no, yeah. So, maturity date is the day before. Unknown holiday, the day next to working day. What is it? Uh? Ah, remember the language. Shh. The language is the next uh, working day. Because some creative people will ask, Sir, for example, maturity date falls on Monday. That day is unknown holiday. Then what date? Next one. Sir, next day is Sunday. That next, sir, that next day is Independence Day. Hey, that, after that one day you will work? No. Like, Angala, sir. Now, unknown holiday says next day. Next day is known holiday. That says previous day. Unknown holiday, Ratri, correct, happy birthday, I'll put pay madakagata. No. It is like, the moment it falls on an unknown holiday, it is next working day. Whenever next day you open your shop and then you do working that day. Are you getting it? In the midst of this, you have some kiddo, you know, doubt like, okay, sir, Negotiable Instrument Act came in 1881. How does Negotiable Instrument Act know that in 1947, India will get independence? That act is amended over a period of time every year. And in the official gazette, they'll issue the list of holidays every year. Are you getting it? So some people think, Allah, Negotiable Instrument Act, only 26th of January, they've given holiday. Maybe the people, when they were making the law, they made one time machine, came to 1950, saw Republic Day, said, said congratulations to Bhimra Ambedkar, sir, and went back and then mentioned it in the Negotiable Instrument Act. Understood this? Pakka, say something, guys. <coughs> then, 
this chapter is a this chapter is a chapter where the questions will come only on journal entries there is no concept of ledger in this chapter there is no concept of various cases variety variety color color journal entries will be asked in this chapter you should be able to do it one of the very easy chapters to do including mixed journals and accommodation yeah let's quickly finish it types of bill what we already discussed two categories depends upon the basis what we think i want silence yeah based on bill date and based on maturity date based on the bill date the bill can be categorized as bill after date and bill after sale based on the bill date bill can be categorized into bill after date and bill after sale people here are making fun ha i want silence you people are silent okay yeah bill after date bill period starts from bill date uh, sorry bill period starts from date of drawing bill after sale bill period starts from date of acceptance what about maturity date bill with specific date and bill with specific period see this bill with specific date bill with specific uh, period and bill on site and bill on commencement or bill on demand sir is the bill after date alone observe very clearly bill after site is different from bill on site bill after site is different from bill on site i'll tell you what it is first let me tell you what is bill with specific period and bill with specific date i already told let's quickly tell it once again bill with specific period means in the bill i will mention the period for which the bill is given at the end of that period bill will be due after that three grace days will be given for maturity it's not must is given alone what is bill with specific date bill with specific date means the date that is mentioned in the bill is the due date that date itself is maturity date avatte satidu avatte tithi due date maturity date is the date that is mentioned in the that is what bill with specific everyone understood this what is bill on site bill on demand bill on presentment it is like we did trade when we are friends i and you are very very good friends very good friends pinky friends you get this every day you send 10 reels to me on friendship you get this i like all of them and i'll send 20 reels to you. such thick friendship in our friendship i sold goods to you you bought goods from me and i will raise a bill on you you get this you will accept it i unconditionally order you to pay me a sum of rupees 10000 whenever i ask and you accept it when will i ask whenever you have money i will ask hey bro do you have money today bro says no i don't have money it's okay i'll ask tomorrow tomorrow i'll ask do you have money today yes yes ah fine i'll ask today you give me money today. i'll raise it today and then you give me money today. so whenever i demand whenever i present it for payment whenever i show it to you and ask for payment that day you should pay me that is called bill on site that is called bill on demand that is called bill on present one day we both fight why you didn't tag me in one of the meme you tagged my other friend i am offended i'll say pay me now it's a duddila i don't care i am demanding the bill now you should pay me now due date today maturity date today you don't pay from tomorrow pay with interest that's how it is this is bill on demand bill on site bill on present when is bill on demand bill on site bill on present due when it is presented for payment whenever the drawer asks draw you should pay whenever the drawer asks draw you should are you getting this pakka fantastic so based on this you have to do accounting let's quickly see one uh, beautiful question from the material shall we say something Yes, sir. Hey, when I'm scrolling down, why are people talking? What bad habits people have? Exam or also will do this, no? Evaluator is giving the answer. Question paper will be like talking. Like what's wrong? It's okay. I'm just talk. I'm just talking. I'm not discussing answer. then if in case the evaluator will tell something then justice for adon band bidte nim ah observe then church street only candle observe everyone Shh. bill date date of acceptance both are given first row is bill date second row is date of acceptance they have mentioned it to be after date after so if they mention bill after date from where do we start counting from 31st of january how many days one month when they give one month it is 30 days or 31 days one month means one month 30 days means 30 days when they tell one month you don't translate it to 30 days when they tell 30 days you don't translate it to one month are you getting this so when they tell one month 31 1 2015 add one month 
31 to 2015. What will it become? 31 to 2000. The moment it becomes 31 to 2015. Second, that is February month when 31 days are not there. 2015 is not a leap year. Sir, how do we get to know whether it is leap year? Take the year, divide it by 4. Take the year in your calculator, divide it by 4. If you get whole number, it is leap year. If you get decimal number, it is not a leap year. It is not a, are you getting it? 2015, if you putting and then checking your calculator, you will get decimal number. It is not a leap year. It is not a, are you getting it? When it is not a leap year, then what do we do? Only 28 days. So, 31st of February means 3 days later. So, that is 3rd of March. Ah? No, it is last day of February. What day should we take? Last day of? So, from the last day of this month, January, May, whatever day you give bill for one month, it will be due in February only. It cannot go to March. March is two months from January, not one month from January. January, any date I give bill for one month, it should be due in February only. It cannot go to March. Are you getting the logic here? Yes or no? However, if I mention days, 31 days, I mention how many days? Or I mention 30 days. What do you mention? If I mention 30 days, then 31st of January 2015 plus 30 days will become 61st of January 2015. 61 days is there in January. No, only 31. After 31 days, it will become February. So, 61 minus 31. 30. Correct. Ah. From 61, when we eliminate 31, it will go to next month. You add 1 to month of January. It will become 2. 31 February 2015. Now, tell me, is there 31 February? No. So, then we take 3 days in March. 28 we deduct and make the month 3. 31 minus 28 will be 3. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3, 3, 2015. Are you getting it? Yes or no? Whenever they give month, whenever they give month, you add that month to the date. If the date is there, that date. If the date is not there, then the last date. Don't take the month after that. If it is days given, if it is when the days are getting converted to month in the computation, ah, then it can go to the month after that also. Are you getting the logic? Yes or no? From 31st of August, if the bill is for one month, what is due date? 31st of August, one month. It will become 31st of September. But is there 31st of September? No, 30th September. 30th? Are you getting it? From 30th of September, if I give one month, then 31st of October or 30th of October? Hey, last date of September in the one month means last date of October. No. Last date will be taken only when the date corresponding is not there. From 30th September, one month is 30th October. Not 31st. Why? 30th is there. 30th is? Don't take 31st. From 31st of October, one month is 31st of November. 31st is not there in November. Take 30th November. From 30th November to one, one month is 30th December, not 31st December. Are you getting the logic? From 31st December, one month is 31st January. Why? December, January, 31st, 31st is there. From 31st July, one month is? From 31st, uh, assume on, on February 28th. I change the question. From 31st July, one month. 31st August. Why? July and August both have 31, 31. Enge? When you start counting January, February, March, April, May, June, July, Bartala, July, Pakhtal, August. Both are both land on knuckle. That's the reason they have 31 days. Story. Ha, kathe, beda, ega, story. Ha, I'll tell you some other day. Why February has 28 days? Why July and August has 31 days? Some other day. Yeah? Now come on. Now, 30 days after date. From where do we count? 28th of January. Here, two months after date, from where do we count? 31st of January. Here, one month from where do we count? Hey, answer. Count this 12th of July, one month. 12th of July plus one month. 12th of August. What date is it? Due date. Should we give three grace days or not? It is bill with specific period. We should give three grace days. 12th of August plus three grace days. 13, 14, 15. 15th. Independence Day. So, when should we pay? What if 14th is Sunday? Hey, 13th. Sunday, Sunday. You tell me Sunday. No holiday. Then what day? 13th. Kush. 
Understood? Oh, you told wrong answer. Thirteenth is Sunday, then twelfth. Twelfth is unknown holiday. Sixteenth. Next working day, no? Sixteenth, Agat. Sir, sixteenth is Sunday. Hey, one Sunday to another Sunday, minimum seven, six days. In any calendar. One Sunday to one more Sunday, six days. Okay. Understood these guys? Any doubts? Can we go forward? Yes, sir. Second Saturday holiday. Second Saturday, fourth Saturday, anything. If it is mentioned in the list of holidays given by Negotiable Instrument Act, it will be holiday. Even if they mention Tuesday to be holiday. Why? Aage sumne. Mangalwara. Swarana yalla. Varagori vratta. Is there. Tuesday they announce holiday. Oh, take it. If they give, you take it. I am, who am I to say stop? Now we Kodi, Mangalwara Raja Kodi, Shukurwara Raja Kodi, semi final Mathe final match or the runner Raja Kodi and Kirti Got it? Okay, guys. <coughs> Let's go to the next one. Ah, towards the end of the year, we have seen on demand, on site, on presentation. What does it mean? Whenever we ask that day itself is the maturity date, undue date. Are you getting it? Paka. Okay, guys. See, don't take this part of bills of exchange lightly. Don't skip this because this concept of bills of exchange will not just come in bills of exchange chapter. It will come in consignment chapter and it will also come in several other chapters indirectly. Please be cautious. Please. Got it? Say something. Come on. Let's quickly discuss journal entries. Shall we? Idala, idala. Uh, all of this is over. Let's discuss journal entries on this topic and then we'll call it a day for this topic. <laughs> all fine. Huh. <coughs> How to do accounting for bills of Shh. How to do accounting for bills of exchange depends upon the option exercised by drawer. How to do accounting for bills of exchange depends upon the option exercised by drawer is the seller. Seller has three options. I can hear people talk. Seller has three options. How many options? Option number one. He can hold it till the maturity date. He has sold the goods. He has received the bill. He will tell. He will hold the bill till maturity date. When will he hold it till? On the date when the drawee will accept the bill and then pay the money. Till that date, I will keep the bill with me and then wait. Till that day, I will keep and wait. That day when he gives, I will give the bill and I will collect money. Second option with him is he wants the money immediately. Urgent. I want eagle urgent. I don't know what does he do there. Interesting. So he wants the money immediately. Tumba urgent. Emergency. Then what do you do? Discount it with banker. What do we do? Meaning you will go to banker and then say, Banker, banker, I have a bill of exchange. It will mature after one month. But I'm tumba urgent. I want money immediately. Banker will tell one second. I will give you money, but I will not give full. I will cut some money and then give. So what do they do? Let's say the bill is 1 lakh rupees and it will mature after 1 month. They will fix 1 percentage, 6%, 5%, 8%, 10%. So much amount pay, so much percentage for that period. They will multiply, they will arrive at some amount. So much money will be deducted from 1 lakh and the balance will be given to drawer. You get this? That deducted part is income to banker. What is it? And that bill now will be now with the banker. And this process is called discounting. What is it called? Banker will hold this bill and wait till maturity date. Banker will hold this bill and wait till on the maturity date, banker will present the bill to the drawee and collect money. If the drawee doesn't pay the money, then banker will come back to draw. Are you getting this? Yes or no? And the last option is endorsement. What is the last option with drawer? What do you mean by endorsement? See, I have sold goods to you. I, I have sold goods to my customer. And I have drawn a bill on my customer. My customer has accepted the bill and given it to me. I am drawer and seller. There is a customer who is drawing. Are you getting it? Similarly, to sell these goods to my customer, I have purchased goods from my supplier. From whom have I purchased goods? My supplier is asking, Kas Beko, Kas Beko, Kas Kodo Mama is asking. He is asking, my supplier. I am telling, wait boss, I will give. He is like, I will draw a bill on you. I will say, don't draw a bill on me, one second. Please wait. Control. So, my supplier is asking for money and my supplier is about to draw a bill on me. I don't want to be drawer and drawing. I don't want to be drawer to my customer and draw it to my 
supplier. I will say one second, wait. Rather than me drawing a bill on him, and then you drawing a bill on me, me accepting the bill, you are having one bill, I am having one bill. Why save? Why waste paper? Why waste paper? This guy gave me one bill, no. On that I will put one signature and then I will pass it to you. You keep it. You collect money from him. This is called endorsement. What is it called? What do we do in endorsement? Environmental saving. Save trees. I will pass the bill given by my customer to me to my supplier. I will pass the bill what my customer gave me to my supplier. On the maturity date, my supplier will collect money from my customer. My supplier will collect money from my what will I do? He call none there. He call none there. None call me, none call up. They both will collect money. Are you understood? Yes or no? I won't. They both will collect. They both will fight. Are you getting the logic here? In this process, I am giving the bill to him. Who am I? Draw her for the original bill. When I am giving it to him, I am endorser. Who am I? Endorse. And my supplier is receiving the bill. Endorse. Who is he? Endorse. On the maturity date, my customer is paying the money. My customer is payer. Who is my customer? Who is my supplier? Payee. Understood? My supplier is payee. And my customer is payer. Me? Nothing. I am chilling. I am endorser. I am endorser and drawer. You collect money. Did you receive? Did you give? Happy the poverty to both of you. <laughs> and I Did you get this logic? Uh -huh. Now come on. Let's quickly see the accounting it is. And throughout, two things to remember. In the books of banker, accounting entries will not be required in CA foundation level. In the books of the banker, you don't have to learn accounting entries. Second one, in the books of draw e, sorry, in the books of draw e, customer, customer is there no? In his books, entries are same whether you hold it till maturity, discount it with banker or endorse it. Entries will be same to same, no difference. Shall I repeat once again what I told? Accounting entries in the books of banker is not required. Accounting entries in the books of banker is and entries in the books of draw E. Entries in the books of E is same whether I hold the bill till maturity, or discount it with banker or endorse it to my supplier. In all the three cases, in his books, entries will be same to same, no difference. Got it? Can I go further ahead? Come on. Let's quickly see the first set of entries. Draw or draw E. I am seller. Where am I? I sold goods. Entry is draw E account to sales. Draw E will write purchase account debit to draw. For him it is purchase, for me it is sales. I receive the bill from him, for me it is bills receivable asset. I write bills receivable account debit to draw E. Draw E the giver of benefit. Draw E has accepted the bill. It is liability to him. He will credit bills payable and debit draw. What is the entry to him? Draw her account debit to bills payable. What is the entry to him? Hey, you guys should open your mouth and then talk. Uh, if you don't talk and then summa sit and then I throw out talk, my throat will go dry and I'll drink something warm to keep it moist. But I will not write exam. But unfortunately, you write exam. You should be a little proactive. What do you say? Will you? Uh, now, tell me what is the entry when I receive the bill? <laughs> Very good. In the books of draw e, what will be the entry? Understood this? Very good. Now on the maturity date, there can be two possible scenarios. One, good news. Bill matured. One, bad news. This much time, if you sit there, intestines also will come out. My God. Hey, correct or not? I don't have a problem people spending time in washroom. You go to washroom. If you really have so much business, you go. Keep your phone outside and then go. You will come back in 10 minutes. You take your phone and go. You won't come back for one hour. You phone and you scroll down. Scroll down. Only scroll up. Oh, only scroll up throughout. Then once you come to the end of your, oh, you will understand very late. Easy tip to save time. Don't take your phone to washroom. At least then you keep your phone away and then go. I will tell you seriously. You wouldn't understand how much time will you get extra in the day. You won't even realize. Oh my God, this much time I had in day. I can finish bathing, shitting, everything in 10 minutes. I didn't know only. 
Ja. Okay, come on. Next. Someone is sending score in the chat. Sir, South Africa 44 for 4. Chat. Nonsense, people. Come on. Temba boom out. Ah. Hey, for Australia to win today, one person has to play well. Who? Temba boom. If he plays 20 overs, Australia will win. If he gets out early, Aiden Makram will come and I will go to the Okay. Yes. On the maturity date, two possible scenarios can happen. There is something hot in this. I'll throw now. People talk. There is two possible things that can happen on maturity date. Number one, honoring. Good news. Number two, dishonoring. Bad news. If in case the bill is honored, if in case the bill is, I receive money, cash account debit. Two bills receivable because I gave the bill back. See what is the entry? Cash account debit to. In the books of draw, what will be the entry? Understood this? Fantastic. If the bill is dishonored, if the bill is dishonored, what would happen? I will give the bill back to him. I will credit bills receivable account. But I will not receive cash. I will not receive cash. Are you getting it? I will debit his account because he should pay me money. I will debit draw e account for bill amount. I will credit bills receivable account for bill amount. He should pay me money. If I have paid, I would have written cash to bills receivable. He didn't pay. So I will write his name to bills receivable. I won't keep that bill with me. And I won't just ask him to pay me the bill amount. I will ask him to pay noting charges also. I will ask him to pay. What is noting charges? Noting charges the expense that I incur to prove that he is the one who is culprit or doesn't pay me money. Now, I have raised a bill on him and doesn't pay me money. On the maturity date when he doesn't pay, what do I do? Go to court of law? I go to court of law. I submit. Your honor, this guy is not paying me money. Law, court, what say, judge, judge will ask. You know, your honor, I will pay. Then judge will make what? Do you, do you think this place is a joke? You he filed a case saying that you don't want to pay? No, sir, I will pay. Okay, pay. Go. Then what do I do now? I am a joke to you people. So it should be proved that the drawee is not paying money. Only then you can file a case. So what do you do? Before you go to judge, before you go to court, you should go to notary public. You should go to notary public is lawyer with a specific year of practice. No, will be authorized to become a notary public. They would have to write some examination, get some license. What you do is, now let's say you are the drawer. You go to notary public, you give that bill of exchange and then say, Sir, this, this, this story, sir, I sold it to that guy, sir, that guy signed the document, now he doesn't even recognize me, sir, he's not even paying me money. I'm going into depression, what do I do? Notary public will say, chill, relax, boss, wait. He will issue one notice, saying that this particular bill has come to me, and it has come to my notice that you owe money to him, are you going to pay? He'll send the notice. Draw E has to reply, ignorance is not content, has to reply with money. If he doesn't reply with money, notary will put one seal and then say, yes, I also tried. Asking money, that idiot didn't pay. This notary public will give this signed document. Using this document, you can file a case. Without this document, only bill, you can't file a case. Are you getting it? To do that, no notary. They'll not do free. They'll charge money. You pay money. That money is noting charges. What is that money? Such noting charges, whatever is incurred, is not my expense. It is his expense. Because of him, I incurred this expense. He should pay me my bill money. And he should also pay this noting charges. I will put the blame on him. But I cannot ask him to pay. Own mail case file maada ke. Own ne bill pay maadur maad thana. He will not pay. Pai first I will pay. Then I will recover it from him. So when I pay I will write noting charges to cash. Later when I debit his account. I will not just debit for bill amount. I will ask him to pay me bill amount plus noting charges. I will credit my bills receivable because I have given you the bill. And I will also credit noting charges. Whatever expense I have debited here. I will credit it here because it is no longer there. And in the books of drawee, bills payable account debit. Liability is reducing. Draw or account credit. Liability is increasing. And we also need to pay noting charges along with bill amount. So liability is increasing for bill amount plus noting charges. Got it? Later, this noting charges being expense should be transferred to PNL account. Ah, understood this? Say something. Fantastic people. Second option with the drawer. Discounting. What is the second option of the drawer? Hey, there just after TV, I can see a few people talking. No talking. Get this? Yeah, you guys shouldn't talk. 
there is no reason to talk you can't justify why you are talking ya ene maatadru thappe naan helidhu correct you only sir you understood no i am talking to the one in front of topi you only don't turn back gotaita give me a thumbs up ha ah, very good saku now drawer wants the money immediately discounts it with the banker when the bill when the sale is made when the purchase is made same interest there is going to be no change there when the bill is drawn acceptance is received same interest there is going to be no change in the entry when the bill is discounted with the banker uh, this is where the entry will be made by drawer i am drawer i went to bank i gave the bill i collected money i will write bank account debit to the extent money is received from the banker some money i forgo that is discounting charges that discounting charges is expense to me i will debit discounting charges upon credit is bills receivable because it's going up so what is the entry when the bill is discounted with the banker come on everyone bank account debit to what extent bill amount minus discounting charges then discounting charges account debit to what extent to the extent of discounting charges credit will be bills receivable account got it for this there will be no entry in the books of draw e draw e will not write it. he doesn't care you discount it you endorse it you keep it wherever you want i won't pass entry i will pass the entry only when i honor or when i dishonor are you getting it then on the maturity date if the bill is honored drawer will not write an entry why on the maturity date banker will collect money from draw e drawer doesn't get involved so drawer will not pass any entry draw e will write normal entry draw e doesn't look at the face when he is making the payment he just make the payment it can be banker it can be drawer it can be endorsee doesn't mean doesn't care he has to pay the money he will pay the money in his books entry is bills payable to cash if it is honored bills payable to draw e if it is dishonored sorry bills payable to drawer if it is dishonored did you get this say something if the bill gets dishonored banker will not try to deal with draw e banker will throw the bill back on my face first i wrote the entry bank to bills receivable now bills receivable is coming back bills receivable to bank here i received not full bill amount i received bill amount less discounting charges now when i pass dishonor entry i will pass it for bill amount for what amount will i pass this entry my journal entry will be bills receivable account debit to bank account bill amount bill amount sir but we received less than bill amount yeah that difference is my expense bank's income book to over on the maturity date bank wants bill amount on the maturity date bank wants what whether it is draw e or it is draw or banker doesn't care what i want is bill amount that's it are you getting the logic okay great if there is any noting charges paid that also you mix it and then charge it to draw e. this entry is same common entry in all the three cases all the three cases it's going to be same entry in endorsement also same purchase same sale all the all the things will be same i want to teach you one simple entry what is the entry when the bill is endorsed what is the entry when the bill is endorsed let's say i am drawer Where am I? I have sold goods to my customer. I have given bill to my customer. He has given me bill with acceptance. I gave it to my supplier. Bill is going out. No, bills receivable account credit. Bills receivable account. Whom am I giving it to? Supplier. I will write supplier account debit to bills issue. Supplier account debit to my supplier is receiving the bill. Bills receivable account debit to drawer. Have a look in the books of supplier. What is the entry? bills receivable to drawer in the books of drawer what is entry supplier to bills receivable if it is honored supplier will collect from customer i will not pass any entry if it is dishonored like banker he will give it to me i will give it to him when he gives it to me i will pass bills receivable account debit to supplier then i will give it back to my customer i will write draw e account debit to bills receivable will write with noting charges if he has paid noting charges i should reimburse him and collect from him If he has not paid, I will pay and I will charge him. Are you getting it? In the books of customer entries are same. It doesn't matter to him whether the bill is held till maturity, whether it is discounted with banker, whether it is endorsed. A and B. Come on, his entries will be same. It doesn't change his entries. Are you guys getting this? Hey, something. Baka. Fantastic people. This is the accounting entries that we should know in all the three cases. That is options available with drawer. Yes, Mr. Kush. Discounting charges also should be transferred to payable account in the books of drawer. Ah, uh, entry is not mandatory. 
ಬರಿಬೋದು ಇಫ್ ಯು ರೈಟ್ ದೇ ವೋಂಟ್ ಗಿವ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಡೋಂಟ್ ರೈಟ್ ದೇ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಕಟ್ ಮಾರ್ಕ್ಸ್ ಐ ಥಾಟ್ ಪುಶ್ ವಿಲ್ ಆಸ್ಕ್ ಸಮ್ ಕಾಂಪ್ಲೆಕ್ಸ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಓಕೆ ನೈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಅ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಐ ಕುಡ್ ಆನ್ಸರ್ ಯಾ ನೋ ನೋ ಐ ಥಾಟ್ ಐ ಕೀಪ್ ಮೈ ಥ್ರೂಟ್ ವೆಟ್ ಬೈ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಯು ಆಸ್ಕ್ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಯುವರ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಸೋ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಸ್ಕ್ ಪಿ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಓಕೆ ಕುಶ್ ಯಾ ಕ್ವೈಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ವಿ ಗೋ ಫಾರ್ವರ್ಡ್ guys don't make some noise it's not that please come on make some noise yes guys come on make some noise no not that please okay don't make noise maintain silence uh, this is as good as a prayer now settlement of the bill the bill has to be settled on the maturity date but i am like excited can i settle it before maturity date like before only like i don't want to wait till that date is there an option yes out of excitement if i have too much of money i can settle the bill before maturity date also that's what we call as retirement what is it called as and then i don't have the money on the maturity date ayo ayo can i ask for some extension that's what we call as renewal what is called as listen to me bill has to be settled on maturity date bill has to be settled on if you settle on maturity date no problem if you have money early can you settle it before maturity date yes settling the money before maturity date is called as retirement settling the money after the maturity date is called as renewal ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಮಲ್ಗಿರೋರ್ನ ಎಪ್ಸಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ಲೋರ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಗೋ ಆನ್ ಸ್ಲೀಪ್ ಗ್ರೀನ್ ರೂಮ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಸ್ಲೀಪ್ ಇಯರ್ ವೈ ವಿಲ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಅಫೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಯಾ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ಇಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಇಮ್ಯಾಜಿನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಫುಲ್ಲಿ ಎಕ್ಸೈಟೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಫುಲ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ರೈಟ್ ದ ಪರ್ಸನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಕ್ಯೂಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ he does that now how do you feel when they do it you are excited actually now you get start you know am i also the if he is feeling it so difficult so don't spoil the vibe at least okay please if you are very interested you can sit we are not chaining anyone to sit here and there is no one outside who's collecting money from you, you can go very freely it like that guy went no you can go in it yes he is scared to go because after he goes he is worried what will we talk about it nothing yeah settlement before maturity date is called as retirement what is it called listen to me carefully when i am supposed to pay the money in the month of january let's say i am supposed to pay on january 15th when am i supposed to pay december 15th only i got full full money i have lot of money i'll pay december 15th can i pay the person to whom i am paying is very happy the person to whom i am paying no is very happy why i am paying him before so what will you do you'll say you made me happy i will make you happy correct or not you paid me one month before ella joke ko nakta ro ella serious age elidu ko nakta ro joke helda matra nakre sa okay because you are paying one month before he will give you rebate or what we call as discount what do we call it as this discount is dependent upon the period now if you pay one month before he will give discount for one month. if you pay three months before he will give you bill amount multiplied by discount percentage multiplied by three months so earlier you pay more discount you get later you pay less discount you get are you getting this such a discount is income to the person who is paying it is expense to the person who is allowing let's say i am supposed to pay 1 lakh by 15th of january i am paying on 15th of december you allowed me 5000 rupees discount so my bills payable liability will reduce so bills payable liability reducing i will debit bills payable account by 1 lakh how much but cash that i'm giving is only 95000 i will credit kasu account by 95000 5000 what i didn't pay but is still disc- decreasing is my discount i'll write to discount received account income bills payable account debit 1 lakh to discount received account 5000 to cash account 95000 in his books kasu account debit 95000 at discount allowed account 5000 to bills receivable account are you getting this pakka this is if i'm settling the bill before maturity date what if i don't have the money on the maturity date i'll ask anna please anna anna anna, anna please anna one month time he says okay yes he says okay for that one month we sign a new bill for that one month we sign a in that new bill he will include the old bill value plus interest for that one month plus interest for that now that new bill can be for the entire amount plus interest or can be only for bill amount why 
he might say okay i'll give you one month extension but for that one month delay interest is you know that interest you should give now only okay i'll give interest now only if i've given that then we pay the interest right now new bill will be old bill value if i say sir please sir i don't have interest money also if you ask now then i'll become bad debt i'll become insolvent you check fully you'll write off as bad debt or you'll take interest you say okay fine he agrees interest also you'll pay later then the new bill value will include interest are you getting it and, and there are some cases where we don't keep the entire amount for renewal part of it is paid 20 percent 30 percent amount is paid balance amount is delayed then for only the balance amount that is there no we charge interest we don't charge interest for full amount interest will be charged for the amount that is delayed interest will be charged for the amount that is are you guys getting it Pakka. fantastic guys so this is retirement of the bill and renewal of the bill i hope you all understood yes or no then we have uh, one beautiful concept called bills for collection and even more beautiful concept called as accommodation of bill. shall we discuss both bills for collection bills for collection 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 we have a lot of example questions also small small extra question number five six seven about 10 12 extra questions are there in the middle no 12 in the just see yeah you guys can see it and then try later all the answers are also there ah hi i didn't tell start talking ah what is the uh, bills for collection see discounting of bill and bills sent for collection are different why are they different if it is discounting of bill i give the bill to bank bank should give money to me right now and bank will also cut some portion as discount and then give now what is bills for collection i give the bill to bank because i don't want to keep the bill with me if i keep the bill with me there is a possibility of losing the bill there is a possibility of losing the bill misplacing the bill bill getting torn bill getting stolen second thing if i keep the bill with me i should keep seeing the bills maturity date whenever it matures i should present and collect money i don't want to keep seeing the bill every day so to file to fight against two things one safekeeping two timely collection <laughs> Hey, anyone knows that guy who just left the class? Anyone, anyone in the class who knows that guy? Is a CA student? The guy who left saying washroom. CA student or not? Anyone knows him? No one knows him? You know him? I'm scared like mass people are there together. Mass assassination and they were to bomb it. Then... Okay, you don't need accounts marathon revision. If you wait one more day, law will be there, maths will be there. Why me? Please, no bomb, no. What was that noise then? Huh? Euro, bro. Okay, Shh. listen, listen. I am not giving the bill to bank expecting the money immediately from the bank. What am I doing? I am giving the bill to bank and then saying, see, if it is with me, I might lose it. And if it is with me, I might not remember which day to collect the money from. Which day to collect the? So, I will give it to you. You keep it with you. Urgent and illa. There is no urgent. You don't have to give me money to me right now. You keep it with you. The date on which the bill will mature, that day you collect the money. If you collect the money, you give it to me. If you don't collect money, no, give that bill back. This is bills for collection. Did you understand this? Now, when the bill is sent for bills for collection, when I collect it, it is with me, bills receivable. When I give it for collection entry is bills for collection to bills receivable. On the maturity date, if the banker collects the money, bank account debit to bills for collection. If the banker doesn't collect the money, bills receivable to bills for collection. Ulta. So, observe here, what is the entry? When we send the bill for collection, everyone read. What is the entry on the maturity date? Ha, if you observe closely, no. Here we have written bills for collection account, debit. Here we have written bills for collection account, credit. If these both get nullified, what is the entry? Bank account debit to bills receivable account. Did you get this? So, this bills for collection account is there, no. It is a dummy account. It is there only temporarily. Till the time we give the bill to bank, till the time it gets matured, this is there. Once the bill is matured, this dummy account is gone. Correct or not? Yes or no? 
Very good. However, if it is dishonored, then what do we do? This entry is there. No. You gave to bank. Bank will give it back to you. What is the entry that you pass when you give? Bills for collection debit to? When they give it back to you, bills receivable to bills for collection. Are you getting it? And you will pass it back to your drawing. Got that? Akka? Yes or no people? Very good. Then we have the last and very interesting concept, what we call as accommodation of bill. This is not a trade bill. This is not a... Sir, what is trade bill? I have sold goods to you. Stop it, please. I will give you break also. Please, listen. There is really funny chat here. I won't read. People will get offended. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Listen to me carefully, guys. Huh. I have sold goods to you. You should pay me money. So I raise a bill on you. You accept it. That bill, what is there between us? No. Trade bill. What is that bill? Between us, there is trade. Between us, there is for the trade, there is bill. It is trade bill. It is, however, if in case I have not sold goods to you, you have not sold goods to me, I want money, you also want money, I called you, hi Maga, how are you? You told Duddila Maga, then I said, hey, you also understood. Then both of us go to bank and then say, uncle, uncle, we want money. Banker will say, young bandri, ange, ange ogi. <laughs> Banker told you will not pay money. Then we understood. Bank gives loan only to the people who have money. Bank will not give loan to the people who doesn't have money. People who has money don't need loan. People who don't have money need loan. But banking system in the country, they don't give loan to the people who don't have money. Are you getting it? So then what do we do? We will also decide to act like we have too much money. How? I have 1 crore rupees money with me. How? I bought 1 crore inventory. Then I will say that I sold that 1 crore worth of goods to him. He will accept that he has purchased goods from me 1 crore. Then I will draw a bill on him. Really? No. Ah, just like that. On paper. I will draw a bill on him for 10 lakh rupees. He will accept that bill for 10 lakh. Are you getting it? He will give it back to me. Is there a trade between us? There is actually no trade. But did I draw a bill on him? Yes. Why? Scam. Scam 2023. I will draw a bill on him. He will accept it. I will take that bill to the banker. And then say, banker, I want money. Sir, what is the value of the bill? I'll say 10 lakh. Hey, sir, cook sir. Juice or coffee, not tea. Then he'll get tea. Special. And then after that, he'll take that 10 lakh rupees bill. He will take 10,000, 20,000 commission. He'll give me 9 lakh, 80,000 rupees. That 9 lakh, 80, we both will share. 50, 50. Sir, what about balance? 7, 9 lakh, 79,950. That 9 lakh, 80,000, we share it 50, 50 between us. Into 50 by 100, anta. 50, 50 rupees Allah. Once we divide it between us, we both of us have money. On the maturity date, banker will ask money from him. Then I will pay 50% of 10 lakh, 5 lakh to him. He will put 5 lakh from his pocket and then pay the banker. This is accommodation of bill. What is this? Accommodation of bill is not a trade bill. It is a financial arrangement between parties. Are you getting it? This becomes beautiful because on the maturity date, when the banker asks money from draw E or so called draw E, if he denies to pay, Banker will come back to me and ask me money. I should pay in turn. So I paid my 5 lakh. I paid his 5 lakh also. But I can't tell the bank, no, sir, that guy is cheater, sir, he was supposed to pay. I can't tell all that. I'll pay 10 lakh rupees. Are you getting it? Then he should pay me 5 lakh. So next time I'll draw a bill on him for 15 lakh. Discount it with the banker. We receive money from the bank. In that I'll give him half. I'll take half. I'll take 5 lakh also from him. And again on the maturity date, he fails to pay the money. Again, banker will go to him and then come back to me. Again, I draw one new bill on him. See, this kind of series will happen. Season 1, season 2, season 3. That is the reason it will become a little tricky. And remember, there is one ratio that we both agree now. 50-50. It need not be 50-50. It can be 1 is to 2. My idea. I will get 1 by 2. 1 by 3. You will take 2 by 3. Why? My idea. Are you getting it? So, we can share in 1 is to 2 ratio, 2 is to 3 ratio, 4 is to 5 ratio, hey, any ratio guys, we can share. If we decide upon one ratio, that is the ratio in which we share the discounted proceeds what we receive from bank, that is the ratio in which we should bear the discounting charges charged by the bank, that is the ratio in which we will share the maturity proceeds that we should pay to the bank. All the three should be shared in the same ratio. On the maturity, if the drawer fails to pay that his share to draw E, or if draw E pays to his pay his share to draw a banker, 
in either of the cases a new bill will be drawn that new bill can be old ratio or can be new ratio we've done questions where we continue to follow old ratio we've also done questions where it is new ratio there is no new journal entry in this accommodation same old journal entries bill drawn bill accepted bill discounted cash received cash given cash received these entries only are you getting this say something yeah please do see it with little bit of patience and you will be able to crack accommodation and mixed journals also will be able to do see it with little patience are you getting it one small tip from my side whenever you start with accommodation of bills don't straight away start with big questions do some small questions where you only need to do working out so in our material the question on accommodation starts from question number 14 alla 14 alla i think 16 or 16th one say it will start we have question number 16 question number 17 question number 18 and all is there correct ah? but what we did is there are only two three questions on accommodation that is only too much yes material is only bad book but in spite of that we did some extra questions what did we do we did extra question number 12 extra question number 13 extra question number 14 extra question number 15 and extra question number 16 in this what did we do we only did working note we only did to get complete understanding who's draw who's draw how much received how much paid how much discount who's charge who should pay everything and always accommodation please listen accommodation though the question is based on journal entries don't straight away start with journal entries always do a detailed working note total bill amount is how much how much belongs to r how much belongs to a how much is discounted proceeds received how much belongs to whom how much belongs to the other person how much is our discounting charges who should bear how much all of this first you should compute do all the computations first keep all the numbers that you need ready then you start with journal entries journal entries will become very easy like i told you in depreciation also first you should have everything that is required in hand then accounting will become easy if you don't keep everything in hand what's required then when you start counting no you should do accounting and counting accounting plus counting is irritating counting job you finish first then start with accounting it will become very very smooth simple and easy and in fact you will take lesser time and probability of you getting the correct answer will be more when you finish working note first and then start with the answer do you guys get this yes or no fantastic boys and girls by this i call it end of our topic of bills of exchange we will take a short break here i understand we've done this for quite long time this topic deserves so much of attention and time so that's the reason i gave this so good sent on return or approval consignment average rate, account current will not be discussed straight away we will go to the topic of final accounts then do partnership then do npo and finally do company accounts towards the end of the day so it is uh, 4 56 we can say 5 o'clock see you all at uh, 5 sorry 3 56 4 o'clock see you all at 4 10 can i expect all of you to be back at 4 10 i'll give another break around 6 o'clock i'll give another break around 6 o'clock don't take it long be back in 10 15 minutes uh, 4 10 i want you to be back in class don't take long don't take long 4 10 yes take a break come on guys we are done with chapter 6 let's now start with chapter 7 and our chapter 7 talks about final accounts final accounts of sole proprietor shall we get started with final accounts of sole proprietor very good so in order to prepare final accounts we would have to evaluate financial performance and financial position or to evaluate financial performance and to evaluate financial position we prepare final accounts to evaluate financial performance it is to determine profit to evaluate financial position is by preparation of balance sheet when we evaluate profit we prepare manufacturing trading p and l when we evaluate financial position we prepare balance sheet and cash flow statement you don't have cash flow statement in your syllabus you can skip this what time 10 minutes late get in set. close the door correctly And just sit wherever the place is available. Not comfortable. Next time.
ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ಮೇಲೆ ಟೆನ್ ಮಿನಿಟ್ಸ್ ಲೇಟ್ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಎಲ್ ಬೇಕು ಅಲ್ಲೇ ಕುತ್ಕೊಂಡ್ ಹತ್ತು ಜನ ಮೂವ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಕುತ್ಕೊಳ್ತಾರೆ ಅಣ್ಣ ಬಂದ ಮತ್ತೆ ನನಗ್ ಬೇರೆ ಕೆಲ್ಸ ಇಲ್ಲ ಬೈತ ಕುತ್ಕೊಳ್ಬೇಕು ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಏ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಬ್ರೇಕ್ ಮೆಸೆ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಐ ಕಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಐ ಲಾಕ್ ದ ಡೂ ಇಫ್ ಯುವರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಗ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಡ್ ದ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಸಾರಿ ಯಾ ಸೊ ಇನ್ ಆರ್ಡರ್ ಟು ಎವಾಲ್ಯೂಟ್ ಫೈನಾನ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಪರ್ಫಾರ್ಮೆನ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಟ್ರೇಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಎಲ್ ಇನ್ ಎನ್ ಆರ್ಡರ್ ಟು ಎವಾಲ್ಯೂಟ್ ಫೈನಾನ್ಷಿಯಲ್ ಪೋರ್ಷನ್ ವಿ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೀಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾಶ್ ಫ್ಲೋ ವಿ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಕ್ಯಾಶ್ ಫ್ಲೋ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸಿ ಎ ಫೌಂಡೇಶನ್ ಸಿಲೆಬಸ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿಲ್ ಪಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಎಲ್ ಅಪ್ರಾಪರೇಷನ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಇನ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸಿ ಎ ಫೌಂಡೇಶನ್ ಫೈನಲ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ಸ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ವಿ ಲರ್ನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ನರ್ಶಿಪ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ನಾನ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಪೇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅವರ್ ಐ ಸಿ ಎ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಮಾಡ್ಯೂಲ್ ದೇ ವಿ ಡಿವೈಡ್ ದ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟು ಟೂ ಮಾಡ್ಯೂಲ್ಸ್ ಯೂನಿಟ್ ಒನ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾನ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಯೂನಿಟ್ ಟೂ ಇಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಐ ಸಿ ಇಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಎಸ್ ಒನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಅನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ವೆದರ್ ಇಟ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ಡ್ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಆರ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಯು ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ದ ಪ್ರಾಡಕ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಸೆಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಲಾಕ್ ದಡ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಆರ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ನಾವ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಸೆಲ್ ಎ ಪ್ರಾಡಕ್ಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬೈ ದ ಪ್ರಾಡಕ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸೆಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಆರ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ದಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಡಕ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸೆಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಇದರ್ ವೇಸ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಬಟ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅನ್ ಆಪ್ಷನ್ ವೆದರ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಅ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ಎ ಲೆಟ್ಸ್ ಎ ಸೆಲ್ ವಾಚಸ್ ಐ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬೈ ದ ರಾ ಮೆಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ಐ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬೈ ಸ್ಟ್ರಾಪ್ ಸಪರೇಟ್ಲಿ ಐ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬೈ ದ ಮೆಕ್ಯಾನಿಸಮ್ ಐ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಮೇಕ್ ದ ಮೆಕ್ಯಾನಿಸಮ್ ಇನ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಅಸೆಂಬಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ವಾಚ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಸೆಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಎ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ಕಮ್ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ದೆನ್ ಆರ್ ಐ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬೈ ವಾಚ್ ಸೆಲ್ ವಾಚ್ ಬೈ ವಾಚ್ ಸೆಲ್ ವಾಚ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಬೋಟ್ ಐ ಮೆ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ದೇ ಡೂ ದೇವ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ಹೌಸ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ನೌ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ಕಮ್ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಆರ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಎ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಟ್ರೇಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಪಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಎಲ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಬ್ಯಾಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೀಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಟ್ರೇಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಪಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಎಲ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಬ್ಯಾಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಶೀಟ್ ಐ ಯು ಗೆಟಿಂಗ್ ದ ಡಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಇಯರ್ ಬಿಟ್ವೀನ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ಕಮ್ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಆರ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಯು ಗೆಟ್ ಇಟ್ ನೌ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರರ್ ಯು ಬೈ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಡೋಂಟ್ ಬೈ ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ಯು ಬೈ ರಾ ಮೆಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ಕನ್ವರ್ಟ್ ರಾ ಮೆಟೀರಿಯಲ್ ಟು ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಸೆಲ್ ಹವ್ ಎವರ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಯು ಬೈ ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ಯು ಸೆಲ್ ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ಡು ಯು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದ ಡಿಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಬಿಟ್ವೀನ್ ದೆಮ್ ನೌ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಸೊ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರರ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟ್ರೇಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಎ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ಯು ಸ್ಟ್ರೇಟ್ ಅವೇ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಟ್ರೇಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಕೌಂಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎ ಟ್ರೇಡರ್ ದೇ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಪರ್ಚೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ದೇ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಪರ್ಚೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರರ್ ದೇ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ನೋ ಪರ್ಚೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ಫಿನಿಶ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಮ್ಯಾನುಫ್ಯಾಕ್ಚರ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಡ್ ದ ಹೌಸ್ ಸೊ ಯು ಡೋಂಟ್ ಬೈ
from from factory we only manufacture the finished goods which are sent to showroom so in the manufacturing account the balance in figure that we find on the credit side is the cost of finished goods manufactured what will it be that's the objective manufacturing account quick recap opening wip debit closing wip credit consumption of raw material how do you find consumption opening plus close opening plus purchase minus closing of raw material and then we'll write any expenses incurred sale of scrap on the credit we find the cost of production and this will replace purchases in trading account in trading we usually write no opening plus purchase direct expense closing sales gp their purchases will not come why you are manufacturing you are not purchasing in the place of purchase of finished goods we'll write goods manufactured from manufacturing account understood this say something so three variants of inventory raw material work in progress finished goods where will you write raw material manufacturing account where will you write work in progress manufacturing account finished goods will be transferred from manufacturing to trading from manufacturing and opening and closing stock of finished goods will come in trading account did you understand this so any expenditure which relates to factory should come in manufacturing account should come in understood any expenditure relating to warehouse will come in trading account any expenditure relating to office showroom will come in pnl yes or no very good have a look at our manufacturing account i told this to you just now how do we find consumption opening plus purchase minus where will raw material and work in progress appear where will it appear manufacturing account where will you write finished goods transferred from manufacturing to understood then come on quickly have a look at this these expenses manufacturing electricity water lighting heating carriage of raw material repairs to machinery depreciation factory rent all of this will come in manufacturing account scrap will be decreasing the cost of production it will be there in manufacturing credit side quickly have a look at manufacturing account debit side opening wip consumption of raw material manufacturing expenses credit side sale of scrap and closing wip if you do this you will find trading account as balance in figure this is the cost of finished goods manufactured and transferred from manufacturing account to trading account everyone's clear pakka say something great guys so then we have some questions on manufacturing this is actually from unit 2 of our study material but i do unit 2 first and then go to unit 3 because for us it's the same i told you no i don't see this as two different units in the chapter for me manufacturing account is one account extra in a normal concern then we went on to understand the questions relating to trading account so trading account what is the objective of trading account determining gross profit what is the objective of manufacturing account determining the cost of production you get this here when we try to find the profit we write opening stock purchases direct expenses sales closing stock gp will be balance in figure if it is manufacturing we don't write purchase in the place of purchase we write to manufacturing account am i right yes or no in the trading account what appears is only and only finished goods we will not write raw material we will not write work in progress in trading account what is the inventory opening closing purchase sale everything in manufacturing in the trading account only finished goods only very good when we say direct expenses here expenses relating to be say relating to purchase of goods relating to other than sales will be written in manufacturing account there are some questions where you would have questions like uh, wages or questions like uh, man relating to manufacturing like something like uh, heating or lighting or factory rent is also there in some questions and it's question not on manufacturing concern it's non manufacturing concern based questions unit 1 of your chapter but still you'll write in trading shouldn't it go to manufacturing account have you seen questions it is not manufacturing account there is no raw material there is no work in progress there is only finished goods but still they mention factory rent in the question still they mention carriage in what still they mention what is say machinery depreciation what do we do in that case should we write in trading pnl or manufacturing actually manufacturing but manufacturing is not there where do we write there why the reason is very simple sometimes you don't manufacture it you don't manufacture it but still it looks like manufacture for example what you do is you buy these bottles you buy this bottles it is milton bottle let's say assume this to be milton bottle but even after you buy this milton bottle on this you do nice branding you make it when something like you are uh, some anime theme you create create one very nice anime theme picture on this and then sell or you put one kgf nice image on this and then sell or you put one nice cricketer image on this and then sell are you getting it so when you put that you are not manufacturing with that with it or without that sticker this is still flask it does the same job with that flask it will not do something extra but it look cool that whatever you doing is not manufacturing but you can't do it in the showroom no 
you want one factory space so it is like factory but are you a manufacturer no you are a trader you are a trader but you are going to do small improvisation in the product you're doing small improvisation in the product for that you open one factory for that you open one uh, such factory will be written in trading or let's say you buy it in wholesale you sell it in retail you buy it in wholesale and then you sell it in retail from large quantity what you buy to sell it in small quantity you need to cut it into smaller quantities and then pack you can't do that in your showroom so you have one small warehouse or what you call as factory where you cut it and then pack it into smaller pieces are you manufacturing it you are actually not manufacturing so that is called as factory but it will be written in trading account because we don't prepare manufacturing account in that question clear say something very good that's how we prepare our trading account and in our trading account if in case in the trial balance they have given cost of goods sold or adjusted purchase they have given cost of goods sold or adjusted purchase yesterday we discussed it when we were discussing trial balance then don't write opening stock don't write purchase less returns don't write direct expenses don't write closing stock sorry no no don't write closing stock straight away write cost of goods sold straight away write cost of goods sold on the debit side sales on the credit side difference is profit straight away one shot are you getting it however if they give opening stock purchase direct expense closing stock separate items write them separately if the trial balance comprise of the word cost of goods sold then don't try to find opening stock purchase separately straight away write cogs on the debit sales on the credit determine your gross profit as difference between them got it come on guys make some noise ah uh, make some noise uh antale maadbaru yes adhe maadbarudu ah see this factory lighting coal gas and water factory rent import duty all of these are manufacturing expenses but we are not a manufacturing concern so we write this in trading account though they are manufacturing expenses understood yes or no yes, fantastic and after that pnl why do we prepare profit and loss account the objective of preparation of profit and loss account is to determine net profit and the feeder to pnl account is trading account which will give gross profit from our trading account we take gp we write all the indirect expenses and all the indirect incomes to determine our profit this is our p and l are you getting it in p and l account whenever we write items very very important thing to be noted we need to write the items on accrual basis what basis meaning it doesn't matter whether the expense is paid or not if it is incurred we need to write it it doesn't matter whether it income is are received or not if it is earned it should be recorded so pre paid pre received outstanding accrued adjustments will come this you need to be little cautious and another thing what you need to be cautious when you discuss about p and l account is our managerial remuneration what is it okay there is a detailed video on this on youtube you can watch it if you have time of 20 25 minutes i will finish it in 1 minute very simple manager can be given remuneration lump sum or percentage basis if you give him lump sum 10000 20000 write it in pnl account debit side expense no problem you also like it i also like it easy however if you give the remuneration to manager as a percentage of profit if you give it as a percentage of profit you need to decide whether that percentage of profit what you are giving is before charging such commission or is it after charging such commission because whenever you say profit it is income minus all the expenses am i right manager remuneration is also expense manager remuneration is also when you say manager remuneration is a percentage of profit profit is after deducting all the expenses expenses should include manager remuneration so after deducting manager remuneration what we get is profit on that profit we should give him remuneration chalaidalva we should give all the expenses and then we'll get profit on that profit we should give him percentage if that profit changes is remuneration will change if is remuneration changes profit changes so what do we do the question should mention clearly whether it is before charging or after charging if they say before charging such commission if they say before charging such commission very easy we are assuming all the expenses are paid except commission take all the expenses take all the incomes find net profit assuming as if there is no remuneration to manager you get some profit on that you put this percentage that is manager's commission or remuneration easy so net profit into x by 100 if it is x percent what do we do net profit into x by this is what we do whenever it is before charging basis oh no no playing games sir is playing game continuously if it tap like this for 10 times you are playing flappy bird keep the phone inside i don't know what to say yeah however 
However, if this entire process is after charging basis, meaning if the question says that you should charge commission also after that what you get profit, on that we should have given him some percentage. Then what do we do? We will assume that it is x by 100 plus x formula. You get that? So, I do not want to explain the formula logic in detail. All you have to do is, if it is before charging basis, then take profit into x by 100. If it is after charging basis, then you take profit into x by 100 plus x. Why is it done? How is it done? In detail logic, YouTube video is there. Managerial repression, if you search, you will get it. But uh, this is more than sufficient. And this is a topic that you should do because this will not just be asked in final accounts. This can be asked in partnership also. Got it? By doing this adjustment, hopefully you will be done with our uh, PNL based questions. This is one again important uh, tricky adjustment which was asked in CPT exam long, long ago. CA Foundation till date they have not asked her, but uh, be a little clear if you will be able to solve this. This is a question where sales manager and general manager is there. Sales manager is entitled to 10% of profit after charging general manager's remuneration and general manager is entitled to 15% of profit after paying sales manager's remuneration. This guy will tell first only quote PD, only quote tag will have zero profit and none equity. Only then first no only quote PD, only quote tag will have zero none equity. Whom do we give? We should give both of them without disappointing both of them, and we should fulfill this condition. This can be solved using either our uh, equation method or our uh, ding 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 method. Both the methods are there. You can learn whichever one you want. Just search on YouTube for managerial remuneration. You will get it. It's there. If you don't get it, ping me. I'll share it with you. You get that? I won't spend much time on that. Very easy part. 15-20 minutes investment, you will be able to crack it. Let me go a little forward on to our final accounts, uh, balance sheet. Sorry, PNL upper operation, we learn it in uh, partnership. Usually in a regular class, I will teach you PNL upper operation in final accounts of sole proprietor as well as in partnership, both the places. We will read it once here and then repeat it there. Now marathon revision, it's already 4.30. We have time only till 8 o'clock. So we don't have too much time to repeat things. I will teach PNL upper operation in uh, partnership. For now, we'll go slightly forward into balance sheet. Balance sheet is the place where we write all the assets and liabilities and also capital to ensure that the profit what we've arrived at, if it is added to capital along with liabilities, will be equal to assets. The order in which we read we write the items in the balance sheet is called as marshalling. What is it called as? There is multiple ways of writing the orders, uh, items in the balance sheet. One of them is called order of permanence, other one is called order of liquidity. What we follow is order of permanence. Order of liquidity is also followed in banking companies, which was there in CA Inter. Now, anymore, it won't be there. And when we write all of the items in balance sheet, usually it should be written as fixed items first, current items later. However, in your examination, they are not that strict. Even if you write current items first and then fixed items, you will be still given full marks. So, don't worry. You don't have to be worried. Your balance sheet may first item can be cash. So get up, change the place. Yes. Please change your place, that's it. I don't want to sit there and talk. Please change your place. Please change your place. I'm talking to you politely. Please change your place. Sit wherever you are, but not there. Yeah. So, fixed items first and then current items later is what we should write. But however, even if you start with cash account, it's not a problem. You'll be still given full marks. You'll be still given. Are you getting this? Very good. And uh, for a company, we might prepare the answer under uh, vertical format. But for a sole proprietorship or partnership, you have to do it under horizontal system. Get that? Cool. So the balance sheet format is here. You don't have to learn balance sheet format for this one. And I've taught you when to call it current, when to call it non-current, when we discussed uh, the initial concepts long, long ago on Wednesday. Correct? Huh? Yeah. So whenever you're following or doing any questions on final accounts, please follow double entry system. What should we follow? Don't feel like finishing trading account first, finding GP, then opening PNL account, then closing, identifying net profit, then starting balance sheet. Don't do this. Keep trading PNL balance sheet all three open. Read the item. It belongs to balance sheet, write in balance sheet. It belongs to trading, write in trading. Keep all the three open. So that's what we call by double entry system. Read the question in the order. Write the answer, however it is to be written. What you people do is you want to write the answer in the order and you read question, solve 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 you do it. When you read bits and pieces of questions from everywhere, no, you might have to end. You might have to end up reading the question more than once, which will automatically decrease your writing time. So what you should do is you should read the question only once and write the answer. You should keep more time to write and less time to read. In order to do that, you should be able to read the question from the top to the end in the same order what they have given. If you read this much, you should know where does that go. 
you shouldn't be like okay i want opening stock then i want closing stock then i'll come here for purchase i'll see purchase return here i'll see sales here i'll see sales return here that's not what you should do go on reading them in the order after opening stock they have given purchase you right they have given rent right in pnl they have given building right in balance sheet they have given machinery right in balance sheet then they have given purchase return then deduct it there so till the time you finish reading the question your purchase your sorry your trading account your pnl account your balance sheet everything is open ready for any changes even in the last line of the question if they give an adjustment for trading you will be able to accommodate it if in case you want to close trading account first should read the entire question to identify what and all items are there which will affect trading that will make you read 3 4 times are you getting it which will decrease your probability of getting the answer right so read the question in the order and then go on solving it that's a very important tip that you should keep in mind for your uh, trading pnl and final account based questions so lot of practice is required in final accounts and uh, when you say lot of practice don't solve 100 questions you have to solve 3 4 questions but completely what you people do is half half questions you will solve 10 of them you should solve one question from the beginning till the end to understand how it flows throughout don't solve 10 half questions do five full questions when you practicing that will give you good hold in final accounts and one more thing that you should note here is sundry debtors and fact sundry debtors and remember that debtors is an asset bad debt is an expense provision is a liability debtors is an asset bad debt is an expense data uh, provision is a debtors will go to balance sheet asset side bad debt should go to expense pnl and provision should appear in the balance sheet liability side where should provision appear sir but it is deducted from debtors no for time being remember where should we write provision balance sheet liability side clear till here now come on let's quickly go ahead and then understand what is a journal entry for bad debt bad debt is expense bad debt account should be debited bad debt is expense bad debt account should be and because of bad debts debtors will decrease debtors account will be credited so the journal entry is bad debt account debit to debtors what is the journal entry for bad debts bad debt account debit to because it is expense it will be transferred to pnl it will be transferred to what is the entry when you transfer bad debts to pnl pnl account debit to bad debts observe the entry bad debts to debtors and pnl to bad debts bad debts to debtors and pnl to ultimately your bad debts bad debts will get nullified your pnl is debited for sundry debtors you know why is this happening when you initially recorded sales you would have booked profit and you would have not received money and you would have returned to debtors now that guy says that you won't pay money your debtors will decrease and previously what sale you would have recorded against that sale you recorded profit which is wrong you cannot now debit sales so you'll debit pnl account to the place where gp has gone right did you understand the reason why we write bad debts first and then later transfer to pnl ultimately if there is bad debts what is happening initially the sale that you made against that you are not going to receive any money so you didn't make sale you gave away goods free but you recorded sales you have booked profit that profit has gone to pnl you need to remove that profit from pnl so we debit pnl and then credit our debtors debtors credit because debtors is decreased do you get this now you have this questions where uh, sir bad debt is available in trial balance what do we do bad debt is available in adjustment what do we do very simple if the bad debt is available in trial balance it will always be debit balance you know why they have passed this journal entry bad debts to sundry debtors and in our bad debts ledger debit side we write two sundry debtors that's it credit side we write by balance carried down and then write it to our trial balance understood this so debtors uh, sorry we are from debtors if they have already deducted bad debts and this journal entry number 1 bad debts to sundry debtors if it is already passed then bad debts will appear in trial balance if the bad debts appear in adjustment you know what does it mean this journal entry is not passed journal entry is not passed so we need to pass entry number 1 and we also need to pass entry number 2 entry number 1 when i pass i'll write bad debts to sundry debtors so i'll deduct bad debts from debtors entry number 2 pnl to bad debts when i pass i'll write bad debts in pnl account debit side so basically i will pass both the journal entries understood this Say something. However, if bad debt is appearing in trial balance, already P and L, sorry, already bad debt to sundry debtor entry is passed. Should I again deduct it from debtors? No need because it's already deducted. I should only post it to P and L account. I should only post it to for which I'll write the journal entry P and L account debit to bad debts. Did you understand? So a quick recap. If bad debt is appearing in trial balance, meaning already the journal entry for deducting it from debtors is already passed, you only have to transfer it to P and L. however if bad debt is appearing in adjustment meaning journal entry for deducting bad debts from debtors is not passed 
we have to first pass the journal entry to deduct it from tetars then pass the entry to transfer it to PNL. got it have a look at this quickly what have i made you right here bad debts to debtors is the entry if this is the entry what does it mean this entry is passed and what should we do we should only pass this entry transfer to PNL. if bad debt is appearing in adjustment what does it mean? first entry second entry both the entries should be passed got it I have given summary also. If bad debts appear in trial balance, what do we do? Read it, read it. Already deducted from. So, no need to deduct. What should we do? Only transfer to PNL. One moment. What do we mean if uh, bad debt is appearing in adjustment? We have to deduct from debtors as well as transfer it to PNL. Yes. Very good. I'll tell. So, he's saying what if bad debts? Discount, provision for bad debts, provision for discount, all four are there. Is this your question? Okay. Bad debts and discount are actual. Provision for discount and provision for bad debts are expected. Bad debts and discount are actual. Provision for discount and provision for bad debts are expected. First to deduct actual items. Because actual items, when you give discount, when there is bad debt, debtors will decrease. If it is already there in trial balance, discount allowed is there in trial balance debit side. Bad debt is there in trial balance debit side. It means already it is deducted from debtors. Debtors that is there in the trial balance is after deducting. You don't have to deduct separately. Transfer that bad debts and discount to PNL account debit side only. However, if they have given that bad debts and discount allowed in the adjustment, that means it is not deducted from debtors. Debtors in the trial balance is before deduction. Deduct that bad debts from debtors. Deduct that discount from debtors. And also write the discount and bad debts to PNL. Done. Now, after adjusting this, if required, we have debtors. No, after deducting discount and bad debts. On this debtors, we need to apply provision for bad debts first. Why? From the total debtors, when we eliminate good debtors, sorry, when we eliminate bad debtors, what is remaining is good. In this good, we are expecting some people to be bad. That is provision for bad debts. You eliminate percentage of provision. You get this? If this provision for bad debt is already given in trial balance, this means this provision is already created. You don't have to deduct from debtors. You don't have to write it to PNL. Such provision is balance sheet liability. Such provision is balance sheet. Same, if provision for discount is given in the adjustment, such percentage has to be put on debtors after deducting provision for bad debts from debtors, not before. De bad debts, first deduction, discount, second deduction. After that, debtors is there. On that, we deduct provision for bad debts. After that deduction, what amount comes? On that, we put the percentage of provision for discount. However, if provision for discount is already given in trial balance, then don't compute it as a percentage on debtors. It will be balance sheet liability. Clear? If that's it, the question has no other adjustment. Those what items I told as liability, they are actually liability. Provision items are liability. Debtors is asset. As a matter of presentation, we shift them from liability side to asset side and deduct it from the asset. Only as a matter of presentation. Is there a journal entry? No, there isn't. Understood? However, if that provision, what is there in the trial balance, that is there. In the adjustment, they have again given provision for discount and they have also given provision for bad debts. Then what do we do? <coughs> you might have done this beautiful adjustment in your PU. Debtors, add old provision, less new provision. Don't do all that. Provision is a liability. If provision is there in trial balance, it will be credit. Meaning this provision is already created. What have they done? Keep it like that only. Don't change. Now, on the debtors, apply that percentage to compute the provision to be maintained. Let us say, debtors is 1 lakh. What is debtors value? Provision should be maintained at 12%. Provision should be maintained at? In the trial balance, already provision is there to the extent of 10,000. Now, 1 lakh may let. 12% is how much? 12,000 is the extent to which we should maintain provision. We should maintain provision to the extent of 1 lakh is the address. On that, I will put 12%. I have got 12,000. But provision is already there to the extent of 10,000. 10,000 provision is already there. 12,000 is the provision to be maintained. I should create only 2,000 provision. I should create only in my PL account debit side. I will write provision 2,000 because provision is getting created to the extent of 2,000. I will write in my PL account debit side provision created 2000. 12000 is a provision to be maintained. 10000 is a provision already there old. 12000 minus 10000. 2000 is a provision to be created. 
टू थाउजेंड इज अ प्रोविजन टू बी एवरी वन अंडरस्टूड दिस पक्का अल्टरनेटिवली डेट आर्स वन लैक प्रोविजन इन ट्रायल बैलेंस टेन थाउजेंड एंड इन द क्वेश्चन दिस ए प्रोविजन टू बी मेंटेन एट नाइन परसेंट हो मच इस प्रोविजन टू बी मेंटेन ऑन वन लैक नाइन परसेंट इस हो मच प्रोविजन शुड बी मेंटेन एट वाटर मार्क ऑलरेडी यू मेंटेन टेन थाउजेंड प्रोविजन सो वन थाउजेंड प्रोविजन इस नो लॉन्गर रिक्वायर्ड वन थाउजेंड प्रोविजन इस व्हेन वन थाउजेंड प्रोविजन इस नो लॉन्गर रिक्वायर्ड व्हाट डू यू डू यू रिवर्स द प्रोविजन व्हाट डू यू डू व्हेन यू हैव टू रिवर्स द प्रोविजन क्रिएटिंग प्रोविजन इस एक्सपेंस रिवर्सिंग द प्रोविजन इस इनकम इट विल गो टू पीएनएल अकाउंट क्रेडिट साइड एस इनकम अंडरस्टूड दिस और टाइप्स इन स्टूडेंट्स टू इस प्रोविजन इस देयर टू द एक्सटेंट ऑफ टेन थाउजेंड डेट टार्स इस वन लैक प्रोविजन शुड बी मेंटेन एट ट्वेल्व परसेंट व्हाट इस डू दे राइट ऑफ एंटायर ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड प्रेस्टली Additionally, two thousand you create, and don't adjust your bad debts against provision. Bad debts you transfer to PNL provision. Let it be provision. If in case you adjust your bad debts against provision, provision will reduce. Again, provision has to be maintained at certain percentage. Again, you create provision. Why? 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 Why do we do it? Provision for repairs and provision for bad debt treatment is different. Don't do this for debtors. When there is bad debts, where do you charge bad debts? Don't charge it to provision. Charge it to PNL state. Provision you maintain provision at the percentage that they ask you to maintain. Understood this? Pakka? Yes, Kush. So, but we have to. We also have to read up the provision on deposit debts in data. Ah, correct. If it is there in trial balance, it will appear in balance sheet liability as a matter of presentation. We deduct it from that. If it is there in trial balance, it will appear as credit side, which is liability. You would have to deduct from data as a matter of presentation. See, it doesn't matter whether it is there in trial balance or Adjustment, it will be liability only, not then. Creating the provision will become expense. Writing of the provision will become income. Got it? Pakka kosh. Yes. And last and important point, this is on bad debts record. What is this? Remember, bad debt when it is recovered, it will not affect debtors. It will not affect the bad debts. It will not affect debtors. It will not affect bad debts. Journal entry for bad debts recovered is. Cash account debit to bad debts recovered. What is the entry? To bad debts recovered, and that bad debts recovered will be posted to PNL account for which we write the entry. Bad debts recovered account debit to PNL account. Understood? Yes. This is one thing that I wanted to know. See this. What is the journal entry for recovery of bad debts? Cash account debit to. Then bad debts recovered account debit to. Pakka. Say something. Fantastic. So on these several examples are there. See, half of our notes is questions that is there in our material. Other half of the material is questions that we did in the class. Small small example questions on small small concepts. On this day, sundry debtors and family all by itself, uh, we have about uh, good uh, seven eight cases. We have we written about three four pages in detail. It's there. All small small questions with one adjustment extra in each question for you to understand. You can glance through this again on this sundry debtors and family. This is a video about twenty minutes entire case. From the regular class only, I've cut that part opening and ending, and then I put so that if in case you find any difficulty at any point of time, you can quickly watch it. Yeah, and whatever I'm telling, I'll share. If you want it, at the end you drop one message in the Telegram group, I will share it. Yeah, yes. I heard someone talking. Okay, on end, Madhur, other day, Madhur, the message. Ah, they no join. I will come. Someone was talking in the break. I heard. Yeah, on end, Madhur, other day, Madhur, other message. Because I can't reply to you at hundred places, no. So I'm bringing hundred people to one place. You get what I'm trying to tell. I will not post a cat picture and then say cute cat, please like. I won't do that. I will share what you people ask for. You want it, you take it. You don't don't take it. No problem. I will not go into force feed you people. You should do data on family. You should do data on provision for you. You should do. don't do. Don't want to do. Don't do. Right in June. Left to you. Or December. Whenever you want to write. No force. No one is going to pull you to exam. Yeah, work, 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 very easy. Whenever you write, all the best. Okay, so trading P and L and balance sheet based questions. Several questions are there. Simple ones. Bacha wa abu tidra. This time only trading P and L and balance sheet. Next time we have CEO foundation. Na single entry incomplete records will come. Same trading P and L balance sheet with extra five six ledgers will come in each question. What you did now? No, ah plus twenty percent time extra for uh, just these kind of problems. This is chapter from CA inter. 
which is getting shifted to CA. Foundation. Ah, incomplete records. Nice, no? You will be the first set of people who didn't read it in foundation, who won't read it in inter. People writing inter now, actually, Papa foundation syllabus full correct. Ah, sorry, sorry. They also are same category. You are the second set of people who's going to miss it. Yeah. Ashta, any specific parts of doubt that you have in this topic which you want me to touch on? Final accounts? Anything specific? If in case at a later date you come across something specific also, please feel free, drop a message. The reason is, we are still in November. We have time till end of December. There is good 45 days spending time. If in case I get time in between, if you have told me very precisely this topic, this part, you know, I might try to help you. I will make a small PDF out of the same and then share or small video on that and then share. I can do. I am not promising I will do. But you should be clear, specific topic. You cannot say partnership on what is it? What partnership? Such big chapter. Are you guys getting it? Done. Shall we now quickly go to the next unit? Sorry, next chapter. We'll finish partnership and then do NPO. Yes or no? Come on, guys. Let's do partnership. Introduction to partnership. Shall we? Hey, why, why, why do you people talk? What, sir? Major Agoita. June. Okay, sorry. Fine. God bless. Anybody else who wants to go? Where did washroom guy go? Hospital can phone other. Politeness not there, sir. I will go care the in Madhya Mane Bandangi, a top tartar, a wood already in the touch. My goodness, where did your friend go? Don't know. You gave the bag, then where was he? Ava clearly, then, 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 here only. What was he doing? Just like that, chill. Writing exam in December. Hey, don't laugh. Joke. No, serious. Some serious problem it seems. Come on. Let's go. Shall we start with partnership? Can I have your attention? Come on, guys. Let's start with partnership accounting. So when you say partnership accounting, as per uh, this, we'll skip. today. There are several units in this chapter. One of the lengthiest chapter in our syllabus. Going to become even more lengthy in the new scheme. We have, we have introduction to partnership unit one. Second unit will be on admission. Actually, they should have given in between one more unit called goodwill. But entire goodwill they put in admission topic because of which admission will become lengthy. But goodwill can be given as a separate unit. But they haven't. Uh, 8.2 is admission. 8.3 is retirement. Then we have death of partner. This is where it ends. But I think JLP they could have given as a separate unit and uh, Goodwill they could have given it as a separate unit, but they have. In the new scheme of education, you have 8.5 coming in. Dissolution of partnership. Easy, sir. And then it will tally. It is not so simple. That is realization approach. What did you do there? You don't have just that. You have something called piecemeal distribution, which is more interesting. And that dissolution of partnership is coming from CA Inter to CA Foundation. Lucky duck, sir, you won't read in foundation because you're in old scheme. You won't read in Inter because you're in new scheme. <coughs> Come on. Let's quickly see what is partnership. Shh. Partnership is an association of two or more persons who come together for the purpose of business. To share the profits and losses carried on by all or one of them acting for all. Like that. Okay. Partnership. It is an association of two or more persons. Usually two. But there can be more. Minimum two. One person cannot say I have partnership with myself. I am my own partner. No. You can't tell them. You can't tell them. And coming together for the purpose of business. Business is very important. If there is no world business then marriage would have become a partnership. My God. To share profits or losses arising from activities carried on by all or one of them acting for understood. Now, let's focus on the word more persons. What do you mean by more persons? What is the limit on more? Yeah. Huh? 50. 
it is different as per act and it is different as per rules as per companies act limit on maximum number of partners is uh, dealt by section 464 you remember section 11 in old act uh, in the new act it is section 464 says that the limit is how much 100 464 ella century agogutte so as per the limit given under companies act uh, yeah you remember that guy 464 there's a story why i tell that it is limit is how much 100 however as per company rules limit is only 50 so you should have more than uh, 50 or less than 50 if you have more than 50 you are complied with act but not with rules if you have less than 50 you complied with act as well as rules. whom should you comply with both so you should have maximum of how many partners 50 but why does companies act tell how many people should be there in partnership because Companies Act Section 464 talks about illegal association. If you have more than 50 people in any form of business organization but don't register it as company, then it will become illegal association. What will it become? Yeah. Very good. Then let's talk about uh, per the purpose of business. Business can be carried on by all or one of them acting for all. But uh, this profits or losses, what is arising from the business, what they are sharing, no? It need not be always the same. There can be cases where you can appoint a person only for profit. Meaning if you make profit, he is there. We will share. If you make loss, sorry bro, I am not here to share loss. I am here to only share profit. So there can be basically partner in the case of profit only. Example is minor joined for the benefits of the firm. Are you getting it? Very good. So the next thing is a partner can be joined into the firm for the case of profits only with the minimum guarantee. With the I will discuss that minimum guarantee term little later. Activities can be carried on by all of them or one of them can be acting for all. So it need not be like everyone should do everything. One guy can do one work and the other guy can say I am not good at this, I will do the other work. Meaning one of them can be sleeping partner, but say dormant partner. This is the term or the provision that is allowed in the act. Let's quickly see is the term partner, partnership and partnership firm same? No. Individually they are called as partners. Individually they are called as but the name under which they do business is called as partnership firm. The relationship that they carry between them is called as partnership. What is it? Individually they are partners. The relationship between them is partnership. The name under which they do business is partnership firm. Got it? Then let's quickly see what is the constitution of partnership firm. Company's constitution is its AOA, MOA. Partnership firm's constitution is its partnership deed. What is it? Is it mandatory to have partnership deed? No, there is no need to have partnership deed. If you want, you can have. If you don't want, you need not have. And even when you have partnership deed, is it mandatory that you have it in writing? No. If you want, you can have it oral. Or if you want, you can have it in writing. Left to you. Yes or no? Observe. Partnership deed can be oral or can be written. And is the partnership registration mandatory? Again, not mandatory. You can have your partnership form registered or you can have an unregistered partnership form. But if you want to register your partnership form, then you should have partnership deed. You cannot have an oral partnership deed getting registered. In order to get it registered, when you go to registrar form, registrar of forms, you should have a partnership deed in writing. What is the consequence of not having the partnership form registered? An unregistered partnership firm cannot file a case on outsiders, but an outsiders can file a case on them. Sir, why is it so? If you want to file a case on someone, you should exist. No, you have not registered as a partnership. Then who are you? You are ghost in the thin air. You should have some existence. What is existence? You should be partnership form. What is the proof that you are partnership form? Illa sir, now Ratri Matar. New Ratri Matar partnership pagala. You should get it registered. Only then you exist as a person. You would, if you yourself don't exist, how can somebody cheat you? Are you getting it? So, if you are an unregistered partnership form, you cannot file a case on outsiders, but others can file a case on you. You are allowed to file a case on outsiders if the amount incur, amount involved in that case was less than 100. This was done initially in 1932 to give benefit to such people who are small business people who cannot afford to register the partnership firm but still fast at the firm. So they are small people, amount of business is less than 100 so they are allowed to file a case even though they have not registered. Over a period of time they don't want to appreciate people having unregistered business in the country so they didn't change the limit. So even to today's date it's remained as 100 rupees only. So what is the consequence? Outsiders can sue the firm, but the firm can sue or cannot sue outsiders for an amount exceeding. Done. What are the contents of partnership deed? Name of the business, name of the partners, address of the business, address of the partners, nature of the business, when can they admit partner, when can the partner retire, when can a partner die, what to do in the case of death of a partner, 
how to share profits how much capital should any every one of them bring is any partner entitled to salary how much interest on capital how much interest on drawings how to treat loan given by partner what to do if any one of the partner wants to retire how to compute the bill of the firm all these terms will be decided and then return that's what we call as partnership deal if any of the terms is not pre decided and it's not written here then what do we apply section 13 of partnership deal section 13 sorry section 13 of partnership act section 13 talks about model partnership deal what does section 13 talk about very good section 13 says that in the absence of any specific mention of any of the term partnership deed is not there or partnership deed is there but it is silent in certain terms then you should follow section 13 it says that the no remuneration cannot be given to any partner all the partners should work without any remuneration and interest on capital interest on drawings cannot be given partner should take equal profits along all of them everyone will have equal rights and responsibilities if there is any loan given by the partner to the firm is eligible to interest at 6% did you get this no remuneration no interest on capital no interest on drawings and if the loan is given by the partner to the firm how much interest on that 6% per annum simple interest 6% clear these are the terms that you should follow when partnership deed is not there or partnership deed is there but partnership deed is silent on this aspect they didn't tell anything clear say something yes. fantastic and uh, if in case the partner does any misconduct he has to compensate the firm for the same now this profit and loss account and profit and loss appropriation account same i wanted to discuss this in final accounts i postponed it to partnership is it same no p and l account include such items which are charged against profits once we write those items profits will decrease on the other hand p and l appropriation account has such items which will be appropriation of profits which is already earned after you earn the profit you will decide what to do with the profit that is p and l appropriation account in order to compute how much profit have you earned you write items that is p and l account items in p and l will be written irrespective of the fact whether there is profit or not items in p and l appropriation will be written only and only if there is profit are you getting it if there is no profit you will not give interest on capital if there is no profit you will not share profit if there is no profit you won't transfer profit to reserves however whether there is profit or not you have to provide interest you have to provide depreciation you have to provide rent you have to provide salary all of this will be written after that only you will find whether there is profit or loss did you understand the difference items in pnl are charged against income items in pnl a pnl appropriation or appropriation of income and it consists of expense and income it will consist of appropriation distribution to stakeholders and uh, the order first to be prepare pnl after that using the profit that comes in pnl we prepare pnl appropriation clear any payments made to partners or any receipts collected from partners will be through pnl appropriation and not in pnl interest on capital should not be written in pnl interest on drawings should not be written in pnl always you have to write all of these where pnl appropriation understood this pakka very good in pnl appropriation account we bring down the profit from pnl account once we bring down the profit sorry first we bring down the profit from pnl from this we pay interest on capital we pay share of profit to partners we receive interest on drawings and uh, if there is any other collection from partners we do it see what and all do we pay and what and all do we receive is here let me show see this is the profit that we bring down from our pnl along with this we collect interest on drawings from partners number 3 what we pay to partners is their remuneration and we pay them interest on capital after that if still money is left that is share of profit shared to partners if there is shortage it is loss shared or bore between partners understood this basically on the credit side we write items increasing profit in the debit side we write items decreasing profit say something <laughs> fantastic after this we need to understand those items in clear for which we'll first know capital accounts capital accounts of the partners can be prepared in two systems fixed capital system and fluctuating capital system fixed capital system and under fluctuating capital system capitals are increasing decreasing increasing decreasing increasing decreasing we are not keeping it constant we prepare only one capital in that capital only we will write revaluation profit in that only we write interest on capital share of profit interest on drawings drawings salary remuneration everything that will be changing however if you want to compute interest on capital you want the capital to be fixed partnership details partners capital should be 1 lakh each you want to keep the capital 1 lakh 
you made drawings 10000 there is share of profit 2000 there is interest on drawings interest on capital all these are there but you don't want that to affect your capital of one lakh what do you do you open two accounts one capital account two current account in capital account you write balance carried down one lakh balance brought down one lakh balance carried down one lakh balance brought down one lakh one lakh will be constant you will not change it there is interest on capital, interest on drawings, there is share of profit, there is salary, there is remuneration. All these items will write it in current account. So current account balance will be changing, capital account balance will be fixed. This is what we call as fixed capital system. Under fluctuating capital system, how many accounts? Under fixed capital system, how many accounts? It will be easier to compute interest on capital if you maintain fixed capital system. Remember, under fixed capital system, interest will not be given on current account balance. Interest will be only and only computed on capital account balance. Understood? Pakka, have a look at both the system. Fixed and fluctuating. Fluctuating how many accounts? Only capital. Fixed. Capital and very good. Fluctuating capital. See everything is visible. Opening capital, additional capital, remuneration, interest to interest on advance, share of profit, drawings, interest on drawings, loss, everything. However, if I go under the fixed capital system, opening additional capital as per partnership deed, drawings as per partnership deed, closing capital. This is fixed. Everything else relating to revaluation profit, drawings, interest on drawings, remuneration, everything will write where? In current account. Where do I write it? Everyone got this? Pakka? Say something. Now, this remuneration we have already spoken in final accounts of part, final accounts of proprietorship. If it is before charging basis, we do X by 100. If it is after charging basis, we do X by 100 plus. Pakka? Yes or no? Yes, Next part, what I want you to know is interest on capital. Interest on capital, like I mentioned, will be given only on capital account balance. It will not be given on interest on capital will be given only on interest on capital will not be given on everyone understood this. Next, interest on drawings. We compute it as drawings multiplied by time period for which the drawings is made multiplied by rate of interest. However, if multiple amounts have been withdrawn, drawings is not one amount. Drawings are multiple amounts. Then we can think if we can apply one shortcut. If the drawings have been made on the beginning of the entire every month throughout the period or it's made in the middle of the every month throughout the period or beginning of every quarter, if there is some pattern, specific dates and specific amount, same amount, 1000, 1000, 1000 every month, then we can actually use shortcut. If not, we can actually apply product method. This shortcut is also product method, but simplified version of our product method. Okay, now say something. What is the shortcut? If the amount what is withdrawn is same amount, we follow average period. What is it called? If the amount is withdrawn at the beginning of the year, if the beginning of the month, sorry, beginning of every month, first drawing will charge 12 months, second 11, third 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Amounts are same. So, we will do 1000 into 12 by 12 into 10%, 1000 into 11 by 12 into 10%, 1000 into 10 by 12, 1000 into 9 by 12, 8 by 12, 7 by 12, 6 by 12. Here, 1000, 1000, 1000 is constant. Divided by 12, divided by 12, divided by 12 is constant. Into 10%, into 10% is constant. What is the only thing changing? Number of months for which you are charging. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So what do we do? 1000, 1000, 1000, 11, 12 months is there. Add them together. 12 months. Here, first month it is 12. Last month it is 1. Add them. 12 plus 1 divided by 2. Meet me in the middle. 6.5 months. Divided by 12 into 100. So instead of doing 12 months, 11 months, 10 months, 9 months, 8 months, for the same amount at same interest rate, you can straight away do total drawings multiplied by average period. Divide by 12, multiplied by 10%, you will get the same answer. So if the drawings is made at the beginning of every month, we compute it for an average period of 6.5. What is the average period? If it is made in the middle of every month, we compute it for an average period of? If it is made at the end of every month, we compute it for an average period of? If it is made at every quarter beginning, average period of? 7.5 months, middle of every quarter, 6 months, end of every quarter. When you take months, no, remember to take total drawings. 1000 rupees is drawings per month. On 12,000, we should apply 6.5 by 12, not on 1000. And when you take quarter, one year as four quarters, 
If they say thousand rupees the drawing per quarter, don't do thousand into twelve. Two thousand into four, thousand into, and apply this months and then compute the interest. Are you getting it? If in case there is drawings, but they don't tell whether it is beginning or end, they don't mention the date. What do we do? Average period of six months because it could have been withdrawn on the first day or on the last day. So we do it on the average period of. Understood this? Same thing. We'll do it in the topic of average due date and account current also. Yeah. Please don't take average due date account current lightly. Like I mentioned, it's a topic where you put minimum effort, get maximum results. Easy to do, but full marks. But there also should be little cautious. What people do in average method also, average due date also, they do everything. They skip that last loan part. Loan is there no? It's multiple installments are there. Date of loan we should take as best that they skip. Account current. They do everything. They skip that last one. Product of balance method. What if the question comes exactly from that, from an easy chapter? Product of balance method is not difficult, and loan based question is not difficult. Those are also easy. In fact, they are same. They've just simplified it for a different special case in a much simpler way. Entire average due date is about two two and a half hours. Entire account current is about two two and a half hours video. So it's there on YouTube. Please do watch it when you're preparing so that you don't skip any questions from average due date and account current. And good sent on return or approval, everything put together, it is three videos of 30 35 minutes each. 30 minutes ka three videos. One and a half hour, you can finish entire good sent on return or approval. Not quick revision, entire chapter, all the questions. So don't skip. Don't. Uh, very good. Then share of profit. Share of profit should be shared between partners. Should be shared between, but some of the partners can have some special preference. Some of the partners can have some. What is the special preference that they can have? They will be promised with the minimum guarantee. Last exam may very important question. I had come from here only. Are you getting it? And before you pay share of profit, you should adjust interest on capital, remuneration, interest on advance or any other payment. After that, you give it. What if profit is insufficient to pay interest on capital? Profit is 1 lakh. Interest on capital is 1 lakh 20,000. Do we have enough money to pay interest? No, we don't have enough money to pay interest. Whenever profits are insufficient to pay interest, remember this. Whenever profits are insufficient to pay interest, such profits will not be shared in profit sharing ratio. Instead, it will be shared in capital ratio. I'm sorry. Whenever profits are insufficient to pay interest, then what do we do? Share it in the capital ratio. Why? Because without paying interest on capital, we cannot pay share of profit. Without paying interest on capital, we cannot pay share of profit. And if in if you want to pay interest on capital, we don't have sufficient money to pay interest on capital. So what we are doing in that case is we are paying interest on capital only, but proportionately. We are not paying total interest on capital. We are paying interest on capital in parts. So proportionately when you pay, interest on capital is dependent upon capital. Higher the capital, higher the interest. Lower the capital, lower the interest. So interest on capital in proportion when we pay, it will be in ratio of capital. So profit which is not uh, sufficient to pay interest on capital should be shared between the partners in capital ratio. Understood this? Say something. Very good. Then there can be partner with minimum guarantee. Partner with the, there can be certain people joined to the firm and they would have promised that we'll pay you this much money. Whenever there is a partner with minimum guarantee, then what do we do? That person who's been promised some money is guaranteed partner. The person who's promising him certain money is guaranteeing a partner. We have this bad habit of deducting the money that should be given to guaranteed partner first and then sharing the balance among guaranteeing partner, which is a shortcut which works in some cases, but not in all the cases. So what you should first do is share the profits between the partners normally. Let's say there are three partners. All the three partners, you share the profits normally. Guaranteed partner as well as guaranteeing partner. Then check whether the guaranteed partner has he got the money that he has been guaranteed. If he has got the money that he has been guaranteed, very good. If he has not got the money that he has guaranteed, then identify how much is the deficiency of the money that is getting and the money that he was promised. Such deficiency will be given by the guaranteeing partners. In the profit sharing ratio, or any other pre agreed ratio. Clear? Come on, let's see. So what do we do? Please read this. I've been talking constantly for little long time. So I'll take a small brief. You please read this. What does it say? 
हाँ देन वेरी गुड देन विल गो अहेड गिव मी मोमेंट हाँ रीड दिस In this case, what is happening? Okay, read this guaranteed and guaranteeing partner. Guaranteed partner. Mm hmm. Got this. Now let's see one of the cases. So this is what we do. This is what we have done in class. Not just uh, after the June exam. We have done this before June exam also. People who attended last year November batch, last year June batch. But I've also seen this happening in their class. So this I'm doing since 2016. This example, same example, copy pasted from 2016. You remember 2016? Prime year, Virat Kohli. My God. No, now it's 2023. But yeah, 2016 is. Is it still? I don't understand. How did we lose that final? Virat is there. A B is there. Rahul is there. Watson is there. Kale is there. Still lost. 12 overs, 120 runs. 160 runs in 12 holes. Still lost that. Pity. Some dreams are bad. Ah, shh, come on, get back. So here, let's say uh, capital, guys. The amount that is being guaranteed to Nax is how much? One lakh. Is a guaranteed partner. And profits of the firm is three lakh. They're sharing profits equally. Don't give one lakh out of three lakh first to Nax. All that you should do is first share the profits between all the three partners equally. Then check. Max is supposed to be given one lakh rupees minimum guarantee. Is he getting one lakh? Fantastic. No problem. Second case. Profit is four lakh fifty. When you share, everyone gets one lakh fifty. Is Max getting his one lakh rupees minimum due amount? Again, don't worry. Everything is fine. Come to case three. One lakh eighty thousand is a profit. When you share it between Virat, AB, and Max, how much is Max getting? Sixty. How much was Max promised? To get one lakh, Max should be given additional forty thousand. That additional forty thousand should come from Virat and AB minus twenty minus twenty. So before giving that twenty twenty to Nax, Virat had sixty, AB had sixty. By giving twenty twenty, their share has become forty forty, and Nax also Nax will get one lakh. So the ultimate distribution of profit is forty forty and one lakh. This is how it should be done. Many of them skip these steps. You know what do they do? From one lakh straight away, they first give one lakh rupees to Nax, and remaining eighty will be shared between Virat and AB forty forty. This might work in some cases, but it will not work in all the cases. In this case, it might give correct answer, but it will not give correct answer in all the cases. And in the exam, they won't give such simple case. So please don't apply that straight logic. First, to distribute the profits, check whether the guaranteed partner has got the money. If he has got it, very good. If he doesn't get it, then give it from the guaranteeing partners. Share. Okay, now say something. I'll show you another case. Uh, Yeah, here it is one lakh eighty only. But uh, the guarantee is given by Virat and AB, not in one is to one ratio. They have given in one is to two ratio. There can be a different ratio. The guarantee ratio can be old profit sharing ratio, but it need not be profit sharing ratio. Yes or no? Fantastic. That said, you should know this part. This part I just taught you how to deal with that. Uh, uh, if the profit is insufficient to pay interest on capital, then you share it in that capital ratio part. Then. Uh, This is uh, how we deal with our introduction to partnership. Then I will slightly take you people into admission of a partner, and then we'll discuss admission, retirement, death, including goodwill. Is that fine? Say something. Yes, and these are the questions based on our uh, what concept? That interest on drawings, interest on drawings, product method. When the amounts are on different dates and then different amounts are there. However, if it is constant same amount, then you can apply our. Uh, Average method also, yeah. Shall we start with partnership admission for charging of interest? It will be mentioned in the question in a way or the other. There is one question where they have not mentioned is what I am trying to tell now. So, uh, can you tell what part is that? Can you just tell me a little more? I understood what you are trying to tell. Okay, first of all, we discuss point order. Ah. Uh, 
that amounts which are withdrawn in installments no 1000 and all those are drawings on which we charge interest if you withdraw major sum capital me 50000 lump sum that will be capital withdrawal and not revenue drawings first four comment and that one question uh, asset withdrawn or asset you purchased the payments were made by the firm on that you can compute interest on drawings i think i have clarified that part i told no that day you can charge interest on drawings on that today tell you can charge ic metal me they have charged we have not charged initially i told no later i clarified saying that you can charge interest on them you can charge interest on drawings if you don't charge that then please write that you have not charged but i saw that ic state metal they have done interest on drawings on tuition fees so write clearly charge it and then write that it's been charged drawings you charge on it if you want if you don't charge just mention that it's not charged on that because the date was also not mentioned when was that made okay guys can we start with admission let's take a break around 6 o'clock let's take a break around it's me who needs the break there is no writing time throughout i am the one who's talking and it is very tiring and if you people don't respond so it's more painful because i don't even get enough time to breathe yeah salvi get started with admission of a partner come on guys show some energy hey your energy is mine if you people don't show energy i'll get dream more can we come on let's start with admission of a partner when we say admission of a partner in the case of admission a new partner comes into the firm when a new partner comes into the firm the existing firm is going to sell a part of their firm to the new partner who's coming so they're going to sell it so they receive the capital which they had invested previously they're reimbursing they're getting reimbursed from that new partner who's coming so in the case of admission of a partner all that we need to remember is a part of the business is sold to the incoming partner a part of the business is sold to the incoming partner please do remember that and uh, admission is done to increase the capital of the firm increase the managerial capabilities increase the scale of operations and also open more than one locations may operations done very good now in the case of admission i told you a part of the business is sold we need to identify what part of the business is sold so to identify the part we do ratio computations and business is sold if it is sold we should know the value of the business value of the business is nothing but assets minus liabilities no the capital net worth of the business so we need to do revaluation account to find the right value of the business after we do that we need to reorganize the capitals of the business knowing after one partner comes in what is the capitals of each of the partners to determine this we do capital accounts and ultimately after entire reorganizations to know where the business stands and how it is standing we prepare balance sheet comprising of all the assets and liabilities so that's the reason we do profit sharing ratio revaluation goodwill capital as well as balance sheet after same is done after retirement as well as in the case of death of a partner whenever we say partnership may profit sharing ratios we need to compute profit sharing ratios in the case of admission three important ratios are there people call it opening ratio sorry old profit sharing ratio new profit sharing ratio and sacrifice ratio previously partners were getting higher share and new partner walks into the room you need to give a part of the share to him also because of which the partners will have to sacrifice to that incoming partner that's the reason we call it sacrifice ratio when the new partners share is mentioned when the new partners share is mentioned saying that a and b are partners c comes in for one third share if they mention such share and they don't mention anything else from the total capital of the firm one by one deduct the new partners ratio after you deducting the new prop partners ratio whatever remains has to be shared between the old partners in old profit sharing ratio only are you getting this this is how we do when they give only the new partner share but don't mention anything about from whom will he get and how much will he get if they mention how much is the incoming partner getting from the one of the existing partners they have two ways of expressing it this is what i just mentioned if they say that a new partner comes in have a look what's happening one is to one new partner comes for one third when you eliminate the new partner share of one third what is left is two third that two third is shared between old partners in their same old ratio one is to two one is to two so it will become one is to one is to one are you getting this and you don't have to compute sacrifice ratio also again here why their old profit sharing ratio will all by itself become their sacrifice ratio yes or no next up, we have a case where there are partners sharing profits and loss a new partner comes in and when a new partner comes in they have clearly mentioned how much is this new partner getting from each of the old partners they don't just tell a new partner comes in for this much share 
they will tell new partner comes in for one sixth share sorry uh, yeah new partner comes in into the firm and he gets one sixth from beam and one third from chutki from the amount is mentioned the ratio is mentioned and they give such from word no deduct that from the old partnership now beam is giving one sixth deduct one sixth from beam and then chutki is giving one third deduct one third from chutki and whatever we get after that on that we compute our new profit sharing ratio the next case is they can mention the word off here when they say from straight away deduct when they say from what do we do straight away deduct they can alternatively use the word off see here they are getting 1 by 2 off beam 2 by 3 off chutki so when they tell 1 by 2 off and 2 by 3 off then we should do 1 by 2 into beam share of 2 by 5 2 by 3 off chutki share of 3 by 5 that together will become Raju share and we don't have a straight away deduct 1 by 2 from 2 by 5. 2 by 5 was beam share. No, we cannot deduct 1 by 5. We should do 1 by 5, sorry, 1 by 2 of 2 by 5. Meaning 1 by 2 into 2 by 5, we should multiply. What result comes? That has to be deducted from beam's share to arrive at the beam share after the admission. Are you getting it? The logic is very simple. The summary, I'll just tell it to you again. When they use the word from, F-R-O-M straight away deduct that fraction if they use the word of of first multiply and then deduct multiply and resulting number should be deducted okay say something very good so if we compute these ratios we can straight away go to revaluation revaluation account is prepared to determine the profit or loss that the business would have made if they would have sold the assets and liabilities sold the assets and settled the liabilities when we prepare revaluation, it is prepared to record any increase or decrease in the asset. Increase in the asset is profit, credit side. Decrease in the asset is loss, debit side. Increase in the liability is loss, debit side. Decrease in the liability is income, credit side. Write this, determine the profit or loss, share it to old partners in old profit sharing ratio. If in case, if in case there is an unrecorded asset or an unrecorded liability, Assume it to be like it was recorded but at zero. Meaning, zero rupees was their asset. Now it is increasing. So that entire amount of increase will become profit. If the asset is decreasing, then what will happen? There is an unrecorded liability. Then what do we do? Assume that that liability was recorded at zero. Now it is arriving some at some value. So there is increase in liability. To that extent, it will become expense. Am I right? Yes or no? Such revaluation profit, what we compute, will be shared to old partners in old profit sharing ratio clear very good so once we are done with this then uh, ah, we should do this revaluation account in every case in every reconstitution admission retirement death as well as change in profit sharing ratio in all the cases we'll do it some cases may they'll tell that because of revaluation whatever changes in the value of assets and liabilities that's going to happen they don't want that to happen they don't want that to happen when you change the value of the asset in revaluation, same has to be reflected no, in the balance sheet. You would have to increase the value of the asset, decrease the value of the asset. If in case they don't want to do it, then you should not do revaluation. But you want to do revaluation, but you don't want your asset and liabilities values to change. It is like this, Akki mele aase, but nentr mele kriti. Haavu sai veku, kolu muribar. You should do revaluation profit to be adjusted to partners, but you don't want the values in the balance sheet to change. Because... You want to follow historical cost concept. You want assets and liabilities in the balance sheet to be there at original values. Then what do you do? You do memorandum revaluation. What do you do? In memorandum revaluation, what you do is you open revaluation account. This is debit side. This is credit side. You write increase in asset, credit. Decrease in asset, debit. Increase in liability, debit. Decrease in liability, credit. Profit or loss, profit is determined, shared to partners. This is revaluation. Memorandum revaluation will pull it little further. Debit side, credit side further. It is revaluation extended. It is extension of revaluation. Whatever you have written in credit side of revaluation will bring it to debit side. Whatever you have written on debit side of revaluation will bring it to credit side. So that it will be nullified. Here we would have got profit. No, that profit will be reversed in memorandum revaluation. I will repeat. Memorandum revaluation. What am I talking about? Let's show it. Memorandum revaluation is extension of revaluation. It is extension of whatever is there in the debit side in revaluation will be written in credit. Whatever is there on the credit side will be written in debit. If you have got profit here, which is there in the debit side, which will be written off in debit side, sorry, credit side in memorandum revaluation. Only difference is 
here the profit was adjusted between old partners in old profit sharing ratio same thing will be adjusted here in new profit sharing ratio among the new partners understood this quickly have a look at this here memorandum revaluation what is this ha two asset this is increase decrease in the value of the asset one and whatever we have written here i will reverse it by writing here and increase in the value of the asset whatever is profit that i booked here i'll reverse it by writing here and increase in the value of liability what i have written as expense here i'll be writing it here and decrease in the value of the liability which i have written as income here will be reversed by writing here here whatever profit i got no which i was shared between old partners in old profit sharing ratio will be now reversed by adjusting it to all the new partners in new profit sharing ratio by this you know what will happen the new incoming partner will compensate such a revaluation profit to old partners the new incoming partner will share that revaluation loss or profit to old partners he will sacrifice and then he will give so that the profit is given to old partners but assets and liabilities in the balance sheet have been not altered no talking why are you talking yeah you are talking let her sleep you sleep or you want to go sleeping sleep then don't do ishtottu malagitu ige eddu maatadidu my god understood this much pakka someone has doubt yes please let's say profit is 20 beta profit is 30000 how much is profit partners are equal partners a and b one is to one c comes in for one third share a b c one is to one is to one when you give here you are giving a and b 15000 15000 got it Shhh. when you give a and b 15 15 capital uh, will become 15 15 more balance sheet asset side capital will increase by 30000 you don't want balance sheet asset side capital to increase by 30 you want to balance sheet asset side you don't want it to increase by 30 capital of a and b will increase by 30 this is done by decreasing c's capital by 30 this is done by decreasing c's capital by c will give a and b 15 15 how do we do that i'll tell here it was shared between a and b in what ratio 15 is to 15000 15000 if i write the same thing here a b c 10 10 10 will come correct or not if a b c 10 10 10 will come that means that uh, a was previously credited with profit of 15 a is now debited with loss of 10 so basically a is getting 5000 same with b a is getting 5 b is getting 5 that 5 plus 5 10000 is brought in by c why in the future when they actually make profit 30000 later after few days when they sell and make 30000 profit a and b should get 15 15 but a b and c will get 10 10 10 So A and B ten ten five. C got ten. No, that should have been A and B is five five. Are you getting it? C is getting it. So C will buy his share right now, so that in the future he will take that five. Understood this logic? So he will pre-buy the profit that he will earn in the future because of this. This is nothing but goodwill again. It's nothing but goodwill again. But just that the name that we have given is slightly different. Do you get this? So that's the objective of memorandum revaluation. Got it? Let's take a short break of about. Uh, 5 minutes and then the, the other side will discuss the goodwill treatment on uh, admission and then we'll also discuss a uh, retirement and death of a partner you get it i'll give you one more short break maybe before company accounts if possible if possible yeah it is 5:40 5:50 yes see you all at 5:50 be back soon and uh, don't take very long break great So now let's talk about goodwill. Goodwill computation for the purpose of admission, retirement, and death of a partner. Before we do accounting for goodwill, firstly we should do valuation of goodwill. Before we do computation of goodwill, firstly we should do we should identify what is the amount of goodwill. How do we find the value of goodwill? Goodwill amount can be found using multiple methods. Reason being, goodwill is an accounting estimate. Sorry, goodwill is an accounting policy. Computation of goodwill is an accounting 
we have discussed this goodwill computation is an accounting policy there are several methods several methods is in like i'll come to accounting entries slightly later yeah the multiple methods that are available is firstly we have average profit method under the average profit method we have simple average and weighted average then we have super profit capitalization as well as annuity method under average profit method whether it is simple average or weighted average we take the average profit and multiply it with number of years purchase to arrive at goodwill do you agree with me why do we multiply it with number of years purchase it is expected that the business will run for so many years because of its past efforts it will continue to earn profit for so many years after this particular year so that's the reason we compute goodwill by multiplying it with number of years purchase when we compute average that average that we find can be simple can be weighted if the profits are up down up down up down there is no specific trend we follow simple average if the profits are following a specific trend either it's constantly increasing or constantly decreasing then we usually apply weighted average however in the context of examination preparation only and only if the question mentions and then specifically asks us to do weighted average we'll do weighted average if the question doesn't tell weighted average we will not do weighted average weighted average we should be always like the most recent year should have higher weight the previous and then old year should have less weight are you getting this and when we compute the profit for the computation of goodwill the words that we use for that profit is what we call as adjusted average profit or future maintainable profit meaning goodwill is the probability that the organization will continue for its foreseeable what is it i can't concentrate with you people talking put again ish yeah goodwill is the probability that the customer will come back to the same business in the next year so because of that the profit of the next year is already earned and that's what we call as goodwill so whenever we construe this to be goodwill any items which are non recurring or non operating which has been part of the profit should be eliminated if you have earned any income which you might not earn in the next year boss ha huh. what is it telling it's the probability that the existing customer will stick to same business and when we compute goodwill if it is following any trend we apply weighted average if it is not following trend we follow simple average the profit for the purpose of goodwill what we call is adjusted average profit or in other terms it's called as future maintainable profit this profit what we take should be after eliminating all the non operating and non recurring items should be after eliminating all the non operating and non recurring items let's say in a specific year what has happened is you earned some profit from lottery or you earned some profit on insurance claim which is go not going to happen every year this is not going to construe goodwill or you earned some profit on sale of asset this is non repetitive and it is not operating goodwill is only because of operating now upar darshni mein goodwill is their dose their idli they sold one furniture table and they made profit is it is it because of their reputation no inventory is sold because of repetition not fixed assets so if they made profit on sale of asset such profit should be eliminated and what we get as the profit is the fmp or adjusted average profit on that we compute goodwill and if there is any loss incurred because of uh, what to say fire broke fire breaking out in the organization or any profit any loss that has happened which is not going to recur in nature which is not recurring in nature if that is there or if there is any non operating loss again that should be eliminated if you get any interest on investments any interest on fixed deposit all of this is not goodwill now if i open a bank account and then keep money you open a bank account and then keep money both of us will earn same interest it is not like i have high reputation now my business is very famous i'll get higher interest no so interest investment where there is nothing to do with goodwill should be eliminated from profit when you compute the goodwill are you getting this so there are plenty of questions on this topic let me quickly show you couple of them ha huh. here these are adjustments basically and maintain uh, some uh, difference between a uh, rectification as well as uh, this one certain rectification items is not to be considered certain errors are there in some questions the profits they would give no would be wrong they would have forgotten to record some asset they would have forgotten to charge depreciation opening stock closing stock would be returned at wrong value if they have done all of these errors no because of the second year profit will be incorrect first correct your stock correct your depreciation correct your repair expenditure once you correct all of these then what you get will be your corrected profit that is not adjustment to profit that is basic rectifications to profit that you should do not for goodwill but you should do it for 
without even if you are not computing goodwill you should still be doing those so you just blend that uh, rectification based questions into goodwill computation so be little cautious about them and um, i'll show you those errors where was that where was it where was it i'm not able to find it in specific but i hope you understood no when i say insurance claim profit on sale of assets all of this profit should be eliminated and then we take the profit for computation of goodwill yes or no very good then uh, i'll talk about the other method this is simple average method and weighted average weighted average method also i did touch talking about super profit method not every rupee of profit that you earn will be your goodwill not every rupee of profit that you earn will be your goodwill super profit method says that only super profit into multiplied by number of years purchase will be goodwill so how do we find super profit super profit is actual profit minus normal profit let's say both of us start with capital of 1 lakh both of us start with capital of i earn profit of 20000 whereas you earn profit of 15000 everyone in the market usually earns 15% that is what we call nrr what is nrr normal rate of return what is it normal rate of return usually in the market in this form of business organization everyone earns 15% in this industry i also started with 1 lakh rupees capital but i earned 20000 rupees profit when i earned 20000 that is 20% but usually people are no much 15% 15% if you are it comes to 15000 rupees but what i earned is 20000 rupees 20000 and 15000 is difference is 5000 how much is the difference i want 5000 more than the previous person or any other person that 5000 is my super profit what is that 5000 i multiply 5000 with number of years purchase to arrive at goodwill i want to do the entire 20000 multiplied by number of years purchase to multiply to arrive at my goodwill that is my super profit method. did you get this yes or no very good capitalization method is opposite of super profit method what am I doing under super profit method? My capital is 1 lakh. Normal rate of return is 15%. So, what do I do? 1 lakh into 15% will arrive at 15,000 rupees as average normal, uh, say normal profit. Actual profit is 20. 20 is what I've earned. 15,000 is what people usually earn. 20 minus 15. 5,000 is super profit. 5,000 super profit multiplied by number of years purchase is rupee. That is super profit method. Under capitalization what, what, method, what it is? I want 20,000 rupees profit. How much profit? And what is the normal rate of return? 15%. What is normal rate of return? So, if I want 20,000, that is 15%. How much should I be in my capital to earn this? 20,000 divided by 15%. 20,000 is the return? No. To earn 20,000 return, how much capital should I have invested? 20,000 divided by 15%. Do it. 1 lakh? 33,000. Anybody, if they want to earn 20,000 rupees profit, how much capital should they invest? 1,33,000. So that on that, if they multiply 15%, they'll arrive at 20. But I want 20,000 rupees as profit with only 1 lakh capital. To earn 20,000 at 15% rate, I should have invested 1,33, but I've invested only 1 lakh. Difference 33,333 is my profit. Sorry, is my goodwill. Did you understand this? If the capitals is assumed to be same, I arrive at normal profit actual profit find the difference between them super profit method i want the profit to earn this profit to earn this profit how much should have been my normal capital how much should have been by how much is my actual capital difference between them is goodwill under capitalization method did you understand this should i give another example let us say i want uh, 15000 rupees profit how much for how much profit have i earned 15000 rupees Usually, profitability is 15%. How much is the profitability? So, to earn 15,000, I should have invested 1 lakh. Yes or no? I have invested only 80,000. So, 20,000 what I didn't invest, but I have actually earned profit. That 20 is my goodwill. Are you getting the logic? For the purpose of super profit method, on the capital that we have employed, we apply normal rate of return. What we get is normal profit. We compare that with the actual profit. You would have earned more profit than the normal rate of return. That difference is my profit under super profit method, which will be multiplied by number of years. Under capitalization method, what we do? We have profit. If this is my profit, to earn this profit at this rate of return, how much should have been my capital? We divide profit by normal rate of return to arrive at capital. That capital will be deducted from the actual capital what I have employed, which is less. The difference will become our goodwill under capitalization method why do we follow capitalization method and why do we follow super profit method 
सुपर प्रॉफिट मेथड व्हाट इज द फार्मूला सुपर प्रॉफिट मल्टीप्लाइड बाय नंबर ऑफ इयर्स परचेस नंबर ऑफ इयर्स परचेस इज एन अकाउंटिंग एस्टीमेट इट कैन बी रॉन्ग इफ नंबर ऑफ इयर्स अकाउंटिंग एस्टीमेट गोस रॉन्ग देन योर गुडविल गोस रॉन्ग सो टू एलिमिनेट दैट एस्टीमेट वी गो टू कैपिटलाइजेशन मेथड कैपिटलाइजेशन मेथड मैं यू टेक द प्रॉफिट डिवाइड बाय नॉर्मल रेट ऑफ रिटर्न यू गेट नॉर्मल कैपिटल एक्चुअल कैपिटल देयर इज ओनली वन एस्टीमेट हियर व्हाट इज इट नॉर्मल रेट ऑफ रिटर्न under super profit method there are two estimates super profit method may also use nrr nrr is also an accounting estimate and uh, number of years purchase is also an accounting estimate two accounting estimates one of the estimates goes wrong your complete goodwill computation goes wrong to reduce the possibility of error to keep it more approximate to the actual value or more approximate to the realistic figure we try to reduce the number of estimates and we follow capitalization method over super profit method but we don't have such kind of decision making in our level of examination they will tell us in the question to apply super profit we'll apply super profit they'll ask us to do average capital we'll do average capital they'll ask us to do weighted average method we'll apply weighted average method. we'll just apply the method what they mentioned in the question so say something fantastic that's with regard to goodwill and once the goodwill is been computed we need to learn how to account the goodwill we need to learn how to account the goodwill that's where we do this the people usually learn it as several methods people usually learn it as sir brought in cash not brought in cash bought in kind adjusted through capital account settled through what is it privately only to the extent of incoming partner it is raised it is completely raised and written off adjusted through so many methods are there. raised and then not withdrawn raised and then withdrawn raised brought in and then part of it is withdrawn by the partners in cash not withdrawn and then kept in the capital multiple methods it doesn't actually matter these many methods we only do one thing only thing that you should remember is goodwill is something that the old partners have worked hard for which are going to share with the new partner so new partner has to buy his share of goodwill from the old partners he can bring that consideration in cash if he brings it in cash will debit cash account and then credit goodwill get this because goodwill is being sold and again we'll write goodwill and then credit old partners basically old partners have worked hard it is their effort new partner is going to share so goodwill compensation has to be paid by new partner to old partners it has to be paid by new partner to if we bring is in cash no debit cash that comes to the firm that belongs to old partners credit it to old partners in old profit sharing ratio if he brings it in kind don't write cash write whatever he brings in kind that asset share it to old partners in old profit sharing ratio if he doesn't bring doesn't bring no cash or kind Debit the new partner's capital account and credit old partner's capital account in profit sharing ratio. That's it. We do. After that, is if these people withdraw drawing entry, if they don't withdraw, no drawing entry. And this is there only in introduction. In admission, genuine problems when we start. No, we don't have to treat all of this. Raise, raise, return off, adjust it through capital account. Not required at all. We'll do our table. We once we put our table automatically, irrespective of what case it is, everything gets sorted within the table. Yes or no? Very good. then let's quickly see the next part of this in i to guys you're finding it funny i just want you to understand how difficult it is to sit here and then do the job then you will understand alle kootu tamasha martta idira some goodwill questions towards the end are little important in our material how many of you are from non yes uh, background but still sitting here Okay, one John and this. Oh no, we need to put it. When you are leaving the academy at eight thirty, uh, meet at the front desk. You just tell uh, you want Asia's material. It will be given to you. You can take the copy. Just sign that you take on the copy, and then you can take the copy. I thought I'll tell, but they have left. Anybody else who's here? No hands will get. Ah, uh, you can collect when you are leaving. The same material what we are referring to, you will get it. Ah, uh, listen, because they don't have it. this uh, few questions towards the end on goodwill are important because these are exam type questions question number 27 28 29 30 these questions which are there on genuine goodwill questions don't skip this please do it 27 28 29 30 so the problem with us is whenever we start preparing we start with question number 1 2 3 4 5 by the time we come to 24 25 26 we are so tired and bored of the topic so we skip last five questions but we have done first 10 questions correctly but first five six questions are actually easy ones last five six questions are actually the most difficult ones so when you are preparing listen 
ಏನ್ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಮಾತಾಡಿಸ್ತೇನೆ ವಾಟ್ ಐಮ್ ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ಟೆಲ್ ಯು ಈಸ್ ಮೆನ್ ಎವರ್ ಯು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಎ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಫರ್ ಗೌಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ಲಿ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಯುವರ್ ರೆಗ್ಯುಲರ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಯು ಡೋಂಟ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ದೆನ್ ಯು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ರೆಡ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಡನ್ ಒನ್ ಒನ್ ಎಂಟೈರ್ ರೀಡಿಂಗ್ ವೆನ್ ಯು ರಿವೈಸಿಂಗ್ ರಿವೈಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ಎನಿ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಡೂ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಫೈವ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಶುಡ್ ಡೂ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಡೂ ಈಸಿ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಸ್ಕಿಪ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಯು ಓಂಟ್ ಸರ್ವೈವ್ ಬಟ್ ಯು ಡನ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಸೇ ಆನ್ ಒನ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಡನ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ಯು ಡಿನ್ ಡೂ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಯು ಬಿ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಆನ್ಸರ್ ದಟ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ವಿಥೌಟ್ ಇವನ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ಯೂಮ್ ದಟ್ ಯು ಡನ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ಯು ನಾಟ್ ಡನ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಯು ಬಿ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ಡೂ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಯು ಟೆಲ್ ಮಿ ವಿಚ್ ಟೆನ್ ಶುಡ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಬಿ ವೆರಿ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಮೇಕ್ ಯು ಫೀಲ್ ವೆರಿ ಕಾನ್ಫಿಡೆಂಟ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೆನ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಲ್ ನಾಟ್ ಮೇಕ್ ಯು ಫೀಲ್ ವೆರಿ ಬಟ್ ದ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಟು ಬಿಲ್ಡ್ ಕಾನ್ಫಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಕಲ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ಯು ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಕಲ್ ಲರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ಸ್ ದ ರೀಸನ್ ಐ ಟೋಲ್ಡ್ ಮೆನ್ ಯು ರಿವೈಸಿಂಗ್ ಡೂ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ಯೂ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಸ್ಕಿಪ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಫ್ಯೂ ಕ್ವಶನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ರಿಗಾರ್ಡ್ ಟು ಅಡ್ಮಿಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ನರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಒನ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಆನ್ ಸೇ ಹಿಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಗುಡ್ ವಿಲ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹಿಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಗುಡ್ ವಿಲ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಇದೆ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ಕ್ವಶನ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಬಟ್ ಯಾಟ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ have a look at this it and good will question guys can i have your attention see this a and b people a and b are partners sharing profits and losses in the ratio 1 is to 1 and capitals of a and b are 30000 each a's capital is 30000 b's capital is very good c comes in for one third share how much is c's capital and he brings 50000 towards his capital how much is goodwill it they have not told anything about goodwill but it is hidden in the books of accounts come on use your calculator think and tell only two lines simple information is it very complex simple one multiplication one division one minus ashta a and b 30000 30000 capital profit sharing ratio 1 is to 1 c comes for one third share capital 50000 okay now listen <coughs> how do we compute goodwill Shh, please now c is a partner for how much share for one third share if he is getting 50000 rupees if he is bringing 50000 what will be the total capital of the firm 1 lakh 1 lakh 50000 50000 into 3 50000 into but how much is capital 50 plus 30 plus 30 30 plus 30 60 60 plus 50 110 110 is the capital but they are actually asking to bring 150 difference is 40 that 40 is the good thing. see this is how we compute it and see is capital is one third or one third share he brings in 50000 firm capital should be 150 that is for 3 by 3 and firm capital is actually a plus b plus c is 30 plus 30 plus 50 which is 1 lakh 10 000 1 lakh 50 is a firm capital whereas it should be 1 lakh 10 difference of 40 000 is the good bill that is hidden cut it ig1 yes sure no very good uh memorandum revaluation account has to be done only when it is asked they will tell very clearly prepare memorandum revaluation or they'll mention you are required to show the assets at original value if this ask you to show the assets at original value or if they say prepare memorandum revaluation then you prepare memorandum revaluation otherwise you won't prepare memorandum revaluation got it then uh, shall we quickly move on to retirement of a partner then i'll discuss jlp after i discuss death of a partner yeah retirement of a partner same to same as admission only point of difference is there one partner comes in here one partner goes out there the computation of ratios has three different cases here it won't be like that three partners are there one partner retires delete that partner's ratio that is the partnership ratio for other if in case they say that this partner's ratio is shared between these two in a specific way then this partner share multiplied by that specific ratio you add it to this partner share that's how we compute the new profit s
So continuing partners beam and chutkis ratio will be 3 is to 2. And the gain ratio if it has to be computed, it will be 3 is to 2 only. Unless they give any other information, if 3 is to 2 is to 1 is the ratio of 3 partners. And the last partner returns, continuing partners new profit sharing ratio will be 3 is to 2. And the gain ratio is also 3 is to 2, you don't have to reach it. However, there can be a case where 3 partners, 3 is to 2 is to 1 is the ratio. One of the partner retires and they are telling very clearly that the retiring partner share is shared between two of the continuing partners in one specific ratio. So, then that retiring partner is termed 3 by 6. Apply that 3 by 6 into 1 by 3 and 2 by 3 here. Add that resulting number to the old partner share to arrive at their new profit sharing ratio. Understood this? Very good. Then uh, that is it. No other thing to be specifically told. Mm. Revaluation will be same as what we have discussed in the previous case. And goodwill also will be more or less the same. In the goodwill, all that I want you to know is you need to prepare one beautiful table. If you can follow this table, it will make you survive in any sort of question. All that you need to do is once you compute goodwill, first share the goodwill to old partners in old profit sharing ratio. Then write off the same goodwill by debiting to new partners in new profit sharing ratio. Write the entry for net difference amount. So initially when you give, it will be credit. Later when you write off, it will be debit. The difference is what you find here, no? That is the entry. Now here when you do it for our fair brother, great batch and then Christian, great batch is going to have no impact. That is because he is neither a gaining partner nor a sacrificing partner. If any partner has credit, this is because he is sacrificing partner. If any partner has debit, this is because there is, he is the, sorry, debit, it is because he is the gaining partner. This is very, very handy. It might look like as a raising writing of no, sir. I can do with two simple journal entries also. Yes, I agree. Two simple journal entries will work. But it will become very beautiful when there is more than one reconstruction, sorry, reconstruction. Meaning like one partner is admitting and one partner is retiring. So then you are little confused whether to do retirement first or admission first. Or if you do retirement admission separately, it's going to become very complex. It's going to take too much time. If you put a table like this, this will solve all the problems once. Retirement come admission problems ke liye, this will work the best. It will save easily 5 to 10 minutes in the examination and save your time of computing the ratios in a lengthy way, adjusting goodwill in lengthy way. Understood? Say something. Very good. After this, your uh, regular uh, uh, revaluation account, partner's capital account and capital account will be same. In the case of retirement of a partner, whatever the money needs to be paid to that retiring partner, if they have told, it is paid. In your capital account, instantly write cash. If they tell it is not paid, then write it to loan. And if you have current account and capital account, transfer the entire current account balance to capital account, revaluation account to capital account. And in the capital account, you find how much should be paid and how much should be not paid. There is one beautiful question. This is the question. Great batch, fair brother and then uh, total. And in which... Uh, they have not told us how much is the amount to be paid and they have not told us what should be the capital of the new partners. We need to identify the same with the help of a working group. Please do try this question once. Again, the same question, entire video, 30 minutes video is there on YouTube. You can search it. We have named this as master question on retirement of a partner. There is one more question called master question on death of a partner. That is our recent 2023 June examination question. Death of a partner question which involves goodwill adjustment, revaluation, and it will also involve a balance sheet preparation in death. That's one question that you can watch. Other than that, what should you what you should be knowing in death of a partner is section 37. I'll tell you what is section 37 and what is it that you would have to do with regard to section 37 of Partnership Act 1932. Okay, in the event of death of a partner or in the event of retirement of a partner, we need to pay certain sum of money to the deceased partner. Do you agree with me? If in case we don't pay that money to the deceased partner, we at least need to communicate and then agree upon what is it, when do we pay, how do we pay should be communicated. If we don't communicate as to how are we going to disperse that money to the deceased partner's legal hair or that executor, then section 37 will apply. If we don't communicate and then decide that executor of the deceased partner or the retiring partner is eligible for share of profit as if that Amount receivable is capital. Let us say two partners are, let us say two partner, three partners are there. One partner retired. His capital is one lakh, which should be paid. The partners have not paid and the partners have not agreed as to how will it pay. And he has been forced to retire and he has retired. At the end of the year after his retirement, 
whatever profit is earned will be multiplied by his capital 1 lakh divided by total capital of the firm. That is basically we are finding how much of the profit proportionately belongs to this person's capital. So much profit or interest at 6%, whichever is beneficial to him will be given to him. I repeat, in the case of death of a partner and or in the case of retirement of a partner, the retired or deceased partner's legal heir or the partner only if he is alive, is entitled to his share. The firm should agree upon and then decide as to how will they basically give this money to the deceased partner. If it is not communicated, if it is not agreed upon, there is no agreement, then the deceased partner's legal heir or the retired partner is entitled to proportionate profit uh, to the capital that is left over in the business as if that money left over is capital or interest at 6% whichever is beneficial to him. Whichever is beneficial to, let us say total capital of the firm is 3 lakh. Total capital of the firm is, sorry, total capital of the firm is 2 lakh. Amount payable to that retired partner or deceased partner's legal area is 1 lakh. You know what do you do? That 2 lakh is capital. This 1 lakh of loan is also like capital. Let us say the profits of the organization is 15,000. 15,000 into 1 by 3. That is the extent to which this guy has contributed. That is 5,000 rupees. Or on that capital of 1 lakh, interest at 6%, 6,000, 5,000 or 6,000, whichever is beneficial to that person, 6,000 is more beneficial. So, we will take 6,000 interest, whichever is beneficial to that deceased partner or retiring partner, that should be given, understood? And in the case of death of a partner, the death will not happen at the year end, death can happen in the middle of the year. You cannot tell a partner, oh, please wait, year end books close, Martivi, that day you die. You can't tell them. Death can happen in the middle of the year. So, in the event of death of a partner, interest on capital, salary, remuneration, interest on drawing, any other computation should be done till the date of death. And we also need to compute the profit that the organization is expected to have earned till the date of death, proportionate basis. And that will also be given to the deceased partner. Such share of profit what is given will not come from PNL appropriation account. It will be debited to PNL suspense account. Where will it be debited to? And that PNL suspense will appear in the balance sheet asset side till the end of the year. At the end of the year, they will adjust it with the profit that they will actually earn. Are you getting it? There is one beautiful question in the material where the partner dies in the middle of the year. The partner dies in the... The question tells that in the event of death of a partner, deceased partner's legal heirs will be eligible for interest on capital, salary, everything as if the partner was alive till the end of the year. Such kind of adjustment is there in one of the questions. So, though the partner dies in the month of October, till March you should pay salary. Till March you will give interest on capital. Everything will be given till the end of the year. So, be cautious for such kind of a statement in the question, which if it is there, you would have to do that. Understood? Okay. So, this is what you should note on death of a partner. There is a video on retirement of partner, one video on death of a partner. It is called master question. Please do see that. Question number is also referred to in the, in the video, I will show the question as well. But whoever does not have the book, you can copy it when you are leaving. I have told them to give the copy. You just have to sign once because we need to have a record that you take on the copy. Done. Yes, Kush. Yes. Huh? Okay, this is an interesting question. Do you have to give interest on capital to all the partners or just the deceased partner? We need to give only to the deceased partner if you ask me. Because we don't know the profits of the entire business, no? If you identify the profit and then prepare proper pain law operation, then give it to all the partners. Then determine profit and then share it also to all the partners. But we don't actually close the books at the end of the mid-year, no? So for the rest of the partners, you can give at the end of the year. Give it only for the deceased partner. Again, because it doesn't go to his capital account, it will go to his... What to say? Loan or liability, whatever account is there. Yeah, you understood when to do both ways. But my recommendation would be do it only for the deceased partner, not for everyone. Share of profit, interest on capital, salary, everything. But to compute share of profit, you compute the entire profit. No, For computation of profit, you might have to write other appropriations also. Hmm? Ah. Huh. 
Okay. The question that Kalyani is asking is, let's say the partner dies in the middle of the year after four months or after five months. And how much is the profit that would have earned for these four months or these five months? It's not given. They'll tell it is dependent upon the previous year's profit. Meaning last year profit will be available. On the last year profit, whatever is there, you divide it by 12, multiply it by 4 or 4.5. How many ever months this guy is alive? That is the expected profit of the current year. In that profit, you need to compute two things. One, you would have to give him interest on capital. You would have to also give him share of profit. See, if that is profit that is available is sufficient. So then straight away give that is assumed to be the share of profit and then share. But actually what you need to observe and then remember is that is profit as per PNL account. Share of profit is after adjusting interest on capital, after adjusting interest on drawings and several other things. Do you get that? So if there is no clear mention and they are not asking you to do balance sheet and they have not given actual figures, that is expected profit. On that profit you do into its ratio, into number of months alive, that much only you give. Don't adjust interest on capital. Uh, however, if they give clear cut data as to how much of it is belonging to current year, then you should prepare proper PNL appropriation. There you should not just write the deceased partner's interest on capital. You should write all the partner's interest on capital. Because after you deduct all the partner's interest on capital, you get the share of profit to be shared now. But just because you compute all the partner's interest on capital, you don't have to write it their interest, write it to their capital. We are only trying to compute the deceased partner's share. Done. That master question, what you've done, you would have to do computation for all the partners, not just for the deceased partner. I hope I answered. Yes. Any other question on partnership part? Yeah. We'll discuss JLP, but before JLP. No, it will be paid from, okay, if you're telling, if you take it from the profit. No, you don't have to take it to payable suspense. Only the profit that is paid will be taken to payable suspense. You won't prepare balance sheet, no? If you are preparing balance sheet, then you should do in detail PNL appropriation. Give interest on capital not just to deceased partner but to all the partners. Mid year? Mid of the year. Okay. Uh -huh. Entire profit that we assumed will be PNL suspense in that case. Entire profit that we assumed will become PNL suspense. Or whatever is paid if you write no. Okay, listen, Shh. guys, listen, this is becoming a little complex. I'll answer it now. What he is asking is, PNL suspense, what we write in the balance sheet asset side, should be only the share of profit that is paid to deceased partner or should we pay the interest on capital paid to deceased partner also to PNL suspense? PNL suspense written is written in the balance sheet asset side. Why do we write PNL suspense in the balance sheet asset side? This is because some amount of profit is expected to be earned and it is appropriated to partner's capital which is now no longer capital after we transfer to capital from capital we have transferred it to loan or paid let us assume for time being that is transferred to loan so we assumed some amount to be earned as profit we gave it to capital capital increased on the balance sheet liability side then we've shifted to loan so balance sheet liability side the equation has become more no how do we balance it on the asset side Actually, it should be directed from the profits that is there in the liability side. But profits will be computed only at the year end. So, for time being, we'll write it to PNL suspense to the extent we've increased the capital here. Irrespective whether it is in the form of uh, share of capital or interest on capital, sorry, share of profit or interest on capital or salary remuneration, anything, whatever you given, should write in PNL suspense. At the end of the year, when you prepare PNL account for the firm actual, from that first to deduct this PNL suspense because it is already appropriated by payment to deceased partner. Out of the balance, you take interest on capital, salary, remuneration and share of profit to the remaining partners. You get this? Now, if in case you prepare a detailed PNL appropriation, then there is no concept of uh, PNL suspense. You know why? The death of the partner happened in the middle. You are calling a temporary closure of books, determining the actual profit, taking that actual profit to PNL appropriation and appropriating it. If you are not doing it, you are trying to compute only the share of profit, interest on capital to the extent of deceased partner. Then we write only deceased partner share to PNL suspense and give it to his capital and bring it down to his. I hope I answered. Any other query? Yes, Kush. Huh. That depends. If they ask, we'll do. If they don't ask, we'll not. You see, couple of questions answers. You'll understand. This confusion won't come. Done. Shall we quickly discuss JLP?
your favorite topic joint life policy please pay attention joint life policy is not taken by the partners remember it's a policy taken by the firm this is not personal life insurance policy this is the insurance policy taken by the firm because firm is also equally interested on the partners in the event of death of a partner firm will also feel the heat so firm has insured itself by taking the life policy on the partners whenever firm has taken it premium is paid by the firm benefit will also be taken by the firm premium is taken by the premium is paid by the firm so benefit will also go to firm firm means partners no so entire profit of the firm will be shared between partners in profit sharing ratio and the policy amount does not exclusively belong to the deceased partner profit does not exclusively belong to the why i'll tell you the reason when the firm paid the premium 10000 15000 20000 whatever that would have been charged to pnl account debit side and that would have been borne by all the partners no so if the firm is surrendering the policy or the policy is maturing and the firm is receiving the entire jlp money that jlp money also will belong to all the partners and it will be shared between all the partners it will not be like okay i retired no surrender value should come to me he died no entire money should be paid to him no that's not how it will be dealt with are you, are you getting this <coughs> now jlp premium is expense jlp premium is jlp premium expense can be returned to pnl account debit side as expense or it can be treated as asset now why do we treat it as expense why do we treat it as asset very simple premium paid will be treated as expense maturity amount received will be treated as income alternatively what i can do is i can see like i paid 10000 10000 10000 and when i receive 1 lakh rupees maturity that 1 lakh is my 10000 10000 10000 plus interest so people might prefer to show the jlp premium paid in the balance sheet asset side at surrender value you can try to show that jlp premium paid at the surrender value in the balance sheet asset side if you treat jlp premium paid 10000 rupees as expense let's say annual premium is so annual, annual premium is so much 10000 let's say you paid premium of 10000 pnl account debit side you debited 10000 10000 is shared it will lead to decrease in profit or it will lead to loss it will be borne by all the partners you paid premium for 3 months so sorry let's say 3 years 10000 10000 10000 3 years premium paid 10 10 10 30000 paid 30000 is borne as expense by partners at the end of third year, let's say policy is surrendered or policy is matured. Let's say policy matured. One of the partner died and we receive 1 lakh rupees. What did we receive? Entire 1 lakh will be treated as profit and entire 1 lakh will be shared to all the partners including deceased partner. It will not exclusively belong to deceased partner. It will be shared between all the partners in profit sharing ratio. When you pay the JLP premium, journal entry will be. Have a look. When you pay the premium, journal entry will be JLP premium to cash and this premium will be transferred to PNL. And when you receive it, journal entry will be cash account debit to JLP and this JLP income will be shared between partners in profit sharing ratio. So, 30,000 was shared between partners in profit sharing ratio as expense. 1 lakh rupees what we receive was also shared between partners as profit. Are you getting it? However, you can alternatively treat the premium that you pay as asset. You can alternatively treat the premium that you pay as when you treat it as asset. Asset will be recorded in the balance sheet at surrender value, not at the amount that you pay. Let's say you pay 10,000 rupees premium. Surrender value is 2,000. So you write 2,000 in balance sheet asset. 8,000 will be transferred to PNL. How much is transferred to PNL? 8,000 will be borne by partners as loss. Let's say next year again you pay 10,000. Again you pay 12,000 should become the surrender value, but surrender value is 5,000. Again, the rest of the amount is shared between partners as loss. Let's say you did that for 3 years. At the end of 3 years, you pay 10, 10, 10, 30,000 as premium. Let us assume surrender value is 10,000. What is surrender value? 10,000 is there in balance sheet. 20,000 will be shared between partners in profit sharing ratio. How much is the premium paid? 10, 10, 10, 30. Surrender value is how much? 10. So, 10,000 will be there in balance sheet as asset. 20,000 is shared to partners in profit sharing ratio. Now, let us assume that or say joint life policy matured. Joint life policy and we received 1 lakh rupees from the insurance company. When we receive 1 lakh, balance sheet already there is asset. How much? 10,000. We received how much? 1 lakh. For 10,000 asset, if we receive 1 lakh, how much is the profit? 90,000 will be shared between partners as profit sharing ratio. 90,000 will be shared between the partners as? When we paid 30,000 premium, when we paid 30,000, how much was expensed? 20. 20,000 loss they have borne, correct or not. 
90% profit you gave. Net me how much profit did they take? 70. In the first case, what did you do? 1 lakh rupees is the policy amount. 30,000 premium paid. 30,000 you charged expense. 1 lakh income you gave. You charge them 30,000 expense, give them 1 lakh income. Net effect 70,000 profit. If you treat it as asset, you charge a 10,000 to surrender value to balance sheet, only 20,000 was charged as expense. And when you receive 1 lakh, in that 1 lakh, 10,000 is book value, you know, difference 90,000 is profit which is shared between partners. So you give them 90,000 profit, 20,000 expense, profit is 70. Or you give them 30,000 expense, 1 lakh rupees profit. Either way, it is 70,000 now. Are you getting it? This is when it comes to detailed accounting. Detailed accounting is not to be required. All that you need to remember when it comes to JLP is check. Number one, what is surrender value? What is policy amount? And what is premium? Premium is expense paid. Premium is expense paid. Have a look. Premium is expense paid. Some assured or policy amount is the money that will be received if the partner die. If the partner die, what do we receive? Some assured or policy amount. What is surrender value? Money what we receive, not if the partner dies. The policy is surrendered. If the policy is surrendered, what do we receive? Surrender value. If the person dies, what do we receive? Policy amount. What do we pay to insurance company? Understood. Now, policy can be individual or comprehensive. Comprehensive means 1 lakh policy on lives of all the three partners together. Meaning, if any of the partner dies, we get 1 lakh. Any of the partner dies, we get there can be individual policy. On partner A's life, 1 lakh. On partner B and partner C's life, 50, 50,000. If partner A die, we get 1 lakh. If partner B dies, we get 50. If partner C die, we get 50. If only partner A dies, we our policy A till mature, 1 lakh will get. Partner B and partner C's policy will be surrendered. Partner B and partner C's policy will be, are you getting this? This is separate policy. Or if you, can, if you want, you can take a comprehensive policy. That will be given in the question. You look at that. You compute the total amount to be received for the dead partner. For the you take policy amount for the retiring partner for other than dead partner. You take surrender value. When you take this totally, you understand how much money will the firm receive? Will you understand totally how much money is the firm receiving? Yes or no? This money is profit shared between all the partners. This money is profit shared between all the. However, if there is already joy JLP in the balance sheet asset side. If there is already JLP in the balance sheet, don't take the entire money received as profit. Entire money received is like sale consideration. Balance sheet asset side value is cost. Difference will become profit. Difference will become, let us say, example. I have a couple of example questions here. Let's do this. Huh. See, partner A, B, C. Policy amount is 1 lakh, 1 lakh, 1 lakh. Individual policy. And surrender value is 10, 10, 10. Got it? Now, if partner A die, if partner A die, what will happen? Partner A's policy will mature. We receive 1 lakh. Partner B and partner C's policy didn't mature. It was surrendered. We received 10 and 10. Am I right? Yes or no? How much will the firm receive now totally? 1 lakh. 1 lakh 20,000 will belong to firm. This will be shared to each of the partners in their profit sharing ratio which is 1 is to 1 is to 1. Read it. How much does partner A get in this? 40, 40,000. How is How did we get 40? 1 lakh 20 into 1 by 3. Boss, if you are not interested, you are happy to go. He's not even listening. Constantly talk. If you are not interested, you are okay to go. And the person next to you also. No talking in the class. You and the one next to you. Throughout you are talking. Are you all fine? Any problem? Are you not interested? Then why are you talking? How do you understand when... When I am talking and you are also talking. To understand one has to listen, not talk. And when you are talking, just imagine the person sitting next to you and person behind you. Can they hear you or can they hear me? How did you survive entire classes here? No one taught you this? That you have to shut up and sit when the faculty is talking? Huh? Second warning to you in two days. I don't know how you survived four or five months in this academy here. Two days with 5 plus 5, 6 hours of class, I have given you two warnings. And after saying, sorry, I won't eat, you started talking. Please, learn some manners. Behave in class. How much money will partner A get if he retires? If he retires, no. Then we won't take the policy amount of 1 lakh. We'll take uh, 10, 10, 10. How much money will it come in total? 30,000. 
and how much will each of the partner get? Same, 30,000 into 1 by 3, 1 by 3, 1 by 3. Are you getting this? Now, let us say, this is when they are treating it as a expense. If in case they have treated JLP as asset, and in the balance sheet, there is some value. Whenever they use surrender the policy or policy matures, it is like an asset sold. It is like an asset. Let's say, how much did you receive here? 1 lakh, uh, uh, partner A died. You received 1 lakh, and then 10,000, 10,000, 10, and partner B and partner C is policy. How much did you receive in total? 1 lakh 20. In the balance sheet asset side, let's say there is JLP 30,000. What is the JLP? So, 1 lakh 20,000 is the money that you receive, giving up the asset of 30,000. How much is profit? 90. 90,000 will be shared to partners in profit sharing ratio. Are you getting it? So, that's all you should do. To summarize in very simple terms how JLP should be treated. For a dead partner, take policy amount. For retiring partner, or other than debt partner, take surrender value, total the amount. This is the money that will be received from insurance company. This is the money that will be received from insurance. If there is no balance sheet asset, JLP, this entire amount is profit shared to all the partners in profit sharing ratio. However, in the balance sheet asset side, if there is some amount, this money what you receive from insurance company, deduct it from that value. Excess will be profit shared to partners in profit sharing ratio. Understood? By mistake, if there is JLP reserve in the question, in the balance sheet, liability said there is JLP reserve. Don't worry. Do how I told you right now. JLP reserve, treat it like any other reserve, transfer to partner's capital account in profit sharing ratio. You get this. And don't ever adjust JLP in revaluation. The impact might be same. <coughs> impact might be, but don't adjust JLP in revaluation account. Are you getting it? Goodwill also you can adjust through revaluation. Why do we treat it separately? It's a special item. You have to treat it separately. It's not a normal revenue recurring item. So don't treat JLP and goodwill in revaluation account. Treat them separately. And that, my friends, is what I wanted to tell on the topic of uh, partnership. There are three, four master questions, what you can see, which will definitely help you. And uh, can I now swiftly move into company accounts? Shall I give you a small break of five to ten minutes? Like a short break. Five minutes, I'll be here. And once that is done, uh, let's do company accounts. What do you say? I'll run you through an NPO and then do company accounts. Is that fine? Yes, guys. Uh, short break. Uh, five minutes. Chalo. Let's quit. quickly get started with the topic of not-for-profit organization. Not-for-profit organizations are organizations which perform their functions not with an objective of earning profit, but with an objective of rendering service, upholding a specific cause, or giving help in a specific building of community, or building an art form, culture, dance, or any of these. Any of these. So that's the basic objective of not-for-profit organizations. So because the objective is not for profit, we cannot do the accounting like how we do for a business entity. In a business entity, we prepare p &L account. Here, we cannot prepare p &L account. It is something like p &L, but not p &L. So, we can't call it profit. We call it surplus. The money that we've collected is slightly more than the money that we've spent. The money that we've collected is slightly more than the money that we've spent. So, we call it surplus. So, that account is not p &L account. Instead, it is called as income and expenditure account. What has happened? Door has been locked. Who locked it? One of you opened it. So, the account is called as income and expenditure account and it's not called as profit and loss account. So, on the credit side, we write all the incomes. On the debit, we'll write all the expenses. Excess of income over expense is not called profit, but it is called surplus. Excess of expense over income is not called loss, but it is called as deficit. And this will get added to capital fund and not capital. So, usually in an organization, we call it capital. No, here it is not capital. It is capital fund. Usually capital is contributed by one person or group of persons like partners. Here it is given as donation or charity. Everyone who invests capital or gives fund to the NPO are not expecting profit from this or not expecting anything in return. Only thing that they expect is that specific cost to get flourished, cost to get upholded. Are you getting this? So how to do accounting for this? The varieties of questions are plenty in our material. They will give receipts and payment account, expect you to prepare income and expenditure and balance sheet. 
some cases they give income and expenditure account expect you to prepare receipts and payment and balance sheet sometimes they don't give receipts and payment they don't give income and expenditure they give you basic structure of data they expect you to prepare receipts and payment income and expenditure and balance sheet so it doesn't really matter what varieties of questions have been given all that you need to do is identify the item and then start opening ledger accounts for every item let's say there is subscription open one account for subscription rent one account salary one account go on opening ledger accounts if they have given amount paid you write amount paid opening balance closing balance you will find the amount of expense for the year if they have given amount of expense for the year and they are expecting you to prepare receipts and payment account right opening closing balances and income or expense will automatically find the amount every ledger that you open will have four items opening balance closing balance paid or received income or expense i'll repeat every ledger you open will have four items opening balance closing balance receipts and payment that is either received or paid or income or expense three items if it is there the fourth item will be balance and payment that's the logic don't try to do like if receipts and payment is given and income and expenditure is given to be found that is type one question if income and expenditure is given receipts and payment is to be prepared it is type two question there is no type one type two it's completely accounting so there will be opening balances there will be closing balances sometimes they'll give what is the amount received and paid expecting you to find income and expense sometimes they'll give income and expense expecting you to find receipts and payment so for any item which has opening closing balance and one of the item open one ledger asset opening balance debit side liability opening balance credit side asset closing balance credit side liability closing balance debit side dump the data write receipt or payment to find income and income or expenditure as balance in figure write income or expenditure to find receipts or payment of past balance in figure and then post it to balance sheet and the balance sheet will tell there will be not much of a difference between this kind of question and uh, final accounts of sole proprietor question if you follow the proper double entry system of order and this is one topic which you don't have to read the day before examination you don't have to practice the day before exam because what is there in this chapter is not too much of theory what is there in this chapter is absolute logic if you are very clear with the logic of accounting the basics of accounting debit credit logic how the journal entry flows how to record the accrual entry outstanding pre received prepaid expenses then this is just it will just flow into your books of course only thing that you should remember is you should not call it profit you should call it surplus you should not call it loss you should call it deficit it is not called capital it's called capital fund it is not pnl account it is income and expenditure account it is not cash book it is receipts and payment account that's it however on each of the categories questions if you solve no it will take lot of time question will not get over in 5 minutes question will not get over in 10 minutes again if it will take 15 20 minutes it will give you 15 20 marks there won't be short questions from this chapter if they ask you short questions it will be on subscription account they will try and ask you to determine how much is the profit for the current year from subscription or how much is the subscription received during the current year again same subscription is your income yours is a not for profit organization people to be part of your association they should pay subscription fee subscription fee is your income subscription fee is your if you collected it beforehand next year subscription subscription you already collected it this year what will it become it will be pre received income liability this year subscription money not yet collected accrued subscription asset asset opening balance debit side closing balance credit side pre received subscription liability opening balance credit side closing balance debit side they'll either give the subscription money received during the year or they'll give subscription income for the year you write one of them find the other one as balance in figure and it will be done there are cases where there will be two years and three years data that's the only place where you need to be little cautious and it's again purely english and you should do double entry system and write only what you read don't write everything don't expect to write this first and then this and then this no go on reading the question whatever data is available you go on processing it and then writing it spend little time on practicing questions on subscription account and uh, each variety may you try and do one question and then you will be able to do it and don't forget to solve one question from npo wherein they have not given anything you should prepare receipts and payment you should prepare income and expenditure should also prepare balance sheet and in that balance sheet also opening capital fund is not available so you need to prepare previous years balance sheet to find the opening capital fund that's a master question if such kind of question from npo comes in the examination it will give you 20 marks if such kind of lengthy question comes how much marks will it fetch 20 marks so be little open and then try to do this chapter this is again a chapter which you don't have to revise the day before exam don't spend any time in revising npo the day before exam you do all other topics this is one thing that you can straight away go to exam and then
studying it the day before exam will not help except for small topics like subscription are you getting it i'll separately share what is it that you can do for last two days which order you should go what topics are must revise that will not tell now no, it's too early about 40 days early if i tell what you should do two days before the exam you will forget it in 38 days 39 they will be like what did you tell two days what to do so let's not let that happen i'll tell you when there is about last five days six days left i'll tell you what to do in the last two days got that great so then let's quickly do company accounts part where there are a lot of concepts to be done shall we come on any other specific doubt that you have in npo no <laughs> shall we do company accounts part say something I don't know. I am short of words if you people start talking like this. Okay. In the case of company accounts, we are trying to account for capital of the company. This can be two. One, capital in the form of uh, shares or other one is debt capital. That is in the form of debentures. These two things is what we are trying to understand how to account. So, we will try to understand and then account for share capital of the entity as well as debentures of the entity. Before we understand share capital, we need to see the types of shares. There are two types of shares, equity and preference. And they can ask you to do accounting for issue of equity shares or preference shares. Let me quickly run you through not all these theory parts. Let me quickly run you through the later part of the chapter. Not these. Yeah. Whenever a share is issued, it can be issued at issue price and this issue price can be equal to nominal value, but there is no condition that it should be equal to nominal value. Can I say issue price and nominal value are same? Can I say issue price and nominal value are same? No, issue and issue price and nominal value can be same, but it need not be same. Issue price and nominal value can be same, but it need not be. If issue price and nominal value are same, we call it shares are issued at par. If in case the issue price and nominal value are not same, issue price is more than nominal value, we call it premium. However, if the nominal value is more and issue price is less, we call it discount. What do we call it? Shares can be issued at par and shares can be issued at premium. Shares cannot be issued at discount. Shares cannot be issued at who stops you? Section 53 of Companies Act 2013 says that shares cannot be issued at discount and such issue of shares at discount is forbidden. Whenever shares are issued, Remember to write the accounting entries in this particular order. <coughs> there are three stages in which the money can collect money. Application stage, allotment stage, call stage. How many stages are there because of which the company can collect money? Three. Application, allotment, call. In application stage, company will first collect the money and then transfer it to share capital. Because the initiative is taken by the member here, shareholder. And at allotment stage, company will first allot the share, pass the due entry and then call for the money from the shareholder. And in the call stage again, company will make the call and then the shareholder will pay the money. So remember, at application stage, company will receive the money and then transfer. At allotment and call stage, company will call for the money and then they will receive. Do you get this? So at application stage, entry is first called, oh, sorry, cash to share application, share application to share capital. At allotment, first you write share allotment to share capital, then you write cash to share capital. And share call stage again, first you write share call to share capital. Then you will write cash to share call. Did you understand this? At application stage, <coughs> cash to share application. Share application to at allotment stage, share allotment to share capital. First due entry, then cash to share allotment, receipt entry. And at call stage, first you write share call to share capital, due entry. Then we write cash to share call, receipt entry. Clear with this? Premium can be collected in application stage, allotment stage or call stage. It is company's choice. Whenever they collect, write the due entry is there, no? When you write the due entry. That's where you should split between share capital and then security premium. When you receive, you write cash account debit to share application. That share application account should include premium. Don't try to segregate it at application stage. You write cash account debit to share application. If the premium is on application, nominal value premium, together you write it in share application account. When you transfer from share application to share capital, when you credit share capital, then you split it and then write security premium separately. There. In allotment stage, what do you do? First, you write the due entry, no? Share allotment account debit to share capital. Then only you should credit security premium separately. 
Later, when you collect, entire money will go to share lot. Are you getting when to record the premium? There is no restriction on how much premium can be collected. Company can collect any amount of premium. Company can collect. Uh, very good. Now, the shareholders who have subscribed to the shares of the company can be two categories. Good shareholders and bad shareholders. Good shareholders are such shareholders who pay the money before you ask. You call them for allotment stage. They pay call money also. You call them for first call stage. They will pay second call money also. So that's what will lead to calls in advance. What will it lead, lead rise to? However, if there is a shareholder who doesn't pay the money even after you ask, that will lead rise to calls in. Very good. Calls in earlier is the shareholder doesn't pay the money even after you ask. Calls in advance is shareholder pays the money before you ask. Calls in advance is liability. Calls in advance is calls in arrears is asset. You are supposed to collect money from someone. Someone is bad to you. You will make them pay for it. You are asset. Someone is too sweet to you. You are obligated to be sweet back to them. That is your liability. Are you getting the logic? On this calls in arrears, when you collect the money in the delayed date from them, you collect with interest from them. And on calls in advance, when you have collected money in advance from them, you would have to pay interest to them. Who is big? Company or shareholder? Who is big? Company or shareholder? So when company is paying, company will pay higher interest, 12%. Shareholder is small. On calls in arrears, when the company collect, they collect lower rate, 10%. When the company is paying interest on calls in advance, it will be at 12%. When the company is collecting interest on calls in arrears, it will be at Understood this? Very good. And whenever you are doing accounting for share capital, please do a detailed working note before you start with journal entries. For initial sum questions you can do, but for the later questions, let me show these to you. <coughs> As the questions grow more complex, whenever there is over subscription, under subscription, everything involved, a very humble request, please do a complete computation. How much is the application stage? How much is the allotment stage? How much money in the call stage? And how much is the money to be received from each of the applicants? How much did they apply? How much did we allot? At application stage, how much is collected, how much is due, how much is call scenarios, how much is calls in advance, and how much at the next stage, how much cash is it. Everything you do a detailed working note first, stage wise, application stage, allotment stage, call stage. You do it for each stage and then start with journal entry. This also, I've seen few people doing application stage, allotment stage, call stage. Don't do it horizontally, do it vertically. And tell you the reason why you should not do horizontal. The paper space in the examination is minimal. If you do horizontal, the width is not sufficient. If you do vertical application, allotment, first call, second call, third call, you can do however length you want. You can go to next page. If you do it horizontal, you will not be having sufficient space to do it. So my personal suggestion, do it vertical. Do it and do it detailed, as detailed as possible. Doing detailed working note will not cost you too much time. It will save so much time when you are writing accounting entries. If you try to save time in working note, you will end up spending more time in answer. If you spend time lavishly in working note, it will give you comfort when you are doing accounting entries. It's like this, sir. one who sweats more in the training will bleed less in the battle. So you sweat more when you are doing the working note so that you will bleed less when you are doing the journal entries format. Are you getting this? So let's quickly see the next part that is about over subscription and under subscription. There are two possible situations that a company will face when it is issuing shares. One is happy situation, other one is sad situation. If the company receives more applications than what it called for, let's say company called for 1 lakh applications, but it ended up getting 1 lakh 50,000 applications. That's a happy situation, <clears throat> what we call as oversubscription. However, if the company called for 1 lakh applications, but it received only 80,000 subscriptions, it is under subscription. What do we call it? Yes. In the event of oversubscription, can the company accept all the shares because it's got more? No, it cannot accept all the shares. It has to limit the number of applications accepted to the number of applications they got. How do they limit it? There are two options. How many options? Option number one sh -sh -sh method. What we call as what to say lottery system. Second one is called prorata method. Can they keep all the money? Paisa hi paisa hoga. No, they cannot keep. They would have to deal with it by repaying the money. One is lot system. Second one is parota system. Lot system is where they pick lotteries. One lakh applications have, have been called for. You received 1,20,000 applications. They pick lottery, 1 lakh shares are rotted, 20,000 applications rejected. Why? Bad luck. In the 6th house, the 7th planet, 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 the 7th planet. Get what I am trying to tell? That is how we say in lot system. But certain case, my company can follow prorata. Company wants to keep everyone happy. You get this? Company is acting like chocolate ice cream. You can't keep everyone happy. But company is trying. 
So what does the comp what does the company do? You apply it for forty thousand shares. I'll allot you thirty. You apply it for ninety. I'll give you eighty. You apply it for seventy five thousand. I'll give you sixty thousand. Proportionately, they'll accept and allot shares for every applicant so that no one goes without getting any shares. This is what we call as what pro rata proportionate allotment. Do you get this? What is the companies in the modern times follow when they go for IPO? What is more logical? Pro rata might sound logical, but the company has to go with lot system. Might sound illogical, but SEBI says you should follow lot system. So whenever there is over subscription, allotment is made in the market based on what system? Lot system, literally lottery only. And if in case you have been allotted based on lot system, let's say you applied for four shares. But the company picks your name and they give you only one share. That three shares come any extra you had paid application that will not be refunded to you by the company. Company will retain it and adjust it against allotment and call. That's how we will give rise to calls in advance. Are you getting this now? Calls in arrears. Whenever it is there, the company has to forfeit the share. Let me repeat. Whenever there is calls in arrears, what does the company has to do? Very good. Now forfeiture means what? Company is taking the share back from the share. Company is taking the share back from the such forfeited shares can be reissued by the company to another person. The objective of the company on reissue is not to make profit, but to just have capital. But to just have so on the reissue, company can reissue the share at cost. Sorry, uh, par premium or even at discount, but it is conditional discount. What discount is it? Let's try and understand what is that conditional discount. That conditional discounting is such that on the whole, company has actually not issued a discount. Let us say there is a share of rupees ten. What is the nominal value of the share? Application is three rupees. Allotment is one rupees. Call is six rupees. So company has collected three plus one plus six. Ten rupees is what you should collect. Let us say the shareholder paid application money and allotment money, but he did not pay call money. Shareholder paid application money and allotment money. Shareholder did not pay. So three plus one, four rupees received. Six rupees not received. Four rupees received. The company forfeited the share. Why the shareholder did not pay six? Now, if the company is reissuing the share to anybody, if the company is reissuing the share to anybody, company expects how many rupees? Six rupees. Company expects how much rupees? If they collect six from the new shareholder, new shareholder paid six, old shareholder actually paid four. Together they have collected ten. On the whole, it is not loss. Artha idha. Yes or no? Old shareholder already paid four rupees. No. So to the new shareholder, on a nominal value of rupees ten share, they will allow discount of rupees four. They can allow discount of rupees four. They can allow up to four rupees discount. Can they allow more than four rupees discount? Let's say they allow discount of five rupees. Then what will happen? Ten rupees share, five rupees discount means new shareholder will pay how much? Five. Old shareholder paid how much? Four. Five plus four. Nominal value of the share. You collected less than ten rupees. You collected only nine. That's not allowed. Can you do that? You cannot. Are you getting it? So the extent to which the company can give discount to the new shareholder is equal to the or less than the money that you previously collected. From the old shareholder, if you collected four rupees, we can give discount up to four rupees, not more than four rupees. Are you getting it? If the old shareholder has not paid six rupees, from the new shareholder we should collect minimum six rupees. Should collect minimum. If we collect seven rupees from the new shareholder, what would happen? New shareholder will pay seven. Old shareholder has paid four. Together, how much did you collect? Eleven. Eleven rupees. Nominal value of the share. One rupees is profit. One rupees that will go to share for future account. From there, it will go to capital. From share for future account, it will go to. Let us say we reissued the share at eight rupees. New shareholder paid how much? Eight. How much has the old shareholder paid? Together, nominal value. Two rupees we have collected extra. It will go to. Or say capital reserve. Let us say I reissue the share at rupees ten. How much did the new shareholder pay? Ten. How much did the new shareholder pay? Reissued at ten. How much did the old shareholder pay? Together, how much have I collected? Nominal value. Ha, ah, fourteen rupees is collected. Nominal value is ten. Excess collected. Four rupees profit will go to capital reserve. Let us say I reissue the share at eleven rupees. How much did I collect from the new shareholder? How much did I collect from the old shareholder? Together, how much is profit? Wrong. When I collected eleven rupees, my kuno stop away. Yeah. 
Guys, can you hear me? If I collect 11 rupees from the new shareholder, nominal value is 10. So, 1 rupee is premium. 1 rupee is only 10 rupees I have collected towards share. Old shareholder I have collected 4. Together 14. Nominal value 10. 4 rupees profit. When you collect 11 from the new shareholder, 4 from the old shareholder, together you have 15. In that 15, nominal value being 10, 5 rupees is not profit. 1 rupee is premium, 4 rupees is profit. Are you getting it? Remember very clearly how to distinguish between premium and profit. When is it premium? When the reissue price is greater than nominal value. When reissue price is greater than nominal value, that excess amount is premium. Excess amount is? Huh. However, old price plus new price together exceeds nominal value. That amount will be my profit. So, there are multiple small, small questions that I have made you people do. Have a look at this. This same question. How much have we collected from the old shareholder? 4. How much is the amount not collected from the old shareholder? 6. Can I reissue it at 10 rupees? Yes. Can I reissue it at 12 rupees? 9. 7. 6. Min minimum 6. Why? The old shareholder has not paid 6. Can I reissue at 5? If I reissue at 5, it will become loss. Why? Old shareholder has paid 4 rupees. New shareholder is paying 5 rupees. Together it will become 9, which is lesser than nominal value. So I cannot collect. I cannot reissue this share at rupees 5. Basic level question to make you understand the same thing. Or you can do it other way around. What is the maximum discount allowable? Why 4 rupees? Because old shareholder has paid 4. You compare with the discount. In each of the cases, how much is the discount allowed? When you reissue it at 10 or 12, discount is 0. When you reissue at 9, discount is 1 rupee. If you reissue at 7, discount is 3. If you reissue at 6, discount is 4. If you reissue at 5, discount is 5. What is the maximum discount you can give? 4 rupees. So, till here it is fine. Here, discount is 5 rupees. Maximum discount that you have given is 4. How can you give 5 rupees discount? So, in the last case, reissue is not possible. Understood this? Pakka? Now, differentiating between premium and profit. 10 rupees share. 10 rupees is the reissue price. 4 feature paid up is how much? 7. Meaning, old share has paid how much? 7. Together, how much do you collect? 17 rupees. Nominal value 10. 7 rupees is profit. On reissue, you collected 12. On reissue, you collected Old shareholder before 4 which are had paid 7. Together you collected 19. Can I say 9 rupees profit? No, 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 no. 2 rupees is premium. 2 rupees is? Uh, balance 7 rupees is profit. Are you able to understand this? These kind of questions. Once you understand this, then you should start with accounting entry. You should not straight away start with accounting entry in the beginning. Because if you know it at unit level, you will be able to do it at lakhs of rupees amount. Straight away, if you try to hit lakhs of rupees, thousands of shares, you will get stuck because you are not very conceptually strong at the unit level. Yeah, the entry for forfeiture of share is opposite of issue of share. What is the general entry when you issue the share? Bank account debit to share capital. Application allotment, elaborate. Bank to share capital. Bank balance will increase, share capital will increase. Asset increase debit, capital increase credit. Forfeiture ulta. Capital will decrease debit. Asset won't decrease. Why? Do we give the cash back? No. That money that you had collected will be your profit. So, you will credit it to share forfeiture account for temporary amount. To the extent you had not received the money, previously you called it calls in arrears asset. Now, you cannot ask money anymore. Why? You forfeited the share. After forfeiting the share, if you ask money, what is that? So, that asset will decrease, will credit calls in arrears. Are you getting it? When you reissue, write the entry bank account debit to share capital. If you collected extra money, it will go to security premium. If you have not collected money, discount, that will be debited to share forfeiture. Excess in share forfeiture account will be transferred to capital reserve. A very important point that I want you to remember is, I want you to compute share forfeiture profit in unit wise and not in lump sum. I will tell you the reason. Let us say you have forfeited 300 shares. How many shares have you forfeited? If you reissue all the 300 shares, it is easy. Any difference in share forfeiture account will go to capital reserve. However, you have forfeited 300 shares. But only 100 shares out of that is reissued. Then only pertaining to that 100 shares, how much is the profit? So much should be transferred to capital. If you know to compute profit per share, you will do into 100 shares and then transfer to capital. If you don't know how to compute profit per share, you know how to do it in total, then you won't be able to do the answer. You will do some weird working notes which will be annoying. 
which will be different for each question. To have a standardized working note, always compute everything per shape. Always compute everything and then it will become very, very simple. First to do the entire working note, what is required and then go ahead with the problem. I will show it to you, couple of adjustments. See, compute in detail, how many shares were forfeited, 600. How many were reissued, 400. How many are not reissued, 400 were reissued, 100 were reissued, two separate slots. And 100 are not reissued. Compute each case may per share value, what is there, you compute first. Detailed working note, you do this much working note for a three journal entry question. For a three or four journal entry question also, you do this detailed working note. After you do this detailed work not only then you start with journal entry, you will find passing journal entries very smooth and very comfortable. Initially, you will find it little bit of hiccup to get used to working note. But once you do it for two questions or three questions, after that you don't want to do the question straight away. You always want to do working note because you want that much clarity. I can promise you that. Got this? Pakka. Very good. Then uh, please do solve a couple of questions where over subscription Pro rata allotment, calls in advance, calls in arrears, share forfeiture, reissue and profit or loss on reissue, everything is there. Like we called for 1 lakh applications, we got 1 lakh 20,000 applications, there is calls in advance, we have done pro rata allotment. After doing pro rata allotment, there is some calls in advance, there is some calls in arrears. Because of some calls in arrears, we do share forfeiture. Out of that, partly the shares have been reissued and partly not. There are like sometimes two shareholders don't pay, one three shareholders don't, don't pay. All of these are there. Try these three, two, three kind of questions. Don't start from first question, second question, third question. Start from the last questions. And then you'll be able to cover the important questions. You get that? Yes. Someone over there is asking doubt. I'm very happy. Huh? For which one? Okay. There are two ways of doing working note. I'll show you both ways. Which questions working note do you want? That one what I had shown then? Yeah. I will share the sheet only with you. Photo take in Mantira. I will share the entire sheet link to you. Now, what is the size of the photo that you click? Can you tell me? Open the photograph in your gallery. Can you tell me how much is the size of the photograph? How many KBs or how many MBs? It will be MBs. Huh? 2 MB. Now, I am using this file, no, this file, okay, not here, wait. Where is our class notes? I will tell, I will talk about the uh, Jayanagar, which batch file have you opened? Okay, Shesha Adipuram batch. This entire file is 3963 KB. That is about 3963 divided by 1028. Huh? 1024. 3.8 3 MB. 3.8 MB is the file. I will share this with you. And in this 3.8 MB file, what do you get? You get accounts, uh, company accounts, you get debentures, you get NPO, you get death of partner, JLP, retirement, everything. All the chapters, unit wise, question solution to all the questions what is there in your research material in detail with working note, which are self explanatory. 3.8 MB. Uh, if you still want, you can take picture. There is the other part. You can do the same computation slightly differently also. You can do the same computation slightly differently also. There is another way to do it. Madi, Madi, no 2.5 MB. Okay. Done. What was I telling? See the problem. I will tell you guys something. Yesterday, I don't know about you, I was happy about the coverage. Today, till that first break we took, I was happy about the coverage. By the time that first break got over, I am not happy about how we are doing it after that point. After that point, it's become like I am getting irritated because you people start talking. When that happens, now I start staring at people who are talking, trying to catch their attention, by which I am obviously losing the track of what I am telling to an extent. And I am not able to give all that I wanted to give to you people. So, somehow it will get affected. It is totally dependent upon how you people behave in the class as well. So, you people are at your best behavior, you will get the best out of the class. You don't behave at your best, I am sorry. I am serious. I am sorry. My mistake. No, that you people are talking. So, I am sorry. So, little bit of patience is required. Just try once. I am not having a two days off to take this marathon revision session. Our regular batch for June 2024 attempt new syllabus is running. Morning, normal class, 7.30 to 1 o'clock. 
today class in fact went on till 110 150 after that regular class 45 minutes of break and 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock is your session usually when we take 3 o'clock to 8 30 evening batch we have in half an hour break yesterday we took two breaks of 15 minutes and 10 15 minutes and nothing other than that and today to not know that not that also we taken two breaks of 10 minutes or two breaks of 10 and one break of 5 minutes or something and we running through and it's a big toll on the body it's not going to be very easy and we are switching the chapters like this and you people are not expected to stand shout and then tell correct answer what i'm all expecting is don't talk save your energy and then pay attention that will not make me get focus or say out of focus or getting little irritated and try to correct you people that's what i'm expecting am i very demanding even if i'm demanding say no yake inna debentures madu amel bekadre i will stay back you tell all your gallies i will listen for 15 minutes it is 7:30 i'll take till 7:45 15 minutes i want you to pay attention will you people please very good debenture part is the next part the last unit of uh, company accounts chapter debenture redemption is not part of your syllabus debentures may have only issue of debentures sir but redemption premium and all we account we are not accounting for redemption of debentures but we are accounting for if in case the debentures have to be redeemed at premium later we have to provide for such premium in the beginning only because of conservatism you get this i told you what section 53 that shares cannot be issued at discount did i tell that and shares cannot be redeemed unless they are preferences and shares cannot be redeemed at discount even if it is preferences but however for debentures no this section 53 52 54 and all are not applicable debentures are regulated by section 76 77 78 there there is no restrictions debentures can be issued at par issued at premium they can also be issued at discount and debentures can be redeemed at par redeemed at premium they can also be redeemed at discount so all the three possibilities 3 into 3 nine cases are possible with regard to debentures it is like loan taken from the public it is like loan taken from the for that loan you give an acknowledgement in writing saying that yes i have taken loan from you and that's a debenture what is debenture it's an acknowledgement of debt given to the person from whom you borrowed the money if in case you issue the debenture at par redeem the debenture at par no problem if you issue the debenture at par redeem the debenture at premium you pay more than what you collected you collected 100 rupees but you are redeeming it at premium you pay 120 20 rupees what you pay extra is loss 20 rupees what you pay extra is are you getting it at the time of collection a share a debenture of rupees 100 let's say you collected 120 that 20 rupees excess you collect is not profit but it will go to security premium where will it go so when you issue debenture at par no profit no loss when you issue debenture at premium it is not profit it is premium when you redeem debenture at par no problem when you redeem the debenture at premium such premium paid on redemption of debenture is loss premium paid on redemption of debenture is let's say you issued the debenture at discount you issued the debenture at discount meaning you collected only 8 rupees but you are giving him debenture of 10 rupees when you collect 8 but you give him debenture of 10 that is again loss issue of debenture at discount is loss if you redeem debenture at discount it is profit if you redeem debenture at discount it is we need to apply conservatism what is it that we should apply which says that we need to account for expected expenses and losses but not for expected incomes and gains so when does the company make loss with regard to debentures number 1 when they issue it at discount number 2 when they redeem it at premium when we are taking if we take less it is loss when we are giving if we give more it is loss taking less is loss giving more is loss so loss on issue of debentures what is the topic loss on issue of debentures is discount on issue or premium on redemption what is loss on issue of debentures discount on issue or premium on redemption so i call lloyd l o i d he is doid plus pod he is doid plus pod d p d doid doid is discount on issue pod is premium on redemption it is not an acronym it's just that big word i made it small first first letter i've taken and written it together don't mug it up doid 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 pod 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 enu baradile exam you understood now when we are collecting if we collect less when we are paying if we pay more it will become loss pakka now how do we treat this loss loss no sir transfer to pnl transfer to how do we transfer to pnl one year first year or last year throughout the period how do we transfer it throughout the period equal 
इक्वल और सम रेशियो आउटस्टैंडिंग ओके इट्स लाइक दिस व्हाई डू वी गिव दिस डिस्काउंट बिकॉज लेट्स से आई हैव गिवन डिबेंचर्स एट रुपीस 100 एंड इंटरेस्ट रेट इज 10% व्हाट इज द इंटरेस्ट रेट एवरीबॉडी इन द मार्केट इज आल्सो ऑफरिंग 10% एवरीबॉडी इन द मार्केट इज आल्सो ऑफरिंग so now why will people buy my debenture they can buy any debenture there should be some convincing point no i want to offer 12% but if i offer 12% no my shareholders will become angry or it might catch wrong attention i don't want to offer 12% because every year i would have to pay 2% 2% extra what if i don't have enough money i am digging my own grave by doing this so what is it that i'll do i'll say you buy 10% debenture from my company like others i'll give 10% but at the time of redemption i'll give you premium of 10% so that is a convincing point that will make people feel more attracted. So instead of paying excess interest every year, I am paying excess at the time of maturity. But that is actually the convincing point because of which you use the debenture money for 4 years, 5 years, 6 years, no? Or instead of giving premium at the time of redemption, I will give discount at the time of issue. That is also same, no? Correct or not? See, you collect 100 rupees, pay them 110. Or collect 90 rupees and then pay them 100. Isn't it same? Yes or no? And this interest, sorry, this premium on redemption or this discount on issue is in compensation of interest. It is in compensation of, so this is treatment should be on par with interest. Correct or not? How will interest expense be recorded every year? Higher the loan, higher the interest. Lower the loan, lower the interest. Loan outstanding first year 1 lakh, second year 1 lakh, third year 1 lakh, fourth year 1 lakh, fifth year 1 lakh. End of fifth year you repaid entire loan. Interest will be every year same. Yes or no? First year loan is 5 lakh. At the end of year 1, you repaid 1 lakh principal. Loan became 4. At the end of year 2, it became 3. At the end of year 3, it became 2. At the end of year 4, it was 1. Last year only 1 lakh that was repaid. So loan is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Interest will also be 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 ratio. You agree with me? Yes or no? Simple, this loss on issue of debentures is there no discount on issue on premium reduction. It is in the nature of interest. So, it should be charged in the ratio of debentures outstanding every year. It should be charged to P&L in the ratio of debentures outstanding. Let us say we are not redeeming any debentures during the year. We have 10,000 debentures in the beginning of the year. Same 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 will be there for every year. At the end of fifth year, we are redeeming all the 10,000 debentures. So, how do we treat this loss on issue of debentures? Equally over 5 years. However, some debentures getting removed, sorry, redeemed every year. So that outstanding debenture ratio at the beginning of the year is there. In the same ratio should apportion and then transfer this to P and L. Understood this everyone? Pakka? This is one type of question that will come in your issue of debentures topic. We are not going to do redemption of debentures. We are doing only issue of debentures. However, though it is issue of debentures, you should account for the premium that you will pay at the time of redemption because it is conservatism principle that we are applying. Are you getting this? Pakka, any doubts in this part or any specific part that you want me to touch upon? Yes. Thank you guys. See with your cooperation, now whatever I wanted to tell in 15 minutes, I can tell in 8 minutes. But if people don't cooperate, I won't be able to tell in 15 minutes also. I won't be able to show certain things specifically as well. But I have tried my best. What people learn over 220 hours, 230 hours, we put it short. Today's video is about 505 hours, 26 minutes. Yesterday's video is about 5 hours. Put together, it is hardly about 10, 10 and a half hours. And in 10, 10 and a half hours, we have not skipped any unit other than those 4 units of chapter 6, which we have separately. We have touched all other units in detail. And then you also covered almost all the concepts that is there in each of the units. Would you agree? Very good. I hope I was able to help you people a little in this specific two days. Was it helpful these two days? You would have uh, marathon revisions coming up tomorrow, day after as well for tomorrow economics. And then followed by you will have mathematics, statistics, logical reasoning. As well as you will have the sessions coming up for uh, law. Please don't forget to attend if you can. If you want to attend online, the facility will be available. But I hope you agree that the offline face-to-face -face experience is much different than what it is there at the online. Okay. The only humble request from you people is, shh, listen to me, put in all that you can because they say no, run as if this is your last race. Do you people to actually this is last race. 
you will regret every day of your life if in case you don't clear this certain because for the next attempt you would have to easily learn lot of extra chapters you would have to learn redemption of debentures you would have to learn redemption of preferentials you would have to learn bonus issue you would have to learn right issue you would have to learn single entry system at the cost of skipping easy topics like average due date account current goods sent on return or approval and consignment these easy chapters will go away and depreciation may amortization also will come in and we don't know how the paper will be and you already already know that it has to be 50 marks in every paper and it's going to become only upset it is nice that it's becoming upset but when you have prepared your entire preparation in the old scheme try and do it and clear it off in the old scheme sit for 10 hours sit for 12 hours sit for 15 hours and then study let us see what will happen i have heard all of this upsc aspirant uh, neat aspirants and all standing and then telling sir i am studying for 16 hours sir but i don't know i am finding it less i am not able to study for longer i don't know how to keep concentration for long hours after studying for 16 hours they tell this but we commerce students we don't put in any effort we like all hours kon mura road butto we expect miracles to happen and we say that ca exam is as tough as upsc exam it is as tough as any engineering exam don't start talking about it try and show no try and prepare as if other people are doing it imagine all of your second pc friends whom you studied with in 10th standard when they went on to do engineering if they are preparing for any examination like cet ai triple e iit je do you know how hard they study yeah one unfortunate thing is we people want as much of respect as they those get but they make fun of us saying that commerce is easy course especially because they see commerce students having fun all the time deepavali nalak din ara che you people don't study for 4 days you people can't have such luxury try and study like how other upsc aspirant neat aspirant or an iit je iit aspirant or cat aspirant studies and trust me you will see miraculous results and how many of you scored 100 on 100 in your second pc accounts raise your hand raise your hand raise your hand so there is high expectation from you people if in case you don't score well if you don't score good marks in your ca foundation they will tell adella format ainginga format akput pass agirodu they'll make fun of you they'll make fun of you so you have a responsibility to score good marks here and how many of you have not scored 100 on 100 in your second pc accounts you have an opportunity in front of you to score it here and then tell hey, we don't play against bangladesh afghanistan and all we play against big teams we are a big match player see this is what you need to tell yourself Shh. i'm trying to tell something i want some attention yeah <coughs> whenever you preparing for ca foundation examination what might be running behind the mind or what should have running behind the mind is remember you have never written an exam like ca foundation before in your life no matter what background you come from you come from icsc you come from uh, isc you come from cbsc you come from state you never ever taken up an examination of the caliber or of the statute of ca foundation examination where only one out of four people pass and three out of four people fail and then give an attempt again and it's a race and it's not a competitive examination for our benefit it is not like only one person will come because there are only limited number of seats available it can also happen that all the four people out of four people can pass just by studying really hard so that's the beauty of the course that we have and we should capitalize on this particular part and whenever you have this kind of a setup like you never attended a examination of this kind of thing no this might create a little bit of fear also within saying that i have never written an examination like ca foundation i am scared i have never written something like this i have never written anything big in life just tell yourself whenever you are writing a big examination like this that throughout your life whatever you have done till now is the preparation and the big day is this exam coming up whatever you done till now is just preparation and you not shown your best your best is going to come here and that's what you should tell yourself remember and then believe that you are a big match player bigger the occasion better you perform smaller the occasion you don't perform and there was no bigger stage than ca foundation in your life till date so the biggest stage is awaiting you for you to show your arrival into the professional course and you make a grand entry into the course and once you taste that success at ca foundation level with 90 marks 95 marks or like out of 340 315 ca foundation marks no once you taste that success no you want more you will never be satisfied with anything in ca inter ca inter you want to work really hard lot of them say foundation ago to survive just survive inter will study full focusedly that won't happen if you come out with ca foundation with amazing marks no the way you enter into ca inter is very different you will be like no there i've got 360 out of 400 here i want 580 out of 600 i want 590 out of 600 possible not impossible but to be so hungry no 
you should be or to say working so much hard you should train yourself so hard so that you become hungry they say smart people score more marks intelligent people score more marks hard working people score more marks these are all these things okay i'll tell you who score more marks or i'll tell you who will do well in life people who do well in life are not smart people people who do well in life are not intelligent people people who do well in life are not hard working people because hard work comes there should be a very important reason why you are working hard there should be a very important uh, way in which you use your smartness or intelligence what i believe as a very important and crucial factor what can make anyone very successful or take them to the place where they want to be or keep them happy or peaceful is hunger how hungry are you how hungry are you for for success now let's say there are two students one person is very hungry for success not smart not hard not hard working also other person is very hard working but not hungry for success the person who is very hard working is pointless in working hard because he doesn't have that hunger to pass the exam with great marks but the person with hunger no he will become a hard worker very soon he will inculcate that hard working capabilities by hard work over a period of time he will become intelligent by using his intelligence he will become smart eventually and he will become successful one without hunger is no is pointless whether they are smart intelligent or hard working so one thing that should have inside you is hunger to do really well in ca position if you don't have that hunger no create that hunger within yeah stop all the things that will take your hunger out now people when there is some serious talk happening people make joke about the course people make fun about the course stop start ignoring those people in life take those people out of your life people who doesn't take the course seriously no matter how close their friends are to you they don't take the classes seriously they don't attend the classes seriously they don't study on daily basis they may keep funning and keep making fun the entire day oh, i couldn't even study 2 hours man negativity around cut them out stop talking to them kick them out of your life stay around if you if you can be with people who are very positive minded and very focused good if you cannot find such people stay within your circle stay within yourself create that small spark inside of being focused not talking anything negative about the course not talking anything neg negative about the examination not talking anything negative about your preparations or any of the faculties who taught you any of the material that you read any of the youtube anything stop talking all this negative thing you might think that you are too funny and you making fun about people you making fun about the course you making fun about something but you won't understand by making fun about something very serious no you are telling your brain this is not very important and your brain will never be able to conceive something with great importance when you sit to study also your brain won't accept it with that great importance so in order to create that hunger you need to take things little seriously you have fun not about the course have fun about a fun topic about a fun topic talk anything about the course to have fun don't make fun of subject don't make fun of a topic in subject don't make fun of any of the topics that you have in any of the subjects that you have don't make fun of the class or the faculties or your friends who standing how young both not don't make fun about him talk something very random and then have fun you be very rude you have dark comedy i don't care i am not trying to tell you to become good human beings you make blunder dark comedy i don't care i am here only to tell you how to do become very well in your foundation examination don't create any negativity around this so keep this a very auspicious place keep this subject something on par with the super power that you believe in so once you start valuing it that i know when you start to study automatically you become very very serious about the subject and the preparation and once that happens trust me no one can stop you and uh, hoping to see you all coming to ca intermediate marathon revision also like this when we conduct in year after and i promise to take up ca inter marathon revision for november 2024 attempt which you will be eligible to write in the month of october like this one month before because november exam no inter inter is not december so i promise you standing here on this dais that next year in the month of october i will announce a free two day marathon revision for ca intermediate advanced accounting group 1 how many of you would want to attend that if you would want to attend that the fee that you would have to pay hands down fee that you would have to pay is not in terms of money but that is in terms of time that you invest in yourself to pull you out of ca foundation and venture into ca intermediate you get this hoping to see you all there did you guys learn anything new in this last 10 hours that we had today and yesterday did you guys have little fun yes. will you people do well in your ca foundation examination remember life is not a battle to be struggling it's a game to be enjoyed till the time you learning something you are having fun it's all good the day you guys you stop learning something you are stop having fun 
trust me you might start struggling because you might be in a battle so thumb rule to stay happy is pretty simple it is to stay in the game so for one last time on this day i have just one simple question for all of you are we in the game yes are we in the game yes. come on in the top of your voice are we in the game yes. that's it guys tata bye bye take care see you all next in ca intermediate only till then have a great time bye people who are non yasha students you can go to the first floor meet madhu and na tell your name and then sign to get the copy hard copy of the material if they don't give tell me andre helidini they'll give people who are watching it online thank you for your entire support of watching it 10 hours i wish you also great luck in your examinations do really well if in case you have any doubt ping me in the insta ping me on telegram i'll be definitely happy to help you and share this video with the people whom you think to whom this will help bye guys